Audiobook title Former General is Undead Night Act, 01-04, Chapter, 01-171, by Nikoko Part 01. This work belongs to author Nikoko. Act 11 Undead Night Act 1 The Resurrected Night Chapter 1 Undead Night TL 9 EDPF Part 1 For over 400 years the western part of Warimia continent had been at war a war that later came to be known as the Eight Countries Unification War. During that war, the Kingdom of Rijos turned the tide of war around after annexing two other countries and in fact it had pressured the other surviving kingdoms more severely than it had managed before. And thus, it pushed the war toward its conclusion even faster than it was projected. Before long, right before the war ended, out of the eight small countries that originally existed in the western part of Warimia continent, only two remained the kingdom of Rijos being one of those two. During that time, Lambert, the general of Rijos' kingdom at that time, left the campsite by himself, looking at the night sky wistfully. Yo Lambert what are you doing here, strolling by yourself in the middle of the night? Lambert turned around and saw Glyph, another general of the kingdom of Rijos he was also his dear friend from the very beginning, when he was being ostracized by the nobles due to his origin, he had always been the one who protected Lambert after all despite being a great brave man who was loved by the citizens of Rijo's kingdom. Lambert originally was a peasant, e.d. my senses are already tingling at this part I'm off. Glyph raised his hand lightly in exchange for a greeting aid of his subordinates were following him. I was just recounting the time when I was but a rowdy kid, before his majesty Aurelia took me in. It was the wish of the former king, the very one who failed to defeat the neighboring countries, to unite the western part of Warimia continent now, this wish was passed down to his son, Aurelia to his credit, Aurelia did manage to bring the kingdom of Rijos all the way to the point where uniting the eight countries was but a step away. However, the fact that Aurelia was the former ruler's daughter and not son was a secret only her close aides were privy to although Glyph and Lambert were one of those in the know-how they made sure to never breathe a word about this particular secret. The secret that started after the death of the previous king, the archduke the little brother of the deceased king attempted to usurp the king the young king, Aurelia's older brother was assassinated by his own uncle thus, in order to thwart the ambitious archduke. A just-born Aurelia had to live under the guise of a man even after the archduke was executed, Aurelia continued with the pretense. By the way, what are you doing here, Glyph? Your post should be a little away from here. I just wanted to reaffirm the changes in topography with my own eyes. Having said so, Glyph went to the edge of the cliff. Lambert, what do you think about the flow of this war? While I would say we should not let our guard down honestly speaking, we have leeway in this war really. I have to say that the end of this war felt a little anticlimactic after the hardship that we have suffered until now especially. Considering we can win this war even when we send just half our forces as long as we overcome this war and invade with our full might, that idiotic king will, without a doubt, surrender. I see now, to be honest I have the same opinion as you that's why now I feel relieved hearing your confirmation. GLY Glyph suddenly slashed his sword towards Lambert despite the fact that his gaze was firmly fixed on the cliff startled. Lambert hurriedly defended himself with his own sword their clash resulted in a high-pitched sound of colliding metals. What are you do? Lambert started to question Glyph, however, his eighth subordinate that was following along had already lunged toward Lambert from behind him. You bastard! Lambert cursed as he quickly rolled his body to the side to dodge their attacks then. Before they could react, he rose up and raised a bestial roar as he swung his sword upward. You will! With a shove from the hilt, one of the attackers was flung before smashing onto the ground another was hit by Lambert's sword and was sent flying backwards. Part 2 Even then, Lambert didn't stop. He continued his sword's momentum as it bisected through the torso of another three people which were protected by armor, 
and crushed their upper body as he sent it flying away. He only needed to do a little jump and he managed to kill three people who wore thick armor with just one slash. However, Glyph, using the time Lambert was dealing with his subordinates, entered Lambert's blind spot and, from the very beginning, it was a fight of one against nine thus, Lambert didn't really have any leeway in fighting while keeping track of all of his enemies if one were to be even more precise about the situation. It was the fact that his visor was restricting his peripheral vision. Bang! With such a loud sound coming from the joint that had connected the metal armor, Lambert finally understood Glyph's intention. Don't think too badly of me, Lambert. As he spoke, Glyph emerged from Lambert's blind spot despite the heavy organ armor he was wearing. He leaped high, as if gravity had no hold on him, and swung his sword, TL organ equals mystic metal. It was Glyph's signature move, Lunar Wings. Although he was familiar with this particular skill, Lambert had never thought that such skills would be aimed at him by his own dear friend to take his life. The pressure he felt coming from the move was worlds apart compared to when he saw Glyph use it from the sideline, or when used in training. This move Glyph made was filled with killing intent directed at him. Despite the fact that Lambert had immediately bent over toward the ground to parry the move, the sheer force of the skill still managed to penetrate his armor attacking his shoulder bone and, while the upper part of the armor was often in full plate form, heavy and blunt swords, which specialized in sending shock through armor, countered that protection. And to make matters worse, the sword that was swung down was helped along by gravity combined with the weight of the organ armor itself. While Lambert managed to parry the blow, it still managed to land a glancing blow at his shoulder then. The blade of Glyph's sword slammed to the ground, creating a huge fissure along with raising a cloud of dust that was accompanied with a loud resounding sound. Nice job in parrying it. But now you can't use your dominant arm anymore. Glyph leaped up again as he prepared for the second strike. The second, Lunar Wings? Don't you dare look down on me. You will. Lambert forcefully raised his injured arm swinging down his sword using all of his power with both hands. Glyph managed to parry that attack, however. It was done through fixing his stance in a hurry thus. He ended up losing in a contest of power between them as a result. He bounced on the ground and, though he managed to land safely on the ground, parrying Lambert's full-powered blow was no joke. Even Glyph, the brave who had experienced many battlefields, couldn't block the shock that was transmitted through his sword, causing his limbs to be numbed and, it wasn't merely numbed limbs, it came along with a searing pain that attacked the joints of Glyph's entire body. In the end, Glyph slumped over in an unsightly manner in front of Lambert, who was prepared to take his life. T this is I impossible. Glyph's face finally changed from impatient to disbelief fortunately for him two of his subordinates came to assist him from the side. General Glyph. However, Lambert didn't give them any chance whatsoever. He swung his sword like a club then pulverized the helmet that Glyph's two subordinates were wearing along with their head and, while there were three other subordinates left, they had dropped their sword to the ground as they trembled in fear. T to think that General Lambert, I.S. this strong. Glyph's surviving subordinates had already lost their fighting spirit even the one who were supposed to distract Lambert. The one who was supposed to be Glyph's support said the same thing. So, even though they were supposed to distract Lambert, even though they were supposed to be prepared to lose their life in the process of doing that, in the end they didn't have that kind of resolution they were not prepared to die with mangled corpses. Part 3 Naturally, that didn't mean that Glyph's subordinates were frail-hearted people, however. At the very least, they wanted to put their life on the life for an appropriate cause and meaning and fighting Lambert, who was an opponent that was world apart from one they could handle, was not meaningful at all. L. Lambert At that moment, Glyph was glaring at Lambert with pale face yet, faster than Glyph could fathom, Lambert's sword was already right beside Glyph's neck. I won't die till Our Majesty Aurelia united the western part of Warimia continent. 
Fuafufu, and yet, the order to execute you came from His Majesty Aurelia. What? Lambert, who was usually dauntless, was shaken to the core by that revelation when Glyph saw his appearance. A twisted smile formed on Glyph's cramped face. Your power and charisma were simply too overwhelming without you this war might continue until our grandkids' age. You know you're just a mere peasant, and yet not even the noble can ignore your current self. You're the best brave of Rijo's kingdom one that originate from peasants yourself. Naturally, you're widely popular amongst the peasants. W. What in the hell are you talking about? As long as the possibility that you'll leak out His Majesty Aurelia's secret right after the end of the war exists, His Majesty Aurelia will not be at ease with your presence. The throne will definitely fall to your hand if that happened after all. There are many stubborn geezers inside the castle. And thanks to that idiotic archduke's action and subsequent execution, his majesty has no close relatives left that's why we have no choice but to do this to prevent any undesirable future. At that moment, Lambert couldn't hear anything anymore over the roar of his thoughts he couldn't understand what Glyph was talking about however, that didn't last for long because he soon understood. In short, Aurelia saw Lambert's popularity as a threat to her position after the conclusion of the War of Unification but, even then, he still couldn't accept such fact despite understanding its meaning. That's impossible. Does His Majesty Aurelia really suspect me of planning a rebellion? Yet, even without any words, he knew that such rumors had already been spread around it was fanned by the nobles who were jealous of Lambert climbing up to his current position however. Before now, Aurelia didn't seem to care about such rumor. Because Aurelia was Lambert's most important friend. They had encouraged each other, they had told each other their respective dreams, and he had ended up harboring love for Aurelia, but, bearing his own status in mind, he had decided to shove and bury those feelings away to the corner of his memories and heart. For him, Aurelia was his benefactor, his best friend, his lord, and the one he loved. I'm possible that that's impossible. But looking at the current situation, with Glyph who was aiming for his life, it was hard to think of any other explanation for he doubted that Glyph would move without Aurelius, his lord, order. And, as part of royalty, it was her duty to pluck out the seed of rebellion at the early stage and, even though she might feel that it was a blatant lie, she couldn't just ignore the tiny possibility that it wasn't a lie there because the thing that was at stake was the kingdom's future. Even so Lambert still couldn't accept that fact. Your majesty why for what reason I? As his heart was hit critically by Glyph's words, Lambert fell on his knees his grip lost its strength, letting his sword to fall from his hand. The moment the sword made a clunking sound, Glyph stood up at once and stabbed his sword at the torso part of Lambert's armor Lambert, who was still deeply shocked, didn't even resist the attack as he staggered to his back. However, Glyph's attack had yet to end he tackled Lambert. From a point-blank range fired a sword skill the force of his attack propelled Lambert to the edge of the cliff, allowing himself an escape while remaining at sword's length from his friend. For a moment, Lambert's body was floating in the air. A.H. Glyph's attack had driven him off from the cliff in a panic. His hand moved as he tried to grip onto something, which in the end turned out to be Glyph's own sword. This sword is my gift to you, brave Lambert. Glyph said that, then let go of his sword, watching dispassionately as Lambert's body fell from the high cliff. Two months later, the kingdom of Rijos finally fulfilled its long-lasting wish it finally united all countries in the western part of Oremia continent, putting an end to the long 400 years warring era. The name of the brave glyph became well known as the loyal retainer of King Aurelia, the king who united the western continent, E.D. Die Scum. Act 12 Undead Knight? Chapter 2 Undead Knight? TL 9 EDPF Part 1. Two men were walking in the darkness of the deep valley. The first man wore a deep blue-colored robe which covered his body save for eyes despite having a short stature, 
The crimson glint from his eyes didn't denote him as a child at all he was straddling a coffin that was almost as tall as him on his back. The other one was a bald old man with a grim look on his face. They were both members of Devil's Piper, an organization that focused on researching the forbidden sorcery, something that was forbidden or restricted by the country. The member of Devil's Piper? were composed of excellent sorcerers whose curiosity had led them to step onto the wrong path they were famous for having no qualm over the method they used for experiments like using human as their lab rats, or even murder. However, while they were regarded as an extremely dangerous existence, the country didn't really know what to do about them their movements were too unpredictable, thus they were basically left alone to their own devices. The name of the child wearing robe was Maniga despite him being born from a family who was famous for their white magic, a magic that specializes in curing people, he decided to go against the family teaching and enter the Devil's Piper? In short, he chose to betray all that his family stood for currently, he was researching the arts of necromancy, the magic that would control corpses. The other one, the old man, was Bluig he was also a member of Devil's Piper? This time, he came down to the bottom of this valley acting as Maniga's escort in his youth. He was known as an excellent magician who wandered around subjugating the demon that was spanned from the well of mana. However, the current him was nothing more than a husk of his former self when he grew old. He had succumbed to his desire to pursue the root of magic before his death. Thus why he entered? Devil's Piper? Yes, I can feel mana flowing in this place no one would have any doubt even if someone was lost in this kind of place we just need to kidnap the person who happened to pass by this place. And we will get all of the ingredients we need and no one will suspect us. Hearing that, Blig licked his lips with a smile as he looked at the tall cliff ahead, impatient however, Maniga walked ahead, leaving Blig behind, searching for something Blig noticing his action chased after him in a hurry after all he's supposed to be escorting Maniga. Soon, Maniga stopped in his tracks and then squatted in front of a skeleton. The skeleton was wrapped in full body armor. Holding a sword in its hand, there was a helmet beside the skeleton. Why are you in such a hurry, Maniga? This skeleton still has mana flowing in it. What did you say? At once Blug stood beside the skeleton and looked at it closely to examine it and from what one could see with the naked eye, there was almost no dirt on the bones, and no sign of deterioration most likely, the powerful mana that resided inside those bones prevented it from happening. Mana was something that resided in all living creations some even said that it was part of the soul. And normally, when the living died, mana would leave their body and disperse into the atmosphere however, when there was a strong attachment and lingering feelings. Parts of their mana would head back to their deceased body and resided deep in their bones. The only way to disperse those lingering mana was to hold a proper funeral however. From the feel of the mana residing in this bones, it was obvious that it had been a long time ago since the person was dead it seemed like no one ever properly gave the person a burial. Booty have never seen this armor before on top of that. This type of armor is the type that was popular a long time ago. A full plate armor does this mean that the mana had been residing in this thing for hundreds of years. That's highly possible since this place has been turned into a well of mana which also helped prevents the bones from further deterioration moreover. From the look of it, the skeleton's lingering affection seems to be quite something else it definitely will become nice material for undead. Maniga mused as he lowered the coffin on his back and opened it to show that it was filled with various ingredients, grimoires, and medium for sorcery. Well, let's try your necromancy here, Maniga. Bluig then placed down the lantern in his hand on the ground as he leaned on the nearby rock. Watching as Maniga took out a dark red liquid and metal poles from his coffin, and used it to make a huge circle with the skeleton as the center next he took out a bottle before scattering its content some sort of powder that was made of several broken demons remain, on the armored skeleton. Finished with all the preparation, Maniga tried to move the armored skeleton to the central position of the circle, and grimaced upon feeling its weight. 
This armor must be a mystic metal organ. Maniga wasn't strong enough to move that heavy-duty organ. Making an armor with organ what kind of foolishness is this as if anyone who wear that kind of armor can move properly it might have been made by some idiotic upstart noble in the long past era. But there's a record that Rijo's kingdom used to use the full plate armor of organ during the eight countries unification war. Maybe it is created to be a decoration ritual as if someone who can wear that kind of armor exists those foolish historians sure can think of something that amusing sometimes huh? I see now, you might be right. Maniga then pointed his cane toward the armored skeleton he was constructing magic formation in his head, and then transcribed in the air by the power of mana. Soon, the magic formation's light was shining on top of the armored skeleton. Part 2 O oh, dead soul, obey mind command. A pair of crimson lights appeared in the eye sockets of the armored skeleton at the same time as Maniga's voice resounded in the clearing then, its entire body trembled a sign that it was awakening. Now, we got an obedient corpse of a knight. Hum as expected of the descendant of the prestigious white magic user family for your skill to reach such terrifying degree at that age. Though I don't like to be reminded of that house, I'm still honored to be praised by you, Blugse. The armored skeleton rose up slowly. Maniga was shocked in seeing that. Since this undead was made using the mana that resided within the skeleton, its power was supposed to be only as powerful as the skeleton's power when it was still alive. Maniga had never expected that the skeleton, that was only supposed to be as strong as when it was alive, was able to actually stand up while wearing that heavy organ armor after all. There was no human who was capable of moving while wearing organ armor at least, none that he knew of that's why he planned to strip that organ armor off however it seemed like that plan was unnecessary. Try to slash the air using that sword. Maniga ordered the armored skeleton nodded before it swung its sword and that giant sword tore the air in front of it with an incredible speed. With just a simple swing from the armored skeleton was enough to create a surging gale Maniga was shocked as he fell on his rear the wind also caused his hood to fall, exposing a teary-eyed baby face of Maniga, which was completely at odds with his crooked evil nature. W what a power ui, Managadono, are you okay? When Blood called his name, Maniga snapped out of his dumbfounded state, and soon his mouth curved up as he laughed delightfully. Nice this is amazing. This undead isn't your run-off-the-mill undead. There's no need to fear Rijo's kingdom monitoring my activity, as long as I have this undead. Maniga was in a completely excited state as he roared loudly, creating a rain of saliva. ho I'm looking forward to it. Maybe the mana vein of this land is the reason for the skeleton power. Search around. There might be other corpses like this one. Oh, and Blug Sam let's call the other, Devil's Piper, in the other area to gather our war potential, and erase the city of Revel from the map. Sure thing this sort of powerful undead will really make a difference let's try to make a proposal to the upper echelon to push forward the research about necromancy. Blug was grinning ear to ear as he looked at the armored skeleton. Of course. Let's do that. And someday, we're going to turn all of the citizen of this damned kingdom into an undead. Let's turn those stupid people of Rijo's kingdom who can't understand the wonder of Devil's Piper into our undead slaves forever. Fufufu, wonderful. When those two were busying themselves while laughing and fantasizing, the body of the armored skeleton trembled. Oh, Rijo's kingdom. Bluig stopped laughing as he looked at the armored skeleton. Oh, could it be that this guy still has its ego? As if, it's just mumbling whatever words it picked up or perhaps it had an extreme case of lingering attachment when it died, and had a reaction to the word there were plenty of cases where undead still make a simple reaction to a word that triggered its memories, but that's all besides, in this case. This skeleton seems to have died a very long time ago, honestly. It's already a miracle that it still have mana residue in it, so it should have already lost all of its ego. 
Rijo's Kinjidio and will stop the destruction of Rijo's kingdom so Rijo's kingdom managed to unite the western continent, huh? The armored skeleton swung its sword to the side. Eh? Maniga let out a dumbfounded voice when he heard the skeleton speaking he then went nearer to the armored skeleton as it looked at Bluig. Meanwhile, the swing that the skeleton had made with his sword just now created a terrifying gale that enveloped the area, and despite being separated by quite a distance with it, Bluig still ended up being blown away by the gale and crashed on the cliff wall behind. But Bluig knew very well that the swing that had sent him flying just now was not a serious move, in short it was just a casual light swing, and not full-powered one thus, as soon as he could, he immediately stood up as he cleared the dust cloud with his sleeves. And no way so it's not an extremely old corpse. Furthermore, its remaining will power is strong enough to go against its necromancer. A managadono. Do something about this guy. Unfortunately, at that moment, Maniga's upper half body fell right beside Bluig who was still shouting. Eh? No matter how one looked at it, it was obvious that he is dead. W.I. did I, Olivia, a -A -A -A. Part 3 The armored skeleton then turned his attention to Bluig. Yerth, be a swamp. Bluig stroked the ground with his cane as soon as the magic square appeared on the ground, the armored skeleton's legs were sunk into muddy swamp. Yeah. While it was baffled, its body kept sinking into the swamp. O oh Earth, solidify. Yet Bluig didn't stop at that he used one magic after another so when half of the armored skeleton body had sunk into the swamp he made, Bluig immediately solidified it back to Earth ground. O oh Earth, become stone. Then, the earth that gathered and buried the half-sunk armored skeleton was transformed into a lump of rock in a blink of an eye. Heaving a relieved sigh, Bluig knees fell to the ground. Ha ha it seems that it regained its ego and fell into a confused state good grief what a terrifying fella say this is your fault, Managadono. After that, Bluig cupping his hand against his mouth as nauseated feeling assaulted him. You maybe I overdid it. The magic that was needed to change the form of materials was not little and using it in succession within a short period of time was an extremely large burden even for a magus of Bluig's caliber usually. There would need to be a stopgap to be able to use these level of magic in succession. That's why Bluig was suffering from the recoil of his decision. Unfortunately for him, the next moment, while he was still feeling the recoil, the lump of rock was smashed apart from within and one could see the armored skeleton's figure doing it it forced its way through the rock's restraint and jumped up before it landed on the ground with a loud thud. What? I'm possible. Blug retreated as he shouted. O oh flame, burn mine enemy. He pointed his cane toward the armored skeleton while his other hand pinned his temple. The blazing flame that appeared on the tip of his cane changed its shape into a sphere before it was fired at the armored skeleton. Yolo! The armored skeleton easily erased the flame with a swing of his sword. Unable to withstand the gale formed by the swing of the armored skeleton's sword, Bluig frantically braced his legs on the ground as he shut his eyes. Just, what kind of undead is this F. Carrot King monster? When he finally managed to open his eyes after the gale subsided, the armored skeleton was already standing in front of Bluig. It stood there with its great sword raised high above. Wah! The next moment, the giant sword descended, splitting Bluig's body half. And each half of his body was instantly thrown into opposite directions due to the sheer wind pressure which came from the sword's swing. Act 13 Chapter 3 Undead Knight Part 1 The armored skeleton, or what used to be known as Lambert, the former general of the kingdom of Rejos was staring dumbfoundedly at the blade of the sword in his hand and the reflection of his own appearance in it. The image that was being reflected by his sword was that a skeleton clad in full plate armor red flame was set ablaze in his eye sockets adding to the eeriness of the skeleton's figure. 
Despite being turned into an undead, Lambert had retained his ego in perfect condition his willpower and lingering affection far surpassed Maniga's expectations. Maniga had never expected that the armored skeleton he found was the great hero of eight countries' unification war who died an unnatural death. W. What is happening here? Lambert was puzzled he could feel the lump of mana directly from inside his cranium. Rather I died and Arijo's kingdom is. Lambert recalled his battle with Glyph and following that he recalled the beautiful face of his lord, Aurelia, and the series of betrayals she unleashed upon him. No, I was not betrayed she did what she had to do as a king. And yet, that revelation wasn't even enough to clear away his resentment towards her that was just how much trust he had placed on Aurelia. His best friend he knew it better than anyone else that he swung his sword not for the sake of the kingdom of Regos, but for Aurelia herself he didn't regret the fact that he gave his life for her. However, being assassinated just because she deemed him as a thorn for her reign hurt Lambert's feelings more than the fact he's assassinated. So that lingering feeling was what turned me into an undead or rather, how am I so effeminate to become one just because of that? Lambert was ashamed of himself, but he instinctively knew that the pool of mana that he felt in his cranium combined with his lingering attachment were his driving force, and while he considered suicide, he immediately stopped that train of thought. I wanted to know what became of Rijo's kingdom after the war. He thought, so he picked up the helmet that was rolling around on the ground and wore it as long as he wore this full-face helmet. No one should be able to guess that Lambert was an undead. After all, despite being betrayed and assassinated, it didn't change his feelings or wishes he really hoped the best for his motherland and to see his lord unite the western Warimia continent, ed my poor MC. Part 2 Nevertheless who were those guys anyway? He suddenly shifted his attention to the corpses that were lying around him he looked at the lower half of the youth that's lying on its own pool of blood he was Maniga, the necromancer that Lambert bisected just a while ago. Maniga was born in a house that was famous for its white magic he had learnt white magic since the tender age of eight years old, and was widely regarded as a genius magician later on he dyed his hand with necromancy, a kind of forbidden magic. And now, despite being only fourteen years old, he was well known as one of the Devil's Piper? For him now, smashing half of a village to turn them into undead just for fun or making mountains of undead was an everyday occurrence. As such, he was treated as one of the more dangerous members of Devil's Piper? With a bounty on his head and by the five danger levels used on monster subjugation, Maniga was ranked as four the same rank that great demon had a rank which needed more than twenty first-class warriors to subjugate. Nevertheless, the reason for Maniga's high danger level was mainly because of his necromancy however, since he was unprepared, he was taken by a surprise attack this time that caused his death. It seems they're talking about destroying Rijo's kingdom are they Makiura's kingdom's people whilst I am asleep. What exactly happened listening to what they had said? It didn't look like the war has ended if I went there to help out now. I wonder what kind of face that bastard Glyph will make when he sees me. Looking at the upper half of Maniga's body that had tumbled far away from his lower half, Lambert heaved a sigh. Nevertheless, those guys from Makiura's kingdom were really heartless just what in the hell are they thinking in their minds sending such an inexperienced kid, who obviously lacked any training, to Ogren Valley right in the middle of war seems like they're lacking capable personnel honestly, they should have just surrendered, yet they. Lambert recalled the dread that filled Maniga's face right before his body was sliced in two, and thought that the kid was a combat amateur he was unaware that the kid he was talking about was an infamous necromancer who had destroyed many villages just for fun, and in fact not a warrior at all in fact. Maniga really didn't have any resolution to fight to the death therefore, he had always kept his distance away from his enemies during battle but Lambert didn't know any of this not a thing. And if one were to compare their magic skill, Blig has more obvious live combat experience than Maniga however, his danger rank was the same level as the great demon's rank, 
and higher than Bluig's rank because, irrespective of his magic combat abilities or physical combat abilities, as a man who could stay close with an immortal demon who fed on humans was quite exceptional in his own ways. And amongst the midder magicians, Bluig's magic skills were frankly unequaled rapid firing original magic to gain some time wasn't something a normal magician could pull off furthermore. Bluig's barrage of magic attacks didn't look like it recoiled back into his body. And the intensity of it was enough to keep many people away anyone else would die after their movement was sealed away by Bluig's magic manipulation skills. Bluig was undefeated in ground combat. He was feared as Bluig of the Earth Spider? Part 3 He had never expected that he'd die in an unknown fight he never expected that his prided earth magic was shattered through sheer force, and he died with his body sliced in half from head to toe. Lambert was also unaware of this fact, thus acted as if this matter was a trivial thing to him. Though his invocation was faster than the average magician, it's too brittle and despite the fast-paced attack, it isn't that hard to dodge as long as one's mind stayed clear him. Perhaps his strength had weakened due to his advanced age. In the warring era when Lambert lived, strength is justice everyone desperately studied magic and swordplay every day was a fight against their past self from yesterday, and those who couldn't get used to that extreme situation most often was dead and Lambert was a man who stood on the apex of that time. However, that practice was already slightly outdated that was why the people from that era and this era were very different, just like an old man and a kid. Old man and kid, what a joke I have to end this war immediately, it's not just for the people of our kingdom, but also for the citizens of the other kingdom. And then, Lambert who held misguided sense of justice ran toward the cliff as he did so, he recalled Aurelia's face. A blonde-haired beauty with strong-willed eyes. Her soft and smooth skin along with her stern eyebrows. And her girlish smile that was slightly different from her normal smile that she showed to Lambert from time to time. When he recalled those memories, he held on to his chest, feeling a stabbing-like pain in the area where his heart was supposed to be if he was alive but what lies behind his metal armor now was nothing but a hollow skeleton even if he wanted to cry. No tears could come out thus. He could only let out a lonely laugh. Act 14 Ogre Chapter 4 Ogre Once he integrated his body and mind, he looked for a secluded place below the cliff, then looked up at it only when he had reached a calm state of mind did he raise a loud war cry as he ran up the cliff as he did so an extremely loud sound resounded in the vicinity. Along with a vertical trail of dust and sand that was slowly falling down the wall of cliff. Ha! He swung his sword along with its scabbard to the tip of the cliff then, using the recoil, he instantly took a leap the only one who could pull off such a feat, while clad in organ armor, in the entirety of the continent of Wurimia was Lambert alone in the past era or current one. I can still move like I did when I was still alive having an undead body is truly a wonder, as if I still have my own weight and flesh. The matter was just as he thought it was thanks to Maniga's necromancy therefore, the current Lambert had something called the pseudo-flesh. That was made with a special mana alteration in short, it's a skill that let an invisible layer of mana cover his bones, and gave him the feeling of weight and power therefore letting him move just like he did when he was still alive. Pseudo-flesh? Was in fact a mere energy body, the only recourse for the undead to move around and if Lambert tried to stab his sword into his neck, that sword would pass through his pseudo-flesh? Directly severing his bone instead, because the skill didn't protect his bones at all it differed from common flesh. Despite the shortcomings of the skill, Lambert still had the greatest armor covering his skeleton the organ armor, or its rather long and tedious official name, Regenix or Gazira armor. Aurelia's predecessor, during his reign, gathered and commissioned famous craftsmen to create it, pouring in resources of all kinds there were only four such armors in the world. It was the equipment that could only be worn by the four great generals of the kingdom of Regos them, 
and only them alone were allowed to don those armors they were otherwise known as the four demon generals and Lambert was one of the successors of those original four demon generals. No methods and attacks could put a scratch on this armor however, this armor was not the reason why the four demon generals were a terror on the battlefield the reason why they were known thus, was because they could run across the battlefield wearing that heavy armor as if it were featherlight. That being said, he continued to run after reaching the peak of the cliff right now, thanks to his armor. With each step he created a loud sound inside the silent forest. During that time, he sensed a malicious aura although it was the first time he sensed this kind of aura. He could guess the identity of the owner of that malicious aura. Is this demon aura? Demon was the kind of beast who was born from a well of mana and undead who was born by the power of mana was included in its ranks the current Lambert, whose death was distorted by mana, was also an undead a demon kind. Normally, it's only after living beings were born that they would have mana within them, and this also included normal animals to be more specific. God bestowed manna upon living being as a proof of his blessing it was different with demons because they were born from a well of manna the exact opposite of a living being that was why they were treated as the wicked life whose very existence was a sin. And since demons were born from manna, their manna sensing abilities were beyond comparison especially for the undead, who by nature envied the living and thus were extremely sensitive to manna and life force and... That's the reason why he had gained the ability to sense and seek mana now, something that was impossible when he was a human. However, since Lambert had only recently become an undead, he didn't have the confidence in his newly acquired abilities so, he needed to confirm his deductions that's why he decided to go toward the direction of the malicious aura. He had no idea about where to go anyway, and he had nothing to lose by doing it anyway. Thus, Lambert saw the source of the aura in front of a big tree. Glaring at him and standing upright was the figure of a big demon. That big demon was a size bigger and rounder than Lambert with his armor. Its flesh looked like a mass of muscle with bulging blood vessels. Its thick horns that were smeared with blood rendered it an even more menacing appeal. The sharp claws along with the tusks that peeked out from its mouth also added to the menacing intent since their soul. Purpose was to kill the prey. It's called an ogre the standard of a powerful demon, the kind of opponent that humans couldn't win in direct confrontation especially because, when compared to it, the human race was way too inferior in terms of physical power. Not to mention the long arms that ogres had, allowed them a longer reach the difference in the physical power and the reach of the long arms, between the two races, wasn't something that could be overturned so easily. And while a first-rate wizard might be able to defeat an ogre by attacking its Achilles heel, usually wizards were not the ones dispatched to deal with it normally. A single ogre was dealt with by four first-class warriors. After all, while the ogre had a belligerent nature that made their attack pattern way too predictable, dodging its ramming attacks was a completely different matter numerous warriors had died due to these very ramming attacks. The ogre had also sensed Lambert's mana and stood there in silence it was the king of this forest, and every day, the demons in the forest had always brought a part of their food that they had hunted, as an offering for the ogre. No demon in the forest was ever careless enough to pass before the ogre, even when they came to offer their spoils from hunting they usually hid themselves silently so as to not rouse the sleeping ogre it was a kind of law so as to shield themselves from the violent rage that the demon can unleashed at times. However, Lambert had only just approached the place with the large mana, completely oblivious to this fact seeing Lambert's action, enraged, the ogre leapt at him at once and, even though it was enraged by the rude intruder in its territory. It was also curious at the same time or perhaps it might want to verify who was better itself, or the intruder after all. It could also sense Lambert's mana, and it had never met any creature that had such an intense mana besides itself. As it leapt, the ogre lowered its waist and stretched its arms forward to the ground taking a stance to ram Lambert in response. Lambert unsheathed his sword to fight the ogre even as he continued to run forward. Gee, you. The ogre growled in a low voice, 
baffled at Lambert's action because Lambert was full of openings. At the sight of an exposed Lambert, the ogre thought that irrespective of how it would ram into him, Lambert's defensive and evading tactics wouldn't be able to protect himself, surely making him the next victim of its claws. Ogre was a race gifted with high combat ability right from their birth they were able to see through the unguarded sides and moments of lapse and attention of their prey, and go directly for the kill and, in this ogre's eyes, Lambert was full of openings. Gaga. The ogre then rushed towards Lambert. In the ogre's view, Lambert's reflexes were far too slow although at the beginning the ogre felt elated upon sensing a worthy opponent. It eventually felt dejected when it finally saw Lambert's actions and reactions. After all, in the face of an ogre's ramming onslaught, any normal creature would immediately perk up its defenses eyes wide open, trembling shoulders, even suddenly raising its arms or, it would simply shudder all over basically, a normal creature's body would instinctively react to the ogre like it would to any threat. As its mind would automatically think of, how to deal with the ogre? And, as the ogres were gifted with high combat ability, by nature, it could estimate the reflex of any living creature trying to protect itself. As a result of its innate capability, the ogre concluded that Lambert was weaker than itself. The ogre thrust its sharp claws into the gap of Lambert's armor on the neck or, so it was supposed to be it was already imagining the scene of Lambert losing his head. But its sharp claws didn't even reach Lambert. Its arm fluttered midair and creating a rain of blood. As soon as it registered, the ogre felt its body fall backward. It didn't know how it happened. It only felt its incoming death. And the last thing its brain, that was enhanced by mana, saw were the scenes of its life being played in slow motion. It was too late. Almost at the same time as its arm was being severed, its body was also split in half by Lambert. Not stopping at just that, Lambert continued with the third death blow, heading straight towards the ogre's head this series of actions, from slicing the ogre's torso and arms to crushing its head, was carried out in less than a second and before the ogre fell down. Before its death, the ogre realized that it was just a frog in the bottom of the well the reason why it couldn't see Lambert's defensive measures was because Lambert was far more used to combat than it was he simply didn't waste any of his movement that's all there was to it. Realizing this fact at the final moment, the ogre finally felt ashamed of its own empty pride it had failed to measure how weak it was compared to Lambert however, as a demonic race that was well known for its thirst for battle, it was proud to be able to battle against Lambert in its last fight. Lambert calmly stabbed the ogre's face, disregarding the strong pressure he released the sound of his sword squashing the ogre's head resounded in the forest. Thus, the ogre met its end. Lambert leaped toward the ogre who was about to ram at him, slicing its arms and torso, and then piercing its head that was what happened within that single moment of their battle. If that was done to any ordinary person, they'd already have turned into lumps of meat without even understanding what had happened to them in that single moment. For the ogre to be able to realize what exactly happened to cause its death, that was really a proof of its fearsome capability. Meanwhile, even after this, Lambert was still running, idly swinging his sword to the side to get rid of the blood on it before sheathing it back to its proper place that absent-minded action of his gave the feeling that it was something habitual and not worthy of any accolades. I see, so my current body can sense the presence of mana I might be able to use this ability to find a human settlement. However, without minding anything, his thoughts had already switched from confirming his doubt to using his newly gained ability because to someone of Lambert's caliber, subjugating an ogre-class demon was way too easy and not worth another moment's thought. That's strange the terrain and landscape are slightly different from what I remember have I ended up in a completely different place. And at this moment, once again he had mistaken the current situation because he didn't realize that he was resurrected two hundred years after his death. Act 15 Bandit's Gang Chapter 5 Bandit's Gang Strange this area is too quiet just what in the hell happened during my death. Lambert thought, anxious as he strengthened his vigilance to his surroundings as far as he knew, 
the demons, animals, and insects, all of them fundamentally had sharper instinct than humans had as such, he expected that they wouldn't approach a dangerous place by their own will. Lambert's theory was half right. He was right about the fact that they wouldn't approach a dangerous place he just didn't realize that the so-called danger they were avoiding was none other than himself what he didn't realize was the fact that the demons were hiding themselves as soon as they felt the pressure that came from his mana that leaked out of his body. Of course, the leaked pressure was not only limited to Lambert animals also released a tiny amount of mana from their body, but demons, especially the undead race, released far greater amounts of mana from their bodies, which created a large pressure depending on the amount leaked and, as long as he didn't deliberately conceal his mana. His pressure would always persist. And in the case of demons, the minuscule amount of mana that was automatically leaked from their bodies was called miasma. It would induce fear and discomfort depending on the demon's type. The miasma would even cause a disease. For undead, especially Lambert, who had regained his human ego, whose specs clearly far surpassed his race, whether as a human or as an undead, was unaware of the miasma that was leaking out from his body in spades. Good grief, I didn't sense any humans at all instead, since a while ago I only keep finding demon-like presence without meeting one but. They didn't appear when I expected them to. At this point, I'm fine even if it's just meeting another ogre. He thought as he kept running. Soon enough, the night end, and replaced with the morning sun. When Lambert looked at the morning sun with a sidelong glance, he realized that he didn't get tired at all despite running for a whole night. Undead never got tired, nor do they need sleep when Lambert recalled that fact. He felt a slight nostalgia that he could no longer do those activities. He wasn't a living being, he was a distorted life, a dead man walking, he kept reminding himself of that fact after he sorted out his own feelings, and pondered over his new body and status, he ended up astonished by what he found. This body doesn't need sleep nor it need rest, Hudo be in a battlefield with this kind of body is a fortune, I mean this body will always move at its top gear, so there will be no need to rest if we're still in the middle of war. We'll be extremely fortunate to have this kind of body. Even if we have to discard our physical body if all of the four demon generals of Rijo's kingdom turned into undead, we can take down a castle with just the four of us. Lambert, who was wholeheartedly devoted to his kingdom, completely discarded his own feelings, which was slightly off from what a normal person would feel and knowing that he didn't have to worry about his own stamina. He changed his mind and decided to run through the forest at top speed. And yet, I didn't even see a single animal on my way. Don't tell me that I've yet to enter the territory of demon even after running for half a day. The demon boss of this area must be a tough nut. In the end, Lambert still failed to notice that he was simply misunderstanding the situation. After running for a while, Lambert finally sensed the animal's mana it was different from the animals that he had sensed so far the source seemed to be fixed at one place so, Lambert decided to go and meet the owner of that mana for the time being. However, what he found when he got closer to the source of mana was a thin and malnourished girl sitting on a rock with pale complexion, sunken cheeks, and arms that were as thin as a dry branch who knew how many days since she had last ate something. But the bow and quiver the fallen bird with an arrow lodged into its body by her feet. Judging by the scene, she seemed to be in the middle of hunting yet she didn't eat the bird she had hunted. Even though she could just do it she didn't even look like she wanted to dismantle her game. She merely stared at the ground with a sorrowful look on her face. Taking these facts into mind, Lambert went and stood in front of that girl. The girl raised her face and looked up at Lambert from her sitting position. Compared to other animals, humans were lacking in terms of sensing miasma and mana that's why the girl didn't notice the miasma released by Lambert. The girl over there what is the year of Rijo's right now and I want you to tell me what you know about what happened in the war with Makiura's kingdom. At that, the girl looked at Lambert, eyes opened wide, slightly fearful due to the little miasma she could faintly sense that leaked from Lambert's body also, 
Since she had never seen someone who wore full body armor like him, it increased that fear but it also gave a little bit of hope in her heart, making her stand up and walk towards Lambert. You um could it be that you are the army of Earl Albach if so the others are? Albach no, I don't know that name moreover, I'm just by myself. The expectation and delight that colored her face slowly vanished. That must be it, right please leave this place immediately. What? The truth is, my village was occupied by thieves they took my sick mother and younger sister as a hostage and forced me to hunt for them every day though some adventurers come to our village to check the situation since the contact from our village suddenly get cut off they were caught immediately you too, please run before you got caught by them. Hearing that, Lambert finally grasped her situation he now understood why she didn't touch her game despite clearly starving and she might have mistaken him as part of the Earl's private army who had come to save her village after he heard their situation. But still Ivy never heard about any village in the forest that was so close to the national border on top of that your pronunciation is slightly strange ah. I see now it seems that I unconsciously ended up running deep into the Makiura's kingdom. National border Makiura's kingdom um, what are you talking about just now? What? This is Rijo's kingdom, moreover, I think we're on the closer side of the capital. WWW, what did you say? Lambert shouted loudly, shaken to the core of his being in the time being. The girl was surprised by his sudden loud noise and twitched in, annoyance. T this place is around the capital of Rijo's kingdom then her majesty Aurelia had finally united the entire western continent after the war with Makiura's kingdom. Moreover, the fact that there's a village in this place, could it be that more than twenty years had passed since then then that means this is around the age where her majesty Aurelia shall already have a grandchild three never expected that twenty years had passed since then it seems I have to brace myself. At least... That was what Lambert thought of when he's given that information. What he didn't know was the fact that it had been more than 200 years since Glyph had pushed Lambert to the bottom of the cliff. He didn't know that the story of Makiura's kingdom was regarded as an old story, and he didn't know that Aurelia, who had complicated feelings of love and hate for Lambert, had long since passed away from old age. Um. So... Even though he didn't know his full situation at the moment, he still regained his composure after he was flustered for a while when the girl called him. Come to think of it, little girl, do you remember seeing this armor before? And no, my apologies, I haven't. I see. When he heard her words, he felt that it was only natural for her to have no knowledge about Regenix or Gazira armor? After all, she was born in the peaceful era and, although he felt rather lonely with such a generation gap, it couldn't be helped. In fact, the four demon generals' title might have long ceased to exist too, and even if the title still existed, it might have changed so much from what he'd known. That being the case it's better if they don't know about my identity using my identity as Lambert, the former four demon general might be a hindrance to my attempt in information gathering that news might even reach Glyph's ears though I might be able to win in our next battle it's not like I want him to die, ED meanwhile. I'm particularly glad to have him die at your hand I might be a tad bloodthirsty, but PRI second this. On a side note, Lambert's former best friend, Glyph, was one of the four demon generals he had the same rank as Lambert himself and... He had passed away a long time ago, ED at least, make sure there's a side history of his afterlife where he enjoys his stay in hell. It seems that this girl wasn't aware of that fact yet due to her young age, but maybe I have to get a normal set of full plate armor so that I don't stand out in a crowd. The current mainstream equipment for protectors were focused on maneuverability and lightweight as such leather armor or breastplate that protected only one's vital spots were all the trend of full plate armor like the one he wore was extremely conspicuous in a bad way however. Lambert had no way of knowing it. Um, since the village is close by this place is dangerous you should be able to escape if you go toward that direction um. Please help me to inform Muro Obuksama about our situation. If I leave the village, 
They're going to kill the hostages, including my mother and little sister. Please help us to inform Abaksama. The girl plead Lambert desperately wishing to save and be saved. No, that's unnecessary. Eh? Even if I look like this, I was a former knight. I have no reason to just ignore the citizens of Rijo's kingdom who suffered from thieveries. Let me take care of those little thieves. Despite Aurelia's incomprehensible treatment toward him, Lambert would not forget the patriotism for his own country because, by his very own nature, Lambert had an extremely powerful sense of justice. P please don't force yourself. There are more than thirty of them. I fear not the likes of untrained bandits like them, no matter how many there are lead me to your village. Be but. Yet the girl, who knew what sort of suffering would befell her family should she lead Lambert to the village, hesitated she didn't know whether he could easily defeat those thieves or not but she knew what the consequences would be Sash couldn't take such a reckless action not on someone who she was not sure of someone that's not even in a group. But Lambert felt quite irritated at her hesitation from his perspective. He couldn't understand why this girl was so obstinate and didn't entrust the punishment of the thieves to him. To him, they were just a gathering of rogue with no training, no proper leader nor a goal to aim for that was the definition of thief in Lambert Dictionary. Besides, as one of the four demon generals, Lambert was hailed as humanoid weapon in Rijo's kingdom to him. The likes of the thieves were nothing but annoying bugs to be squashed. Lambert thought that even if the girl couldn't recognize his Regenix or Gazira armor, at the very least she still believed in knights it could be easily seen from the shine in her eyes when I mentioned that I was a knight. The belief that thugs could never defeat military personnel, who had been trained to the limits of humanity, regardless of how many they were was extremely deep-rooted back in Lambert's era and, in this era where safe living was possible, the chance for a superman like the people from Lambert's era was extremely close to zero as such. While the belief that knights would fight the thugs for commoners still existed in the girl's heart, she couldn't fully trust a lone knight for something she perceived would need a group accomplish. Since Lambert and the girl had different life experiences, they couldn't reach an understanding. Do not make me repeat myself lead me to your village. Due to his irritation at the unchanged situation, Lambert's body involuntarily discharged thick miasma at a density that was dozens of times more powerful than what he passively discharged the density was so thick that the girl with her dull perception toward miasma could feel it. The girl's face paled. As she shivered in fear unable to withstand the pressure, she fell on her butt. Despite clearly facing against a strange man, whose whole body was covered in armor, she felt like she was facing against a gargantuan demon beast instead she felt that he was a predator, and she was currently his prey unknowingly to both party. Lambert's undead miasma had instilled the difference between their power to the girl's mind. He's going to kill me. The overwhelming intimidation from the miasma that Lambert unconsciously expelled made her feel that way. Aya. She couldn't speak no matter how hard she tried to seeing the dread the girl felt. Lambert also felt shaken he had never expected her reaction. I.T. seems like I accidentally threatened you here M.M.E. bad, too am just bad at dealing with children. Falling into a panic spell resulted in parts of his metallic armor clanking against each other, as he waved his arms Lambert, who thought that his helmet armor had accidentally unfastened, held it down with his hands in panic when he saw the girl's reaction. Why up it should be all right now? Though he wondered why the girl was so frightened. Now that he knew that her reaction wasn't because she saw his face, Lambert who had managed to calm himself felt something was overflowing from inside of his undead body therefore. He turned his conscience toward his own body to inspect himself. Don't tell me, my body is releasing my asthma I or ally am reduced to a mere demon. He finally realized that his body was constantly discharging miasma, and with the realization that he had completely become a demon kin, he hung his head down, heartbroken of his current status. After realizing that, he kept in mind that he had to suppress the amount of miasma that was discharged by his body to a bare minimum. 
It felt itchy. It was as hard as trying to stop oneself from sweating, however. The result pleased him very much as he couldn't feel the miasma that was overflowing from his body anymore. The damage had already been done though for the girl was stiff still as she hung her head down. Her body refused to move due to fear. How's that have you calmed down a little? Lambert, who felt that suppressing his miasma should be able to relieve the girl from her fear, called her again when he did that. The girl raised her face, eyes wide open as she looked at Lambert her originally fearful eyes now was filled with bewilderment instead. On my apologies just now, I lost my cool. When the powerful killing intent she felt just a while ago suddenly vanished into thin air, it left a gap that resulted in relieving the girl's fear somehow. You and me but I really am telling the truth about their number you see. I know what you mean but um. Lambert suddenly felt humans' mana coming from behind and there were more than one source. Three people, is it it seems we were wasting our precious moment while talking here. Eh? Lambert looked over his shoulder toward the source of the mana. Why, 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 how did you know? Good grief, thinking about sneak attacking us, is it? Cut the chit-chat and make that armored idiot into a porcupine with arrows especially. Your arm lets beat the hell of this guy and drag him. Three men appeared from the forest each of them wielding a blowgun, a sword, and a scythe. Act 16 Bandits Gang? Chapter 6 Bandits Gang? The thieves sneered like a starving beast as they looked toward Lambert, ignoring the girl who was becoming flustered by the second, her eyes darting between Lambert and the thieves. At first glance, the overwhelming difference in number was very clear furthermore. Lambert, who was armed to the teeth and wearing heavy-duty armor, was perceived to be unable to even run properly should he try. Kainaitsama, let's surrender. The girl begged tearfully, scared nevertheless, no matter how scared that girl of the thieves, to Lambert they were nothing more than cute little puppies. Your worry is for naught. Unsheathing his sword as he spoke, Lambert made a beeline toward the thieves he was so fast as if the heavy equipment on his body were as light as feathers but, judging from the sound of his footsteps made the four thieves felt like the forest was shaking, just like there's an ogre charging towards them. No one would think that full plate armor was just for show. Two am going to circle around from his right. Let's surround him and beat the hell out of him. Throw away your blow dart and take out your knife. He shouldn't be able to keep going if we stab the joint of his armor. The thief who stood at the front of the others, the one with scythe, instructed his colleagues. His first mistake was expecting Lambert movement to be hindered by his heavy armor. That was why he intended to waste Lambert's stamina with their sheer number when he made his plan, however. He realized such plan was impossible when he saw Lambert running speed. So, before he even had the chance to move, Lambert had already entered into the range of his heavy sword. Eh? The next thing he knew, all he felt was a terrifying killing intent and added with the effect of the miasma that was discharged by Lambert's body when he prepared to attack. It gave birth to a terror that coiled around the thieves' heart. And then, without even giving them a moment of rest, Lambert swung his great sword to the side. Hiya! The blow was accompanied with a loud roar, and within moments the neck of the man in front flew high into the air and then, the attack was followed by a second upward slash from below. The second and third thieves were also bisected right in half by the overwhelming mass of Lambert's great sword. The body of those three thieves were sent flying toward different direction from each other. From a slightly separated location away from the fight, the girl's eyes were wide open with shock. She couldn't see anything but the fact that Lambert had managed to dispatch those three thieves in just one strike. Lambert was that fast that when he executed his move, it made the girl only saw one strike. A amazing. Even though she saw it with her own two eyes, she doubted Lambert's power that she saw his power was so overwhelming to the point of unrealistic. And at that moment, Lambert sheathed his great sword back as the head of the first man fell right behind him, crushed like a crushed red tomato. 
what a disappointment. These guys have no skills to back their mouth, but this is strange they don't look like they were troubled by food. So what's causing this lack of I hope this isn't some sort of unpleasant omen but. During the era of eight countries unification war, Rijo's kingdom and the other kingdoms had established army that was placed all over their country to protect the kingdom against foreign forces and, at that time, there were countless villagers who had some degree of training to respond to the kingdom's call of conscriptions. Furthermore, to disperse the terrifyingly powerful enemy kingdom's army, they had to spread one team of armed group to plunder enemies' villages so, in some respect, the army needed to act as thieves as well and, at that time, the average power of the people from the eight countries' unification war era was far higher than the current era thus. Lambert's confusion after all, he had no knowledge about the changes of the era so, he felt that those thieves' movement was the same as that of an amateur. The girl at first disagreed to take Lambert to her village, and Lambert thought that it was because she would be the one held responsible as the one who guide him there however. She was finally forced to reconsider her choice when she saw what Lambert could do she thought over what might have happened if Lambert faced against more than thirty thieves. And she was finally convinced to take him there. What Lambert didn't say to the girl was the fact that he felt mana of a demon from the direction ahead of them. This sensation its danger level is around goblin rank but it doesn't seem to be that powerful nor vigilant either. After walking for a while, they found a demon that looked like a bipedal short wolf. A kobold. They usually were found living in a cave while scavenging for ores their race were not that powerful but they were considered as quite a cunning one they killed their prey with surprise attack and nasty tactics before they ate their prey's meat. And slightly away from their current position, sat two kobold digging into the ground with their fingers, looking for bugs for their meal. The moment he saw those kobold, a realization came to Lambert the reason why he didn't meet any other demons safe for the ogre he killed last night was due to the leaked miasma from his body. Anything that leaked miasma was under demon category. Lambert kept the information in his mind, thinking that it might become useful later on. Though we're taking a bit deeper this might be for better. The girl whispered to Lambert, however he completely ignored her words in his opinion. Letting the demon be so close to the village might give birth to many problems later on moreover. He wanted to try something he just thought of. Meanwhile, as soon as the two kobolds spotted Lambert, they stood up and snarled at him. Gah! Lambert let loose the miasma he had reined his body set in a daunting pose as he glared at the kobold when the kobold sensed his miasma. They immediately kneeled on the spot, tail lying listlessly seeing that. Lambert didn't react at all so, the kobolds showed an even more submissive pose with their belly up to the sky. Kyan Kyan! It was their stance to show their respect towards someone far more powerful than them. It was a show of their submission toward that person, showing that their life was in his hand by showing their most vulnerable spot to him. Their stomach their instinct told them that neither fighting nor running could save their life due to the overwhelming difference between their power. As somehow, they look rather pitiful. The girl muttered so. I've yet to release my miasma at full throttle and yet they were already this scared so I can use my miasma in this way too, ha. Huh? Lambert walked briskly toward the two kobold and then struck their neck with his great sword. The girl was at a loss when she saw such a gruesome scene when Lambert looked at the girl's face. He wondered whether she thought that it would be okay to not kill them. The kobold might be taking advantage of the situation and set the village on fire we have to kill them unless they were domesticated one though I'll overlook them if they were not in this location your village is close by right. Why wise? The girl was ashamed of her own carelessness since many demons were harmful to humans. They should be killed as soon as you found them. The same precept also exists in her village. But she ended up pitying those two kobolds just because they cried in a pitiful way. Act 17 Bandits Gang? Chapter 7 Bandits Gang? A while later, they saw the line of buildings, indicating that they were near the village now. Um, it's over there, huh? K-Nights, um, are you really alright? 
Just leave it to me was what I wanted to say, but I understand so little about the situation. Lambert was by no means a timid person it was just the fact that those bandits were acting a little too strange compared to what he knew and, that's why Lambert wondered whether it was a trap prepared for him. Those thieves are staying a little too long in one place the risk and return aren't balanced at all I feel it's strange since the thieves from before were just too weak. W what do you mean? Lambert stayed still noticing his action, the girl also stopped and turned around to face him, only to find Lambert looking at her. Naitsama Well, I guess there's no need to worry about that for now after settling this matter. I'll be able to investigate this matter properly if the branch is rotten. The leaves on the branch must be rotten to the best way is to sever the rotten branch before it spreads around the tree. Are you talking about the village? Don't mind it. Leave everything to me. Lambert increased his pace without answering the girl's question. The village was devastated. The weakened and thin villagers were being pushed around all over the place by the thieves their hands were holding scythes or whips threatened the villagers while forcing them into manual labor the sight of the villagers cowering in fear served as an amusement for them. Those who erred would either get their fingers smashed with the scythe, lashed with the whip, or worse, killed on the spot truly unrestrained, the thieves behaved as they pleased. In a corner of the village, corpses of five villagers were thrown disorderly. There was no specific pattern to these corpses lying haphazardly in the corner it comprised of men and women of various ages these people were the ones who'd rebelled, starved to death, or were accidentally killed by the occasional thieves who went too far. The number of deaths that happened after the thieves occupied the village were close to twenty, and to deal with it, they made the villagers that were alive dig a big hole before dumping the corpses into it all at once. The leader of the thieves was particularly nasty because he deliberately gathered the surviving villagers to watch as the dead were rudely dumped into the giant pit it seemed like he couldn't get enough of the expression the villagers made when they had to watch that scene. When he arrived in the village, Lambert stopped in his tracks and took in that scene. I see, a cruel one indeed. He said out loud as he appeared in the middle of the village, without drawing his sword from its sheath. At the time of his arrival, one of the thieves was lashing his whip at the half-naked villager who was trembling badly, at their wit's end. He he, hey you over there, you're moving like a turtle you know w you must be trying to anger me. Read GHTNAH. Shall I kill your daughter any XTHH? Lambert, who felt that the villager might not be able to endure another hit, directed his killing intent towards the thief and, as if he felt a chill running through his spine, the thief raised his head, only to spot Lambert and the girl who stood slightly away from him. Was her hell are ya? Another stranger has come to this village. Someone, come help me, the thief shouted. Splendid, feel free to gather all your comrades, it saves me the trouble of looking for those guys. H.H., -h, what or why? At that moment, Lambert had closed in on the thief. Eh, you waya? Startled, the thief randomly lashed at him with his whip. Lambert was unfazed with his action, though he dodged every single attack that the thief used by using peculiar footwork before he took a stance in front of the thief. And while from the thief's point of view the whip just passed through Lambert's after image as his body was moving fast enough that it left a blurry image of Lambert's body, in actuality, it was not the case Lambert had grasped every single movement of the whip that even the user himself couldn't do. Lambert knew though that he didn't need to dodge at all, but he did anyway because he wanted to show the overwhelming disparity in their power he wanted to show himself as a threat. W what the? And just like that, Lambert lightly tackled the thief. The thief didn't even have the chance to take a defensive posture before he passed out from the collision with Lambert's overwhelming mass. Furthermore, after being thrown to the ground by his shoulder, coupled with his own weight, impact, and his defenseless landing posture. It ended up with his arm being bent in an unnatural direction. Lambert didn't let up though because he immediately gripped the thief's shoulder and forced him to sit upright. How many members does your group have? 
excluding you. A.J. Unfortunately for Lambert, the thief couldn't speak properly since not only his arm was dislocated, so was his jaw. Here I thought you were going to take a defensive posture, and yet you guys are so brittle, huh? Lambert stood as he drew his great sword and beheaded the thief he then shifted his attention toward the incoming manna he felt from the five people approaching him, not bothering to sheath his great sword again. El Lachis. You monster bastard. Kill him. Ignoring the thief's screams, Lambert set his great sword using a lower stance, and made a beeline toward the thieves. Fas underscore 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 underscore. Orea, and raised it again, slicing up the thief from his crotch all the way till his head. The thief's body that was sliced clean in two was pushed back, splashing blood and entered in its wake. It was an instant death. And thus the thief succumbed, long before his face full of astonishment could change to fear. What? Looking at this scene, the other four thieves' faces were dyed in fear as they stood there unfortunately for them. Before the corpse of the first thief even fell to the ground, Lambert had already made a detour, circling by the side of the corpse and closed in on the other thieves. Lambert used his great sword to slash at the thieves three times, and three of the thieves were decapitated he intentionally left one alive. Panicked, screaming at the top of his lungs, the last thief alive from that group of five swung his wooden club that had stone attached to it. Yueyeyewa. Too slow W. Lambert wilded his great sword and severed both of his arms, stabbing the blade into the thief's stomach then he hoisted the thief's body, E.D. Impaler. Argeirg. From the place where Lambert stabbed his great sword into the thief's abdomen, some blood and viscera spurted on him. Aside from the five of you, how many remain now? Eight, it's eighteen. There's only eighteen of us left. The thief said as he tried to strike at the sides of Lambert's great sword with what was left from his arms. I see. Thanks a lot. With that said, Lambert swung down his great sword. The thief was nothing more than a lump of flesh now Lambert ignored that though and just pulled out his great sword by stepping on the corpse's abdomen with his foot. It will be troublesome if they are to escape I want to know their numbers first. Lambert stopped to think after he got the answer he wanted then, he ran around the village, slaughtering the thieves as he went keeping count inside his head as he then disposed of those thieves. You what the hell are why ye you? One of the thieves rushed at him, while screaming at the top of his lungs Lambert easily parried the thief's sword with his armor-covered arm, seized that thief's head, and slammed him as hard as possible to the ground. The thief's head got smashed, blood seeping from the hole that used to be his face. With this, ten people left I don't even need to draw my sword here both this guy and the one before for this village that couldn't even take care of these guys. Are they really safe? As he waved his arm to get rid of the blood stains, Lambert, who was always comparing the current era with his era, was really puzzled even as puzzled as he was. He still readied himself once again when he felt a few mana sources approaching him and he felt that there were more than ten of them, and though it might be just his imagination. He felt that half of them were weaker than the rest. Ho ho they bringing along hostages with them, huh? As he expected, the thieves appeared not next to their comrades, but with what was apparently defenseless women and children they were hostages. The hands of the hostages were tied with a rope, their mouths stuffed with cloth they were being pulled about by the noose around their necks. There were only three hostages here, each being held by a thief. The number of thieves left are ten people according to the information I was given these people might be all of them. Hiding deep behind the crowds were a big bulky man with a bald head, and a slender man with cunning eyes the big man's eyes were just like a glass sphere and there was no emotion within them he was currently holding on a goblet made of a human skull. Act 18 Bandits Gang? Chapter 8 Bandits Gang? Yes, that's as far as you gano, shall we have a little negotiation? 
The huge bald man's way of speaking to Lambert was very womanlike. Perhaps it's to lower Lambert's vigilance. Or perhaps it's normal for the guy in any case. It didn't change the conjecture in Lambert's mind that the man might be the bandit's leader. Why do I have to surrender for those guys? Lambert asked, voice cold even as the hostages were desperately gesturing to him with tears streaming down their faces. You can't fool me you know W you came to save these guys, read GHT don't worry, I won't be high-handed since I want to train you, personally. Hum. Hearing that, Lambert recalled the girl's words. Though some adventurers came to our village to check this situation since the contact from our village was suddenly cut off they were immediately caught you too. Please run before you got caught by them. And then he looked at the hostages. The three hostages looked like they were around 18 years old who only had some training under their belt. And, from the look of it, their capture was a recent thing since they weren't as thin as the villagers. Moreover, I have never said that I'm going to kill you. I just need you to cut one of your hands, then I'll release these three and let you off to O. The bald man said happily before he took a drink from the goblet made from skull in his hand. Just looking at his action creeped normal people out. It was as if he was sipping its brains out. From the look of the skull, it seemed like its inside were patched with clay so it would prevent any liquid from spilling out in order to make it usable as a goblet furthermore. The skull's exterior itself seemed to be painted with something. E.D. Wright. I'm so done with life now. The bandit's leader, who noticed that Lambert was paying attention to the goblet in his hand, let his lips form a mockery of a smile with his perpetually emotionless face. He then openly licked the inside of the goblet with his purple tongue. Oh my, worrying about this this is, you see, a goblet that is made from the skull of the young woman of this village yes but of course. It's not me who makes it want to know who makes it you want to. Read GHTY. I'll tell you the maker was. Her own faith are very interesting. Read GHT. Hearing their boss's words, they just laughed merrily, as if everything's normal and peaceful. Hey, if you're too scared to cut your hand, shall I cut it for you? Look he's scared even though he has such a big body hey. Cut your hand already moreover where's your gratitude? Boss is already being benevolent and letting you off with one of your hands. You know if boss goes all out. You're out of luck, man. You'll feel what a hell on earth means. Unfortunately for you, you've killed too many of our comrades, so don't think that we're going to let you off scot-free without any punishment. Well, whether you're safe afterward or not or trivial, you should have known that we've our backing right. The foolish one here is yourself, you know, W. The bandit's lackeys were mocking Lambert earnestly trying to get into his head however, Lambert himself didn't really pay attention to their threat. Should I bait more information from them? No, there's no need for that I just need to leave one of them alive to tell me the information that I needed. After confirming each and every single one of the leftover bandits' face, Lambert drew his sword. Seeing his action, the bandits thought that Lambert would cut his own hand however, they were wrong because, in the first place, he didn't come to this village to save some adventurers who could fend for themselves. But from the bandit's perspective, Lambert's sole reason to visit this village was to save the adventurers' lives who got caught some days ago. That's why they thought and expected that as long as they brought along their hostages when they confront him, Lambert would do as they bid. Even for my current self, there's still no no way I can just abandon the younglings who will become Rijo's kingdom's future so. If severing my own right hand is the only choice, then I will not hesitate. But you see while your suggestion is extremely interesting unfortunately for you, I suddenly recalled something really interesting, so. At this point, he let his killing intent filled miasma loose. My bad, I refuse honestly. I never even consider the option of surrendering to you bastards after all. The bandit's body, who was exposed to Lambert's powerful miasma, was paralyzed by fear and, in that moment, Lambert had already decapitated the heads of two bandits who were standing in between the hostages with just one swing of his sword. Ha! W what in the world just happened? The rest of the bandits that are still alive have yet to understand the situation thus, they could only cower in fear their leader, however, was different than them while his lackeys were cowering. 
His expression made a complete change. He looked excited. You guys show him hell. The leader barked as he crushed the skull goblet in his hand, excitement coursing through his body. You bastard, you aren't worried about this guy's H.U.H. One of the bandits abandoned his fear, he shouted in front of Lambert, a hostage in his hand, but before he managed to finish his line, his body was already split in half. Kill that Gooey. Our opponent is alone. Kill him. Soon, another four popped up like red fruits because none of the bandits could see through Lambert's true abilities basically making them a sitting duck in front of him they had tried dodging they had even tried to save their own asses but unfortunately for them it was all a futile effort hence why one by one the bandits in that place eventually died an extremely cruel death under lambert's attack without even being able to swing their sword properly in retaliation i'm possibly are you a monster the last one left was the leader after taking a glance at the crushed skull goblet, Lambert glared at the leader. Well then, it seems there's a whole lot of things I need to ask from you since I don't want the villagers to see such foul things that will happen to you shall we change place to one of the vacant houses. Why are you going to torture me can't you see that I am just a weak human? The leader kneeled down right there as he secretly took the axe of his subordinate. He stared back at Lambert with bloodshot eyes. You are you under the assumption that you are the most cruel fellow in the world. W what in the hell are you? I know many others good for nothing fellows even crueler than you are torture maniac Odin who was called the vampire of Belfi's the plunderer king of Madaraka kingdom, Helnico's humanity's worst alchemist, Goyref of Albris kingdom and then the greatest sinner to become the sorcerer of our Rijo's kingdom's age Demillion if you saw even just one of their evil deeds, a young hatchling like you might not even dare to sleep again, ever. W who the hell are those guys? And what the hell you're talking about? What are you talking about? They're the fellas who died in my hand a long time ago. Lambert dropped his sword to the ground as he spoke to the bandit leader. You creep I don't even know what in the hell you are talking about. The leader shouted, rushing toward Lambert however, he easily dodged the axe swung by the bandit leader then, he knocked off the bandit leader's shoulder with his arm that looks like a lump of iron due to his armor. The bandit leader's shoulder joint were smashed much too easily. Ah -hey -hey -ah. He screamed loudly, eyes tearing up not only that, he was also drooling from his mouth that was wide open due to how much pain he was suffering right now Lambert was merciless though as he quickly destroyed the bandit leader's other shoulder joint and both of his knees. How do you feel when you suddenly can't use both of your hands and feet from this point on? I'll keep you alive just to inflict even more pain to you but I'm not a demon I do not have a tasteless hobby like Odin or Goyref you can rejoice just in that regard alone since I'm gonna kill you when I'm done with you. Done speaking, Lambert then seized the foot of the leader, whose kneecaps has been destroyed by him, and dragged him away to a separated place. By this point, the leader, who was in pain, dreaded Lambert so much that he leaked fluid from every part of his body including his mouth where the foul smell of vomit could be smelled from. Shave me, shave me, please shave me. The leader pleaded to the nearby hostages. His figure was exactly like an abused puppy. Even the people, who used to be his hostages, were looking at the leader with a look of pity in their eyes because, looking at the man who was dragged along on the dirt, leaving behind traces of vomit, excretion, and mud made them feel that that man and the man who did such a cruel thing to the villagers without even batting his eyes was not the same person. In fact, for some reason, even the original image of the bandit leader in the prime of his cruelty had shrunk to a pitiful height in their mind. But even those hostages were powerless since their hands were tied and their mouth was stuffed with cloth so they could only watch as the bandit leader was dragged further and further away from that area. Finally, Lambert knocked on the door of a house and opened it. Yup, this place seems to be vacated. Aya. Ah, yeah. 
The leader, who was still trembling horribly, looked desperately at the hostages, as if pleading them to save him but then the door swung closed with a bam and that plea was dashed to the ground. That was the last time the hostages ever saw the bandit's leader anymore. Act 19 Bandit's Gang? Chapter 9 Bandit's Gang? Thank you very much we can't thank you enough for your help. At this time, Lambert was surrounded by the villagers in the middle of the plaza at the helm was an elderly whose hair had already turned gray, the village chief and, he was currently expressing his gratitude to Lambert with the other villagers they had basically prostrated themselves before Lambert at this point. Unfortunately for you guys this isn't the end. Naitsama what do you mean? When Lambert separated the bandit's leader away from the villagers, Lambert had tortured him and managed to extract information about the real mastermind behind it all it seemed that the bandit's leader attacked once he received a certain information that said, Earl Aubach, the lord of this region, wouldn't dispatch his private army even if this village is attacked? As it was, Lambert was completely unaware of the current information-gathering method. As such he couldn't get further information details from the bandit leader since he died before he could try however, there was no mistake in the information he had got Earl Aubach had intentionally let those bandits run rampant in his territory. And, from asking around with the villagers, he gained the gist of the situation it seemed that after his death, there were great changes in Rijo's kingdom compared to what he knew such as the limitation placed on the amount of tax that could be collected from the citizens by the lords of each area just like what he'd heard from Aurelia a few times. Before. When I unite the western continent, I'll revise the national laws to reduce the number of people suffering as much as possible and since a long time ago, I have spent every single night putting together the reformation idea into a cohesive one booty want to hear your opinion regarding the plan I have been making? You're being too hasty, your majesty the archduke is going to catch a wind about this plan of yours if it's in such a plain view. Don't worry about it there are only a few people who are allowed to enter this place my mother my caretaker, Jiny that old counselor of mine, Sage Carlglyph and you know one else can enter this place except the people who have my trust? At that time, Lambert had witnessed the limited the amount of taxes a lord could impose in their areas amongst all the other improvement plans that Aurelia had shown to him. And hearing that term again from the villagers, realizing that Aurelia's plans had been accomplished, left Lambert with mixed feelings. Then again, it looked like many people had found a loophole in that system and one of them was Earl Aubach through villagers' lack of knowledge about complicated matters such as taxes and national law. He collected many illegal taxes and confused the naive villagers. And the travelers who passed through the village happened to notice that abnormality and told the villagers the truth then the travelers suggested to the villagers that they should refuse to pay the amount of tax the Lord demanded since it didn't comply with the national law once the villagers did what the travelers suggested. They found out that it was far easier for them to pay the taxes even for someone who had nothing. But then, the bandits came and raided their village. In short, Lambert speculated that Earl Aubach was using this village as an example for the other villages so they wouldn't get any ideas or raise questions about his decision to make them meekly accept what the Earl had decided especially in regard to the amount of tax. This sort of corruption might not be limited to just Earl Aubach's territory, but also to the other territories after all. As long as one noticed the loophole, it would immediately spread to other areas in the blink of an eye. Thus began the exploitation of the loophole the lord of an area would threaten the citizens by forsaking his duties, leaving the commoners at the mercy of fate when they were attacked by the bandit gangs like this village. What an extremely childish scoundrel we got here but fret not I shall do something about this matter after all. I can't just stand by and let those insects that haunt this kingdom freely fatten themselves with the blood and tears of the citizens you lot do not need to worry about this matter anymore. E.H. The villagers didn't understand what Lambert was trying to say however, despite that, they still felt reassured that nothing untoward would happen after all. They had witnessed Lambert's skills and his single-handed action that decimated the entire bandit group which had been terrorizing their village knowing that. 
They had no need to worry about him nor could they bring themselves to ask more from him. Suddenly, a group of three stepped out. They were the three adventurers who were captured days ago and became the bandits' hostages against Lambert, and while they looked pale a while ago, they seemed to be doing better right now. However, when Lambert's eyes fell on one of the adventurers, the woman who stood in front of the other two, he was extremely surprised with the woman's appearance. You saved us there if you're okay with Idas there's something that we can help you with after all. Even though we came to look at the village on our benefactor's behest, we ended up being captured by those bandits and unable to do anything you seem like you're one of the famous fighters. So may I have the honor to be introduced to you. The strong will that dwelled in her blue eyes, her less than shoulder length elegant golden hair, a high nose bridge paired with long eyelashes. Despite the fact that her face and clothes were soiled and a tad disorderly due to those bandits, it couldn't even put a scratch on her overflowing beauty. Your Majesty. Yes, her appearance bore great resemblance with Lambert's former master, Aurelia. At this moment, Lambert completely forgot about his resentment towards Aurelia. He instinctively kneeled before the woman. He was extremely shocked by what he perceived to be their sudden reunion, so... He fell back to the old custom, keeping his head bowed down in front of the woman. Please forgive my impoliteness, I never expected your majesty to be in why did you come to this village? Lambert finally regained his composure. Yes, firstly, the woman's age was different from Aurelia the woman in front of Lambert was at least ten years younger than the Aurelia in his memories. Aurelia should be older than twenty-six years old but the woman before him was at most an eighteen-years-old girl. And when Lambert glanced at the woman's expression, he saw that she was completely shocked by his behavior. Looking even younger compared to her formal appearance she displayed a while ago when she was thanking him. The awkward silence between the two of them that spread at the moment of his outburst persisted for a while. Louis, do you have any idea about your household? Two don't want to be involved with the trouble Fiona's house will bring. Eki want to say that I'm glad that you saved me though. The two people behind Aurelia look alike were agape. Jaw dropped to the ground. It seems that the woman's name is Fiona. Lambert was relieved since their name was different still. His uneasiness remained since they looked extremely similar in appearance almost mirror-like however. Upon a closer look, he saw that Fiona had a mole under her eyes unlike Aurelia. Why you re mistaken? I think no. Wait, I am really unrelated to someone with such skill though I am not sure if we've met somewhere before in my childhood someone as powerful as him should become really famous by now you um. May you take off your helmet for a moment. At that Lambert unintentionally pressed his helmet as if to protect it. And oh I mean, it seems I mistook you with my acquaintance please don't mind my previous action. Two's that so. Fiona looked like she wanted to ask something however, she held back from pursuing the line of questioning even further, perhaps sensing something from Lambert. By the way, since you guys came from the city may I ask for your help to guide me to the city? Of course, our base of operation is the area around Ainsas City if you're okay with us, we will be glad to become your guide. Is that where Earl Aubach lives? Eh, yes, but two, do you have some sort of business with the Earl? No, I do not anyway. Thank you very much for your willingness to become my guide to Lane Sass. Lambert had no intention to share with Fiona and others his conjectures, since he didn't want to involve her in this kind of situation. He was puzzled about something she'd said though he had never heard of a city named Ain Sass before nevertheless. He didn't ask about it, and just tagged along with them for now. Act 110 First Class Adventurer Cradle Chapter 10 First Class Adventurer Cradle Led by the three adventurers, Lambert left the village being led back to the adventurer's base of operation, Ainsaz City. According to what they told him, this area was governed by Earl Albach and he practically lived in Ainsaz City. The city was built in a circular way to prevent raids from the outside following the design from the remnant of the warring era called Circular Lined-Up Building. However, while the city prospered during the ruling of the first generation of Aubach House, 
The public order deteriorated after the current Earl took over the governing office of the city under his rule. Many suspicious-looking guys loitered around the city, inciting an undercurrent of tension in the city. Who H.M.? I see now it seems that the difference in the times were beyond my imagination. With his hand touching the chin of his helmet, Lambert muttered, mulling over the current era. The trio of adventurers were rather wary when they saw him like that furthermore. They were also rather dubious about Lambert's identity after all. The conspicuous old-styled armor he wore suggested that he moved under the royal family's authority, however, his disinterest when he heard Ainsa's city name, which was one of the more important cities in the kingdom of Rijos, dissuaded that speculation nevertheless. Even though the three knew that it must be done, they hesitated Lambert's bizarre aura prevented them from asking Lambert anything about his identity. You am may I ask your name, Naitsama? Finally, Fiona, the leader of the trio, braced herself she knew that she had to ask so, after being egged on by Lily and Lloyd who were behind her, she did. Despite being the one with the most outstanding skills and mental fortitude, she wasn't the type of person who could refuse a request that's why among the three. She was always the one who was entrusted with important matters she knew how to keep her distance to matters that didn't concern her or her group that, and her strong personality was what made her a leader. My name. Lambert was troubled when he heard the question honestly. He was not sure that the royal family wouldn't send their sweeper to assassinate him once they knew that he was alive so, he worried. And even if Lambert's feelings towards Aurelia were complicated, he had never thought of assassinating her and turning this kingdom upside down not even when his former liege had backstabbed him and ordered his death. Lambert's one and only wish was to look around the kingdom he didn't want to cause too much trouble nor did he want to be chased around by assassins and while he wanted to know how Aurelia was doing, he still couldn't bring himself to do so. After all, despite the fact that the decision she made was heartless and left no room for compromise, he couldn't exactly say that Aurelia had erred when she decided upon his assassination about that point, Lambert was sure. Fiona, who saw Lambert drowning in his own world, presumed that she had just brought him displeasure. Ace, I thought, he does have a reason for not revealing his identity perhaps, I shouldn't have asked his name. Fiona thought as she shook her head. My name is... And no. I don't mind even if Naitsama doesn't tell us your name. Fiona tried to retract her question in haste. At the same time Lambert was about to give her his alias for a while after that, an awkward silence enveloped the air around them. Aram. The truth is I have a question before I introduce my name. There should have been a big war once before. It's a long war that united the entire western continent. But how many years have passed since the end of that war? Once she heard Lambert's question, Fiona was dumbfounded she turned to look at her companions, Lily and Lloyd, and found that both of them were looking as dumbfounded as her. However, their reaction was only natural after all. The Unification War of the Eight Kingdoms was a story that was so famous to the point that even some random children knew about it thus. When Lambert, who they mistook for a royal agent, asked about the current year, they were simply flabbergasted. You've never heard about it or did you simply have no idea about that war? Lambert continued to question them yet, to this threesome, the question he asked about was too incomprehensible. T. The war ended 230 years ago. A still bewildered Fiona, haltingly replied. Um, pardon. To mean the unification war of the eight kingdoms. T. 230 you not lying, right? Why yes it should have been that long. Now it was Lambert's turn to be extremely shocked, to the point of falling on his knees when he heard the answer to his question 230 years the time gap from his death till he was brought back to life as an undead was just too long. But he didn't think that they were lying to him all along, there were indeed some hints that indicated the long passage of time but, even though he felt discomfort every single time he noticed those hints. Lambert chose to ignore it. He didn't want to acknowledge it neither the change of the terrain nor the name change of the location furthermore, 
He didn't want to think of the realization of the dreamlike revolutionary system that felt like it was only a yesterday's dream for him. But he finally understood the reason why no one noticed that the armor Lambert was wearing was the Regenix or Gazira armor? Or normally known as Organ, although he felt lucky that no one had realized his identity based on his armor, there was still a slight dissatisfaction at the fact that no one knew of the exclusive armor of the four demon generals. Therefore, it really should be obvious that they had no idea about the armor either especially since his armor had been reduced to a mere relic of the past so, his brainstorming for a plan to hide the true nature of his armor was rendered useless all his worries had ended up for naught. Besides that, the truth that left the biggest impact to Lambert's psyche was the fact that Aurelia had long since passed away ever since he got resurrected as an undead, he had wanted to at least take a glance at her gallant figure, as the king of the western continent even if he could only do so from afar but she's already long dead. And now he's unsure whether to curse her on the other side due to the grief he was still tormented by, or to give her his blessing and let go of his past grudge. But Lambert had an unshakable belief that his soul wouldn't be freed from his current body unless he let go of all lingering attachments he had to the living because from the very beginning, that was the reason why Lambert kept swinging his sword as one of the four demon generals however. He never expected that too many years had passed by since his death. To think that his revival happened after two hundred years had passed was beyond his estimate. And no white hat must be a lie but is there something they can gain by lying to me but that means why your majesty is no longer in this world. W.W. What should I do now? The sight of a lamenting Lambert made Fiona extremely flustered. She didn't know what to do. Is Hein shock. Isn't he a rather dangerous person I mean? Everything about him is a mystery he did save our life. But still. He must be a famous swordsman, I'm sure of it or so he should be but still. Lily and Lloyd feared Lambert's unstable mental condition as they looked at the disconnected conversation he had with Fiona. Act 111 First Class Adventurer Cradle Chapter 11 First Class Adventurer Cradle Didio you have money with you, Naitsama. Ah, uh, due to a certain circumstances, I didn't carry any with me now. Aside from the initial confusion and disconnect, Fiona and Lambert easily got along with each other. Despite Fiona's apparent ease with Lambert, both Lloyd and Lily kept their distance from him, never talking unless necessary their unwillingness to participate. Besides leaving them as the only conversants, both Fiona and Lambert still enjoyed the conversation between them. And the reason for their geniality with each other was because of Lambert's interest in Fiona's resemblance with his former liege, while the latter's reason was because of her blatant curiosity over Lambert's full-plate armor. Then, you should at least take the token of gratitude the villagers have prepared for you with the meager amount of money I possess. I fear I can't give you an appropriate reward. Fiona said, rummaging into her tool bag, trying to find something to offer Lambert however. Before she could take out anything from the bag, Lambert stopped her. I don't mind it's not like I saved the village for that reward in the first place. The village chief did indeed offer some rewards to Lambert for subjugating the bandits and saving them, but Lambert had refused to accept it. After all, he felt that the citizens had paid him back by paying their taxes in the first place protecting the peace of the kingdom of Rijos and its citizens was his sworn duty one that had already deeply ingrained itself to his bones. And while the kingdom didn't pay him any salary now, this matter was simply a logic that had already been etched deep within Lambert's consciousness. That being said, right now, the most urgent thing he needed to do was to look for a way to earn some traveling expenses for himself and it was obvious to him that those villagers needed the reward money more than Lambert did they still needed to rebuild their village after all moreover, Earl Albach, the mastermind behind this scheme, was still alive. Thus, the chance that another misfortune might befall the village again still loomed furthermore, the bandit's leader had said that there were a few other villages with similar situations as this one. Lambert's job was far from over. 
And there's another reason why he stopped Fiona from giving him a reward. The current Lambert didn't really need money he's an undead after all he felt neither fatigue nor hunger thus. Money wasn't really all that important to him. How are you going to enter Ainsaz without money, Naitsima? I'll manage it somehow I can sleep anywhere and hunt for my meal. That s no matter how big Ainsaz is, many dangerous people wander at night. And what are you going to do with your luggage? I mean look, even if you hunt for your meal, the only way to eat is by grilling them. It is still a lot better than the time when I was on the expedition far better than eating in the Valley of Death, or Cold Town, or being attacked by the likes of bandits, etc., etc. Ah ha ha I see now. Though at times Fiona couldn't make sense of Lambert's remarks, she'd still manage to somehow throw in an appropriate response. But you'll be troubled in one way or another without money and since you're my benefactor, I'll be troubled. That's it. Since you will not receive any reward from me, how about I introduce you to some job? A job. Yes, we are part of the Adventurers Guild after all and the recent partnership between companies and guilds guarantees an easier opportunity to find a job and since Naitsama is quite powerful. I think you can easily rake in some money after working for a while it shouldn't take that long for a simple registration of your name as long as you have my recommendation. Adventurers Guild did its business in the form of providing manpower, or in other words, adventurers, to people who needed a job to be done the guild then would take a small amount of the rewards as a mediator fees for introducing the adventurer to the job. A big guild had close to 100 adventurers registered due to its sheer size. The guild was structured into headquarters and branches, but the guild that Fiona and her companions belonged to, Spirit's Dusk, was just a small-time guild, with only 10 members registered in it, including Fiona and her pair of companions. Ui Fiona that's. Lloyd, who heard their conversation, decided to cut in after all, though Lambert had suppressed his undead miasma. His uncommon aura still surrounded Lambert's figure and this, if one were to be blunt, made him an eerie person to one's sense. But Nightsima seems to be poorly informed about this area and it's slightly worrying to part with him without at least doing this much. While he was not interested in Fiona and Lloyd's quarrel, hearing Fiona's words slightly stirred Lambert's feeling he had no idea about the current situation in the kingdom of Rejo's but he might get a rough grasp of it once he worked as a proper citizen. Ed, I want to add it was only logical to this paragraph so so much, but I've to hold my hand. And most of all this man doesn't look like someone who is used to doing adventurer jobs. I know what you mean, but I'll be the one who is responsible for him. It'll be too pitiful to let him go in his current penniless condition. Hey, saying something like that is E.H. Lambert had made his decision. In the first place, Lambert's objectives weren't that grand. All he wanted to do was to watch over the result of his liege's work in this United Kingdom and perhaps investigate Earl Aubach's actions along the way. But the current him was really lacking in terms of information, that's why, at the very least, he wanted to understand some basic information before he started the investigation on Earl Aubach. Let's go to our guild, that spirits dusk once we enter the city but let me ask one question first what might it be um can you explain to me the structure of the adventure guild why you re starting from that at this most recent evidence of lambert's lack of knowledge deep within her fiona doubted lambert's presumed identity but she decided to keep her suspicions to herself lloyd however was clearly displeased with Lambert's question. Lambert's question was only natural since there was no such thing as adventurer association during the time he was still alive when he was still alive. Almost all the people with some degree of combat abilities were employed by nobilities or royalties somewhere, and, even the wanderers, who didn't wish to stay in one place for too long, grouped together and formed mercenary groups. At that time, Adventurers were minorities they were treated like an outcast amongst other outcasts in fact. The majority of adventurers of Lambert's era were weirdos who couldn't work together in a group and only had so many skills furthermore, since they had always wandered around the savage land, 
out of 100 people. Less than 10% who called themselves adventurers could survive more than one year. As such, it was only normal that Lambert simply couldn't imagine that they had become part of the majority in this era, with various guilds with different names being set up in just one city. Adventurer Guild is a place where adventurers gather together for information and jobs. Each guild has its own rules, policies, and specializations. Spirits Dusk specializes in subjugating monsters or dangerous animals that will harm the villages and after the recent contract with the company, we branched out to to gather monster materials such as meat, bone, or skin inside of the dungeon. Who I see now. The knowledge about dangerous places had raised the survival rate of the adventurers and because of their surplus war potential, they had the undivided attention of the nobility. Lambert laughed wholeheartedly as he could finally guess the rough situation of the Kingdom of Rejos after the Unification War from hearing Fiona's story, and even though he was laughing, his laughter evoked an eerie feeling since it echoed inside his armor. Though there are six guilds in the city of Ain our Spirit's Dusk is a small one, no, that makes us more flexible. The guild master is also kind-hearted or rather, too kind of a person. Thus the procedure of your registration won't take a long time. We also get all kinds of easy job from our neighbors. Fiona tried to tell him the advantages of joining her guild but ended up telling him its glaring flaw. But for Lambert, whose original intention was to gather more information, the small-sized guild and its flexibilities were a huge boon for him. Act 1 12 First Class Adventurer Cradle Chapter 12 First Class Adventurer Cradle Lambert and the others soon arrived at Ainsass. From the outside, people could already see two or three-story buildings that were built next to one another, and the street that was brimming with life. It was a scenery you could find in any city the orange roof and white plastered wall could be seen anywhere you looked in the city as if the entire city was one giant castle. As Lambert walked, inadvertently, he struck the stone paved road with his metal sole. T this is Ainsass city it's a well-built city. Lambert's voice, as he spoke, was laced with excitement and, as he walked, he unconsciously increased his pace. Our kingdom has become a really splendid one. Her majesty would be surely crying in happiness once she sees this scenery. Well, this city is ranked as the first, or second best city in the kingdom of Rejos after all. Fiona and the others finally managed to catch up to Lambert who was walking ahead so quickly a law and excited child especially when he stopped at every chance, saying, O-H, or, this is with an excited voice. Meanwhile, separated from quite a distance from Lambert, Fiona was whispering to Lily with a wry smile on her face. At first I thought that Nightsima was a scary person, but he has a surprisingly cute side to him. He is cute. Lily asked as she looked at the figure of the literally walking full plate armor that was making loud crunching sounds with every step he took from her perspective. She just felt that it was weird for him to be able to walk that easily while wearing such heavy full-blade armor he didn't even look to be losing his stamina, making it even weirder. Zizium, what should I call that one? As he looked at the top of the five-floor building, Lambert asked Lloyd, who was by now out of breath following him. Not the knight, I mean the girl who looks similar to her high with that Fiona. Seriously you don't even know about Knight Ainsaz the origin of this city's name anyway, since your appearance is already too conspicuous. Please stop overreacting over the small things. It's rather embarrassing to us, you know. At that, Lambert turned around to look at Lloyd. Certainly, though he still lacked a complete idea about the current era, his overly excited behavior was too conspicuous, and his current get-up didn't help matters. If his action left him with no choice but to unfasten his armor, he might be subjugated as a monster and it wouldn't help with his goal, which was a round trip around the present kingdom of Rejos so originally, while he couldn't help with the fact that he would most certainly gather attention when he entered the city, to gather information. He had vowed to not gather too much unwarranted attention. 
It was something that he knew he needed to avoid Yeath ended up doing it. Lambert, one of the four demon generals of the kingdom of Regios, had ended up making such a mistake and, to make matters worse, he was an undead. For a while, Lambert was silent as he was chastising himself for making such a rudimentary mistake in his excitement but to Lloyd, he looked like he had a grudge after being reprimanded like that then again. There was no other room for other interpretation in Lambert's current get-up of being covered in full-plate armor. H and no. I mean you don't have to force yourself if you didn't want to. It's just a reminder anyway. Understood I'll pay more attention to the manner I behave. Lambert said as he approached Lloyd with a calm and composed pace. hi I. However, Lloyd ended up stretching out his arms with eyes tightly shut when Lambert approached him in the end though. His hysteria proved to be unfounded as when he opened his eyes a while later, he found out that Lambert had passed by his side as if nothing had happened. Is he not angry, hey? Lloyd asked Lily, a desperate tone coloring his voice Lily, being soft at heart, sighed before she went to chase after Lambert. After Fiona managed to persuade Lambert to calm himself, they continued on toward the guild and, even though Lambert had been very talkative, midway to the guild, he fell silent before they had even realized it. For some reason, they felt the aura around Lambert became heavy. Did Wettis please him? Isn't this your fault, Lloyd? Lily and Lloyd bickered in low voices. Please stop scaring me like that. My condolence you'll meet the same fate as those thieves. He's going to screw you up with that giant sword if that comes to happen. I'll make sure to pour some ale on your grave. Lily offered her condolences as she clapped her hands. Stop it already. It doesn't sound like a joke you know. Hey Fiona I really can't figure out that person's mood you know let's not. I'm sorry, Nightsima if you want to stroll around the town. I'll become your guide later after I bring you to meet our guild master. I tease not like I wanted to stroll around the city or something but well, I guess I'm gonna trouble you for that later. After Fiona offered her help to guide him around the city later, the solemn atmosphere around Lambert dissipated immediately. Lloyd who saw that whispered, the heck, so you knew all along. We're about to get there it's over there, the tallest two-floor building with the signboard, Dusk of Spirit? That one with spirits and emiscope on its roof. Fiona theaterically raised her voice at the end of her words, pointing at the building with spirits like ornament affixed atop the building's roof. I see that building how there's a splendor in its humble appearance. Though it was the smallest guild within Ain Sa's city, its building was still quite a splendid one, and it was also properly managed, or so Fiona said. Ah, no you re mistaken what I mean is our spirit's dusk? Guild is on the second floor of that building the first floor Isis by the building owner for his fairy stove. A bar and we're just renting the second floor for our guild we um, have yet to be able to buy our own building you know. The price of real estate in this city is still far beyond our reach. Ah, I see now. Act 113 First Class Adventurer Cradle? Chapter 13 First Class Adventurer Cradle When they were about to arrive at the Spirit's Dusk S. Guild Building, Fiona suddenly stopped walking Lambert also halted, looking at the direction where Fiona's line of sight lay. A silver-haired man was standing in front of the building he was a gaudy man who was wearing a white robe embroidered with a splendid golden dragon pattern on it. I won't beat around the bush here and get straight to the point I am giving you a fair warning. You had better get them to move out from the second floor of this building this is certainly not a threat. That gaudy man was talking to a middle-aged woman, who was wearing an apron over her neat dress Lambert assumed she was the proprietor of Fairy's Furnace. Oops, have you just returned, my Fiona? As soon as the gaudy man saw Fiona and the others, his expression warped in spite of his expression. He spoke to Fiona with a softer tone Lambert didn't understand what was going on, so he glanced at the trio's expression to discern it as soon as he saw Fiona, Lily, and Lloyd's expressions, he understood the situation somewhat. I don't remember ever having that good a relationship with you. 
His name is Cradle Member of the Biggest Guild of Ainsaz, the Demon Gold's Dragon. Amongst the most hated guys list in our guild, that Cradle is the most annoying one to put it simply, he's a nasty stalker. Lloyd said, almost cursing Cradle. Who are you calling a disgusting stalker? I am just trying to invite Fiona Du to her talents. You've got quite a nasty habit of gossiping about someone else's matters, huh? The silver-haired man, Cradle, walked briskly towards Lambert and the others. Moreover, I don't have so much free time to care that much about a foolish woman your misunderstanding here really irked me, you know. Ah? In that case, what's you and your group's goals in doing this sort of thing? While they were confronting one another, Lambert was observing Cradle and Lloyd from the side. I see you're harassing us cause you got rejected by her ho oh, what a petty man. Cradle glared at Lloyd with a vexed expression before a creepy smile formed on his lips. Ha 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 well 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 I'm just giving you a piece of advice you know even a small fry guild like yours should have heard the rumor about me having a connection with the dark guild, Ghost's Passage, right that's why destroying a rundown bar like this one is just a simple matter for me. As soon as he finished speaking, Cradle suddenly kicked the wall of the building, creating a loud thud that resounded loud and clear whilst leaving a dented wall on the spot that was kicked seeing that. The middle-aged woman who was quarreling with Cradle, until just a while ago, raised a short scream. Please stop this already. Why are you? Look, my foot just slipped, you see, there's no reason to blame me for that. Right, this thin wall is the one at fault after all. He shrugged his shoulders, flashing an evil grin in front of them as he did so. You bastard. Lloyd was about to rush in hand already at the handle of his sword, but Fiona held him back. Lloyd, I'm more than willing to fight if that is what you want. Whoops. Even though I just came to give you a kind reminder, how did it suddenly turn into a fight you really are the worst? Why, you bastard, you are the one who started this. We're with the guard, you people. Explain. Just what's happening here. A man holding a spear came towards them, while shouting in a loud voice it seems that some passerby, who saw Cradle pressuring his opponent, had gone and reported this matter to the patrolling guards however, the guards' face turned pale as soon as they saw Cradle's face. Just right. I needed you look, guards in. These people were pointing their weapons at me, read GHT. A-H-Y-Ys? Different from before, this time the guard used honorifics when he spoke to Cradle anyway. While it's unquestionable that Lloyd's hand was still gripping the hilt of his sword, he had yet to actually draw his sword from its scabbard he had regained his calm when Fiona interrupted him from drawing his sword after all. However, the guard ignored that and just agreed with Cradle meanwhile. Cradle smirked when he got his reply then he leaped towards them passing by Fiona and used his sheathed sword to land a hit on Lloyd's face. GFU A few of Lloyd's teeth broke loose and blood spurted out from his mouth due to the hit his body was also sent flying before he fell to the ground, rolling a few meters away. What the? Lily hurriedly rushed over to Lloyd, helping him to stand up. It's just self-defense since that guy was about to draw his sword to hurt me besides. Even though he was about to draw his sword to attack me, I just hit him with my sheathed sword am I not kind enough already? But Cradle attacked Lloyd even after Fiona had stopped Lloyd from drawing his sword Lloyd himself had never attacked. Cradle's reasoning was a blatant lie yet the guard just stood there in his spot with a vexed expression. You're not going to do anything despite what you saw just now. When Lambert asked the guards, they lowered their spear while shaking their head lightly. You really don't understand anything about us, how huh? about our, Demon Gold's dragon, position in the city? Cradle said as he made a fool of Lambert. You lunatic bastard. Fiona was glaring at Cradle. Quite cruel of you, to falsely accuse me like that I just didn't want to resort to violence to deal with you after all. Violence is not the be-all and end-all you know I prefer to end things peacefully I mean, 
You guys were the ones who started all this and, though I wanted to end this peacefully. That fool over there almost pointed his sword at me won't it make me look weaker than him if I didn't at least retaliate besides, with a guild as weak as yours, the one at fault for pointing their weapons at me is you yourself you should know that already, don't you moreover, I will lose my pride if I let something of that level be. Why you bastard? Lloyd shouted at Cradle, blood still dripping out from his lips Cradle himself was just looking at Lloyd with a scornful look in his eyes. A loser dog like you should just roll aside how unsightly well. That might include the entirety of your weak guild moreover. You don't even deserve to have pride I mean. You're just a weakling who can't even dodge an attack that came from the front if I was in your position. I would die from embarrassment alone. The hell are you talking about? We're the ones who were creating problems with you. You're just being a jerk because you were rejected by Fiona. Ha, I'm just being kind to her. As one of the kind members from Demon Gold's Dragon? S. Guild, inviting her to join us instead of letting her stay here is a great thing. And what do you mean by rejected? Aren't you ashamed of talking big without knowing anything? Cradle spoke with a condescending demeanor, keeping his extremely annoying attitude from the beginning until the end. Though Lambert himself knew from the very beginning of his observation of the guy that Cradle wasn't an exemplary human being, he came to deeply understand that he was in fact someone that couldn't be reasoned with his rotten nature was at a level that even Lambert, who had fought in the Eight Kingdom Unification War and had met with various rotten people, rarely met someone like Cradle. That's why, as long as you withdraw your previous statement and let Fiona move to my guild, I will spare the guild from being destroyed by the dark guild I mean. It just felt wrong to have guilds destroying each other, you know so. What do you think don't you think that I'm kind enough already? It's you bastard who instigated all of this. On what basis are you saying that really? You're getting on my nerves on top of being weak. You also turn out to be an idiot with a nasty personality. You really are beyond saving. Don't tell me that everyone in your guild is similar to you. I understand I'll move to your guild so stop this farce already. Fiona's words put a stop to Lloyd and Cradle's quarrel. Fiona. Don. T. This guy won't be satisfied with just that you know. Do you even understand what you are doing right now? There'll be no end of trouble if I reject his invitation. This kind of harassment will continue in the future if I reject him this time too. That's enough you sure are slow in making that decision if only you had agreed from the beginning. That guy over there wouldn't have had to lose his teeth you know I mean. He keeps blabbering nonsense that makes me embarrassed after all well. Whatever I guess that make use even, I'm a nice guy after all. While all this was happening, Lambert was contemplating on what he should do in this situation cradle was clearly the one in the wrong. But one wrong move, and this situation might have turned for the worse. Moreover, the guard, whose job was to protect the public order, was clearly turning a blind eye to Cradle's brutish ways besides, if he had to kill Cradle, he preferred to do it when he was alone with no witnesses after all, killing Cradle in this place would only create more trouble for Fiona and her guild. What a miserable fellow blaming others just because you failed to catch a woman's attention then you turn to harassing her friends now look, you're shaming yourself. Ha! Huh. So, the answer he arrived at to break through this situation was a frontal provocation from observing the previous exchanges, he had grasped Cradle's personality Cradle was someone with a high pride so, as long as he attacked his pride, Lambert thought, he might be able to prevent Cradle from harassing Fiona and her guild from now on. Act 114 First Class Adventurer Cradle? Chapter 14 First Class Adventurer Cradle? Hey! Just now what were you saying I didn't hear it clearly I hate small fries who are all bark you see seeing such people always makes me want to kill them. Cradle glared at Lambert, eyes glinting dangerously as he spoke. He was trying to threaten Lambert, and considering the mere implication of, you can't run after picking fight with those weaker than you, made him attack Lloyd. Obviously Lambert's words were a blatant provocation he couldn't just let go by. There's no way Cradle would let Lambert be just like that. 
Undeterred, Lambert did nothing, merely standing there, waiting for Cradle's move and, his action apparently annoyed Cradle. Hey, just so you know I am one of the five strongest members out of the seventy members of the Dragon's Enchanted Metal? S. Guild you know my guild, right a newcomer to the Spirit's Dusk? Guild is just like dirt in front of me but you see, our guild master told me not to cause any trouble so right. How about you take off all of that armor and prostrate in front of me naked I might forgive you if you do that. A long time ago, Lambert was once a man who became one of the four demon generals of the kingdom of Rejos. He was a warrior who stood at the top of hundreds of thousands of the Rejos kingdom soldiers. Why would he be scared of someone whose rank was merely one of the strongest five and five out of seventy at that? Cradle saw that Lambert was unperturbed by his declaration and he was aggravated though, from this, he also realized that Lambert was not someone who could be threatened like that. You two useless tin cans over there. Pretend that you never saw me in this place. Eh? I said, act like you never saw what is going to happen in this place. It's been a while since I saw a bastard who dares to belittle me so far. Congratulations for making me this angry. BB but that's. Shut up if you've a complaint, say it to Ursima. You a. Uh. Hearing that, the guard shut his mouth at once. I see it seems that Earl Albach is colluding with Dragon's Enchanted Metal? Guild. The employer of the city guards was none other than Earl Albach, the lord of Ainsa's city so, he could understand the reason why the guard didn't dare to do anything against Cradle after all, their employer, the one who held their paycheck, was in cahoots with the Dragon's Enchanted Metal? Guild so, that explained the guard's reaction when he saw Cradle's uniform. Now draw your sword you think that the outdated armor you wear can save you let this uncle teach you how to fight in a combat. Cradle drew his sword. I refuse. What? Tearing you apart limb from limb is a simple matter for me, but it'll be rather troublesome if you go clinging in tears to Ursima later. But. Bahahaha. <laughs> After laughing loudly, Cradle rushed towards Lambert ferocious as he could be. Don't get cocky, you fucking small fry. That sentence Lambert spoke had managed to hurt Cradle's high pride, provoking him to attack and, once Lambert won the fight, combined with his provocative words, he would be able to use himself as a bait to direct Cradle's harassment. Although he has no way to know how Cradle will get his revenge, Cradle's own personality would ensure that he'd try nonetheless however. Lambert was not worried over it after all. Lambert had planned to visit Earl Albach, the guard's superior, later. And since he would not have any regret if, for example, he made Earl Albach his enemy, why would he be scared of Cradle's revenge? Still, his action could bring trouble to the spirit's dusk? As guild's members so, he had to move in a way that wouldn't bring trouble to them no matter what would happen. In the first place, Lambert didn't think that Fiona was Cradle's sole goal. After all, Fiona should have returned to the guild after a few days and it's hard to imagine that Cradle had that much spare time in his hands just to harass the guild whilst Fiona was away, which he had obviously done so, what was his other aim aside from Fiona herself? Regardless of everything though, there's simply no way for Lambert to let the girl who had the same face as his former lord go to a place that was filled with scumbags after all, even though that very same lord had betrayed him, she was still his lord in the end. Kainitsama you can't fight in this place. Please get back. He unintentionally used the very same tone he used toward his former lord Aurelia, when he spoke to Fiona honestly, if he didn't control himself sooner, he might once again accidentally call Fiona, his majesty then again. His habit when he was still alive wouldn't be easy to get rid of it was carried over even when he had turned into an undead. Do it. Please kick that asshole's ass. Lloyd said as he tried to stop the bleeding in his mouth his confidence in Lambert's strength was born after he witnessed Lambert killing the thieves with ease and while he was aware that Cradle, despite his shitty personality, had superb sword skills, he was sure that Lambert's strength was equal, if not above Cradle's. 
Let me warn you I'll start with stopping your movement. Cradle pointed his sword toward the gap in the joints of Lambert armor. Then, let me start by crushing your jaw with a frontal attack. Lambert didn't draw his sword, he just pulled his punch. Or, Cradle is not that weak you know. Though Lloyd tried to stop Lambert, Lambert was unperturbed. Cradle kicked the ground, dashing forward with an extreme slouching posture then, he drew back the hand that was gripping his sword. Now kneel before me first is your left F.O. Cradle's sword already thrusted in the gap between Lambert's armor. W what a quick and beautiful thrust as I thought, that idiot isn't just all talk. Lloyd was looking at Cradle in awe to him. It was an extremely polished thrust. The hell with this slow and monotonous thrust while well, he might not be a big deal after all if this is the extent of his skill. Lambert thought, tracking Cradle's movement that was as slow as a turtle for someone as powerful as Lambert. That kind of thrust was nothing more than child's play. Sure enough, the moment Cradle's sword tip touched the surface of Lambert's armor, Lambert only took a little step back before smashing the sword with his fist at the exact moment the sword's tip grazed his armor. Unable to withstand Lambert's move, the sword was flicked away from Cradle's hand. G.U.H. It fell on the ground Cradle himself landed on the ground using his left arm and legs, while his right hand was grabbing onto the knife that he hid in his mantle. It seems that you're not all bark and no bite but... Your mistake is making me go all out. And then, against the fast approaching knife a fist that was even faster than the knife itself was already right in front of Cradle's face. I-G-H-U The fist that was wrapped in the armor crushed Cradle's facial bones at the same time. That fist also threw Cradle's body back, making it land heavily on the ground like a sack of potatoes. A-A Achillium gonna kill you. With his hand touching his face, Cradle glared at Lambert, all the while moaning in pain. I've been holding back quite a lot though if I'm serious, you would have already lost your head the moment I punched your face. Cradle leaned against the wall, breathing quite rough while blood kept flowing from his mouth and nose. Ogofu gofu. I've been holding back just enough to kick your ass out of this place but it seems I ended up using too much power and the reason was because you're weaker than my expectation. Since he didn't want to incur anyone's enmity, Lambert countered with just enough force to cause minor wounds. The guard rushed over to Cradle. As someone call a white magic user. That's unnecessary you guys saw nothing didn't I tell you that in the beginning. Why yeah? After the guard stepped back, Cradle once again turned to glare at Lambert with bloodshot eyes. You fool your life will be at least spared if you leave, spirits dusk? Don't get cocky just because you're a bit stronger you don't know the meaning of making me your enemy. After saying his piece, Cradle left the place while still holding his injured face with staggering movements. Hi H, it seems that only his pride is uselessly high um, maybe I should scare him a bit more. Thus Lambert discharged part of his miasma toward Cradle and as soon as he did that, the person he targeted instantly got a goosebump. Hi the eye. Cradle ran as fast as possible, before resorting to a crawl when he tripped over a pebble. But now, Spirit's Dusk, Guild has became, Dragon's Enchanted Metal? Guild's target hum most likely, Earl Albach has been targeting, Spirit's Dusk? Guild from the very beginning the hints about that Earl appeared from the most unexpected place huh? Act 115 Lord of Underground Labyrinth Chapter 15 Lord of Underground Labyrinth After kicking Cradle's ass, Lambert was guided by Fiona and the others to the Adventurer Guild, Spirit's Dusk. On the second floor of the building they went to the room furthest from the stairs, the Guild Master's office. The Guild Master of Spirit's Dusk was a long-haired man in his mid-thirties. This is the guild master of Spirit's Dusk, Germain San. After introducing the guild master to Lambert, Fiona went ahead and reported the result of her recent commission after she finished her quick report about the investigation on the village that was occupied by the bandits. She went on to her next report, 
detailing their encounter with Cradle in front of the guild's building. Once she finished all her reports, Germaine heaved a deep sigh. My apologies, I never expected that Cradle would go that far. He thought that he would stop harassing us like that as long as we left him alone. Maybe we really should relocate our office to avoid causing further trouble for the bar on the first floor, but that's impossible since we're making an enemy of Dragon's Enchanted Metal. Biting her lips, Fiona hung her head low, feeling responsible for involving her guild with Dragon's Enchanted Metal. Through Cradle's obsession with her, however, Germain merely shut his eyes as he shook his head, disagreeing with Fiona's feelings. Their aim isn't you alone, Fiona rather. Maybe you just got dragged along with my problem. Germain muttered before he continued on. This city is simply strange. We might have to move even if today's matter didn't happen in the first place. We're just renting a building for our guild's office so there should be little to no damage to our side but well. It's hard to let go of the trust that we have built with the citizens up until now anyway. That aside Mr. Armor over there. I assume you're the one who repelled Cradle. Thank you very much for driving that person away. May I assume that it's better if I didn't repel him by force? When Lambert asked that question, Germain shook his head. It's not. Dragon's enchanted metal? Is powerful indeed. Maybe I'm the only one who can fight them back amongst all of. Spirits Dusk? S. Members and the truth is they are a pain in the ass what with their influences in this city and eyeing this guild but more than that, that guild is even more suspicious than the dark guild that exists in this city honestly. I can't even imagine what kind of suffering Fiona will face if she goes with them besides that. What makes them truly troublesome is actually their backing Earl Albach. Ho. Lambert was almost sure of his suspicion towards Earl Albach doing many shady moves behind the scene, and he was glad that his visit to this guild was not in vain he got more information than he suspected. I would like to hear more of the details about those guys if possible, but can you tell me what is this dark guild you're talking about? Without waiting for Germain to speak, Fiona proceeded to answer Lambert's question. Dark Guild is a group that takes illegal jobs, they mainly act behind the scenes, rarely appearing on stage, but they're normally backed by a powerful figure since those guys are responsible for handling the dirty jobs of their backer. It's just as she said they're not in existence that you can speak about casually, I'm telling you this since you are already involved with them. Germain said the last part almost as if he was whispering to Lambert. Dragon's Enchanted Metal? Usually only takes normal jobs since they are so famous that almost everyone in this city knows of them, but that fame wouldn't matter to the Dark Guild. However, there's one thing I know when I was gathering information to build my guild in this city, Dragon's Enchanted Metal, is most likely the mediator between Uro Albach and the Dark Guild in any case. That guild itself is strange. It's as if they knew all about the Dark Guild's movement making them able to avoid collision with the Dark Guild due to the contrary nature of requests that sometimes happened with other lawful guilds it's as if there was a prior arrangement between the two sides. I see. I think no one else was aware about what they did if they only looked at the surface they're experts at hiding their trail, and so far there's no indisputable evidence of their misdeed. Hearing that, Lambert then contemplated the possibilities of Earl Albach having a hand in guiding those bandits to attack that village perhaps, he might also use the Dark Guild's hands when he did so. Well, rather than that matter, may I hear more about yourself after all? I can't make an unknown man understand the situation thoroughly with just this little time anyway. It looks like you have saved me and Fiona by driving Cradle away before, but... This person is the one who saved us when we were taken captive by the thieves who occupied the village, but since he doesn't seem to be that familiar with the situation, I invited him to stay for a while in our spirit's dusk, so that at least he won't be troubled later. Fiona replied to Germain. After staring into Lambert's head, covered helmet, Germain let out a groan. Well, I've no reason to refuse Fiona and Co's benefactor to stay, but... Will you allow me to at least see your face? Hum. When Germain asked that, Lambert could only groan ever since he was revived, 
He knew that he'd face this kind of question every time he went into the city due to his conspicuous appearance, but it was a risk he had to take, and yet he hadn't actually come up with a countermeasure. Though he did his best to appear unperturbed, the clanking sound of his helmet crashing against armor exposed his inner turmoil, but he decided to grit his teeth while lying wasn't in his nature. His real identity as an undead was something that couldn't be divulged. What's the matter you don't want to remove your helmet? I have an old scar on my face because of it. I'm rather reluctant to show my face to the others. Hearing Lambert's excuse, Germain thought for a while, considering it in the end. He merely sighed, shaking his head as he did so. Fine, we've too much debt of gratitude toward you after all, but I won't be this kind to you if you bring us trouble so. I won't pursue you to show your face to us it's just that with your conspicuous attire. I don't think that you can live comfortably in Ainsass. Germain drew a conclusion from the little information he gathered during the short talk he had with Lambert in his perspective. Lambert either wanted to hide his face or he was simply someone who was free from worldly desire in any case, to him. Lambert was still suspicious that's why he told Lambert that he had no intention to shelter him in case he caused some sort of trouble. Lambert, who had already planned to escape should the situation turn to worse, guessed Germain's intention, which coincidentally matched his need, nodded his head. Thank you and don't worry I won't stay for too long I plan to leave immediately as long as I find out what I want to know. Anyway, let's write the formal report for the time being, Lily, go and get me one of the document from that shelf. Lily moved as soon as she heard Germain's order, taking a paper from the shelf and gave it to Lambert. My name is it. Though he managed to brush that matter aside up until now, the time had come for him to say his name. Give him a pen and desk to hurry up. Despite being given a piece of paper, he couldn't come up with a suitable alias in the end. After much contemplation, Lambert finally filled the name column with his real name, Lambert de la Croix. It had been more than two hundred years since his death, after all so, there's no way someone would realize that the Lambert they met was the real deal. Though Lambert seemed nonchalant when he made this decision, this was also one of undead's nature they're attached to whatever they could preserve from their time as part of the living, such as their way of life, the mission they had when they're still alive. And other things these attachments were the very thing that bound their soul in this world after all. Lloyd, being curious, stole a glance at the name that Lambert wrote. It turned out your name was Lambert if only you told us your name faster. After he received the piece of paper from Lambert, Germain couldn't help but chuckle when he saw the name written on that paper. Lambert Delacroix, is it such a grandiose name? Well, I've no intention to be angry with you for not using an alias, but I see this makes the matter easier to understand well. At least you should be very careful that way. You won't become a laughing stock when you're being compared to the real Lambert from the story. Germain compared Lambert's appearance with the name written in the column name as he said those words. Though Lloyd didn't seem to realize it, Germain seemed to be familiar with the name of Lambert de la Croix. It was not only Germain, but Fiona too. Both of them were smiling wryly, looking a bit troubled after they knew Lambert's name. Germain and Fiona seemed to be familiar with my name. What's the matter? Is that name famous or what? Lloyd knitted his eyebrows as he asked Germain about Lambert's name. You should read more books honestly well. You should be familiar with the Kingdom of Rejo's Brave during the Eight Kingdoms Unification Warglyph Pal Kaiser, right? Lambert got a bad feeling even before Germain continued his words, but he was really surprised when he heard the name of his former best friend coming out of nowhere. Glyph Pal Kaiser, he was similar to Lambert, one of the four demon generals, and the one who pushed Lambert to the bottom of the valley. Of course I know about him, please don't take me for an idiot. Lloyd spoke with a sullen voice. In fact, the last and greatest obstacle who stood in front of Glyph Pal Kaiser's goal to end the Eight Kingdoms Unification War was none other than Lambert de la Croix. In Germain's version of the story, Lambert de la Croix was depicted as the strongest villain. 
During the Eight Kingdoms Unification War, the young orphan Lambert de la Croix was climbing through the military ranks with unprecedented speed with his Herculean strength and all sorts of trickery until he became one of the four demon generals then. He tried to assassinate Aurelia Aured, his own lord, and Glyph Pal Kaiser, his rival, to become the supreme ruler of the western Warimia continent, but, in the end, he lost to Glyph Pal Kaiser and committed suicide to end his life. What the, he was just a traitor then though I felt that guy seems to be familiar like hell I'm going to remember that bastard I'm an adventurer, not a scholar thuffist he kinda like Glyph Pal Kaiser's stepping stone. When he heard the story, he felt that the Lambert in it was a stranger his role depicted in the history was completely different from reality, but he only needed to ponder for a bit before snapping to the present. In the history of any kingdom, it was more convenient to make a story about a brave killing a betrayer rather than making a story of a lord assassinating their own retainer because of a baseless suspicion besides, in order to make sure nothing went wrong with the unified government. The reigning government couldn't expose too many of its dark secrets. Lambert could accept that reason, however. As someone who swung his sword for Aurelia, his lord, he couldn't easily accept the fact that he was labeled as a power-hungry traitor in history. Because the one thing he wished the most as four demon generals was to die with pride. If he still had his living body, Lambert would surely be in tears right now. And the reason why he didn't hold an inch of doubt about his condition was due to the innate traits of his undead body. Act 116 Lord of Underground Labyrinth Chapter 16 Lord of Underground Labyrinth Well then, you're now registered as our guild member you're my subordinate from now on. But as you've realized, our Spirits Dusk Guild will relocate away from this place in a while so, I don't know for how long we're going to work together still. Try your best to not take things too seriously. After completing the registration procedure to become the guild member, Lambert had officially become a member of Spirit's Dusk Guild and since he planned to disappear from public view as soon as he had gotten the information he needed, he had no problem in abiding with Germain's request not to make trouble especially. Considering the fact that he didn't have any concrete plan for the time being, the available commission is posted on the bulletin board, but personally I hope you will take the commission for gathering a grim cat pelt and take Fiona along with you though this commission might be a tad too easy for you who is able to slaughter those bandits by yourself. The cat in that commission was referring to a cat demon in terms of size, they were a bigger variant, only one size smaller than a fully grown man, TL at least as big as a cheetah. It had glossy black fur and sharp tusks like a small tiger however, they were not that dangerous as long as you only faced one of them at a time that's why Germain suggested that Lambert bring Fiona along, that way they could surround it when they were fighting. Naturally, Lambert was also familiar with grim cats he had seen them when he was still alive after all though at his time. In short, this kind of job is treated like child errands by the other adventurers. However, for this era, this kind of commission was in fact just right for the majority of adventurers only Lambert felt this sort of job was boring to him. Grim cats were supposed to be gathering in Ainsa's underground labyrinth, right? Germain nodded in response to Fiona's question. Uh, the company associated with us is gathering a lot of grim cats pelts lately that's why we have to gather as many as we can and for Thea, come to think of it Lambert. Please bring back parts of the strongest demon you defeated so I will have a better understanding of your real ability anyway. There are many types of demons of various ranks gathered in the place you'll head should you accept my request after all so. I think that place is just right to test your skills. First may I ask about Ainsa's underground labyrinth. Seriously? You don't even know about that? Heaving a sigh. Germain decided to just explain Ainsa's underground labyrinth to Lambert. Ainsa's underground labyrinth was a facility established more than 100 years ago. Its true usage and functions were surrounded by mysteries and from what little that was found from the magic tools and cipher codes. May many people assume that it was some kind of facility that researched magic tools during the Eight Kingdom Unification Wars era now. 
It served as the living place for many goblin variants thanks to the mana distortion in that place however, due to that. It also served as an ideal hunting spot because of the numerous high-ranking demons dwelling there. Yet, the information below UG fourth floor was unknown due to the existence of a terrifyingly powerful demon dwelling in it, barring adventurers from exploring further according to some people, that powerful demon was something that had no form, appearing just like a black mist, and it seemed to be protecting something from the fourth floor and below. And the grim cat we're looking for is located right on the UG second floor grim cat's pelt is fairly popular due to its unique fragrance and durability, and maybe this is going to annoy you. But if you happen to clash with other adventurers hailing from other guilds during the hunt please concede to them our spirits dusk guild is just a new and small guild that has yet to become famous we can't bear to contend with other guilds yet however. If you meet those guys from Goblin's Den guild, then don't yield to them their way. Despite being a small guild similar to us, is dirty and I hate theater, you can just leave the matter of dealing with those guys to Fiona. All of a sudden, Lambert felt that his joining Spirit's Dusk Guild might bring them trouble instead after all, Lambert's original plan was to kill Earl Albach after he had gathered all the necessary information still. He couldn't just overlook Earl Albach's existence who had transformed into a cancer for the kingdom of Rejo's however. Killing Earl Albach arbitrarily might cause the people, who knew him, to be dragged into the conflict, which contrasted with Lambert's raison d'etre. Lambert didn't say anything for a while seeing this, Germain then smiled to assure Lambert. Don't worry the point in this is to just ignore those guys from small guilds like us the big and famous guild aside, small guilds like us have its own unwritten rule and this is one of it. Germain san the way you're saying that is. Thanks for the revelation. Although Fiona was about to rebuke Germain directly, Lambert's bow, despite how lightly he did it, to Germain displayed his gratitude for the revelation, stopped her from doing so. Act 117 Lord of Underground Labyrinth Act 117 Lord of Underground Labyrinth Four days later, Lambert, along with Fiona and co., went to visit Ainsaz's underground labyrinth which was located in the outskirts of the city. The entrance to the underground labyrinth was a huge stairway there was a post beside the underground labyrinth's entrance with plenty of government officials standing nearby they were there to check the identity of the people who entered the labyrinth and right now, Lambert could see a group of adventurers, consisting of twenty-five people. Enter the labyrinth, after they had spoken to the government officials in the post. Um it's an old facility indeed but I've never seen or heard this facility built when I was alive. Lambert thought originally, he had expected that the facility might be related to him, but he didn't recall seeing this kind of facility during his life, so he assumed that it was made after his death. Of course there's a possibility that this place was built when he was still alive through methods like building it furtively or covering it with barriers during and after its construction but, who was Lambert, he was one of the four demon generals of the kingdom of Rejos, there was no army secret that he didn't know. Furthermore, considering the size of this facility, it most assuredly was not one of those nobles' personal properties thus, it's more likely that the royal family or nobles' families were involved in its creation, and if perchance, this facility was built when Lambert was still alive, then it'd be stranger that he, Lambert had never heard of its existence. Besides, he really couldn't imagine the kingdom of Rejos would spare the efforts to build this gargantuan structure when they were in the war-torn era. Um. While Lambert was looking at the entrance to the underground labyrinth, he suddenly saw a strange crest of an egg with the laughing face of a human carved on its shell, which was split in the middle and then there were carvings of folded wings looking as if it came from inside the split part. What the? Why in the hell is this thing here? Seeing that crest, Lambert unintentionally screamed out loud ignoring everything and everyone, he jumped down towards the stairway, hand trailing the wall as he finally recalled the crest's owner. Lambert San. Meanwhile, Fiona also rushed in, calling out Lambert's name when she noticed his action. 
P please wait a minute and get back here for now. And no doubt about it this is Sage Dominion's crest. However, Lambert did not listen to her his mind was already far away to one name. Sage Dominion that was the name of a supreme sorcerer in the era when Lambert was still amongst the living and Dominion was an evil warmonger who was labeled as the most dangerous person in Rijo's kingdom during the warring era due to repeated inhuman acts, ambition, and dangerous ideas. So, in spite of her numerous contributions toward Rijo's kingdom, which had boosted the kingdom's power, Aurelia still in the end ordered Lambert and his subordinates to raid Dominion's research facility and subjugate her. Even though he followed his order faithfully, the scene he saw during the subjugation wasn't something that Lambert, a man who managed to survive many battlefields and had already witnessed innumerable hellish scenes, wanted to remember. Flesh golem that was created by a combination of who knew how many human bodies, an extremely cruel trap which was designed to only immobilize its victims without killing them, berserkers who were created through injecting drugs into her own subordinate's brain at that time. Lambert and his twenty subordinates he brought along with him to subjugate Dominion faced all of this. However, all of them save Lambert were slaughtered by her vicious creations it was only after a deadly unknown battle that Lambert managed to slay Dominion. And yet, not too long after that, Lambert himself was assassinated by the hands of his lord's conspiracy. Only Dominion used this kind of crest in short, this place is that shitty woman's research facility. I guess it won't be that strange for that woman to make two or three research facilities and hide its existence from the kingdom. Even though it was just through remembrance, the memories of that woman were enough to make Lambert tremble in fear considering the current situation. Oi, you bastard! At that point, a government official, whose duty was to monitor the labyrinth's entrance, shouted he was irritated with Lambert's action of ignoring him and entering the labyrinth, as he pleased us, he poked Lambert's armor with the butt of his spear with the intention of knocking him down from the stairway. Gah! Alas, it wasn't even enough to leave a scratch on Lambert's armor instead of that. It was the official's spear that broke into two as its splintered section fell to the ground. Two's this guy's body actually made of a lump of metal. The official thought, fearful of Lambert's sturdy armor despite his fear, he was still even more vexed with Lambert's attitude of completely disregarding his existence. What's the matter? The hell you are asking about? You bastard is the one at fault for trying to enter the labyrinth without going through us first. Send away those adventurers who want to enter this labyrinth this place isn't a safe place I'll go inside and help the ones inside to leave. Hi you bastard, what in the hell? When Lambert was trying to persuade the government official, Lloyd had jumped forward to pull Lambert back. Listen to him and get back outside already, Uncle Lambert. Oh fuck, he isn't budging at all. But the situation is. That's why please listen to us, Fiona has told you already, right? Someone needs an identification from their guild and reason for entering the labyrinth before they can enter. Um. Even though Lambert was reluctant, he still followed Lloyd back to the surface. Humph when I think what's the matter, it turned out to be a member of the Spirit's Dusk Guild. The government official muttered such complaints as he looked at Lambert, who was following behind Lloyd to the surface, unaware that Lambert had heard everything he spoke. Good grief. I should have told you before right please wait until Fiona finished taking care of our entrance application. A Lloyd, the member of your guild were they marked by government officials? And no, I don't think so but... I see, it's fine then. Not getting an answer from Lloyd, Lambert then turned to look at the government official once again the strange thing was, the government official was smiling lightly when he looked at Lambert's back, yet he averted his face away once his eyes met Lambert's own. Act 118 Lord of Underground Labyrinth Chapter 18 Lord of Underground Labyrinth After Lambert's group went into Ain Saz's Underground Labyrinth, a certain group appeared the group of fifteen men was wearing white clothes with similar designs, 
Each of them were also wearing conspicuous red mantles, showing that they belonged to one group they were members of the biggest guild in Ain Sass, the Dragon's Enchanted Metal Guild. Beside the leader, a one-eyed man with the biggest build amongst the group, stood Cradle, whose entire body was wrapped in bandages. When this group appeared, one of the government officials, who managed the labyrinth's entrance, went to the one-eyed man and bowed to him. If it isn't the guild master of dragons enchanted metal, Titansima. Speaking until that point, the government official then looked around the vicinity before he continued to speak with an even lower voice. Four members of Spirit's Dusk just entered the Ainsaz underground labyrinth a while ago. Humph, what a lucky coincidence those guys entered the labyrinth right when we the Dragon's Enchanted Metal Guild are about to continue our labyrinth exploration. The Guild Master of Dragon's Enchanted Metal Guild, Titan, said with a sadistic grin after he heard the government official's words. No way isn't this your own work, Titansima threatening those small fry companies who are collaborating with Spirit's Dusk to give them a harvesting commission. Cradle asked a huge and disgusting grin etched on his face it was not only him, but also Titan the guild master who was grinning the same way as Cradle when he heard the rhetorical question. That stupid guild master happily jumped in as soon as he got a harvesting commission from the company that worked with his guild really. The foolishness of the guild master brings their subordinates trouble you bastards are lucky since you work under me. The members of Dragon's Enchanting Metal Guild simultaneously laughed when they heard Titan's words. Dragon's Enchanting Metal Guild was backed by Earl Albuck not only did it have a powerful influence amongst their peers, they also had similar influence amongst the companies as such. They could control the movement of other guilds by using their influence in the companies who were collaborating with the other guilds. So, they could create an advantageous situation for their own guild while lowering public trust towards other guilds for example, forcing the companies, who were collaborating with the other guild, to not give any jobs to their partners or, another example, forcing the guild to refuse their partner companies by asking the partner companies to give them dangerous quests. Those methods were the main forte of Dragon's Enchanting Metal Guild, making it so that any guild who made Dragon's Enchanting Metal Guild their enemy were unable to survive an Ain Sass. Well, anything can happen inside a labyrinth, and, even if there are eyewitnesses, we just need to kill them gahaha. Humph, there's no difference between being killed by demons or us in the end, they'll be dead either way. But I wonder why Earlsama even wants to destroy that puny guild. You better stop digging too deep into this matter not even I, the great titan, was able to disobey Earlsama so you better watch your step. Titan said with a light smile on his face, and since Cradle was not a stupid man, he dropped the question and only laughed along with Titan. Come to think of it Cradle. What about the girl you took a fancy to I thought you're going to rape her once she left Spirit's Dusk, but can we not talk about this matter? Even though I just want to steal that girl away before we crush that puny guild, that shitty girl's foolishness knows no bound. She rejected me until the end. Just thinking of it made Cradle's eyebrow wrinkled in frustration he swung his sword that was still in its scabbard to the side and then stabbed it into the ground in front of the government official the scabbard was stabbed deep into the ground, making a loud reverberating sound. H. Hi. The government official was so scared that he fell on his but with a scream he then tentatively touched his ears. Sighing when he found that his ears were still attached to their proper place he had thought that the gale coming from Cradle's swung sword had sliced his ears. W.W. What are you doing? Cradle ignored the government official's scream and turned around to face Titan, strapping his sword at his belt again. That woman is the first target, can you let me kill her? Cradle asked with hatred-filled eyes as his purple snake-like tongue licked his lips. Ha ha ha, I can't bring myself to hate that upfront attitude of yours. After laughing heartily for a while, Titan then led the members of Dragon's Enchanted Metal Guild to enter the underground labyrinth, briefly casting a glance to the government official from over his shoulder. The official was stretching his hands towards Titan, as if he was trying to stop him. 
P please wait a minute, Titansima. At least the entrance procedure. Titan glared at the government official from over his shoulder, eyes glinting dangerously. Are you trying to make trouble with me? And many apologies, Titansima. Still in his sitting position, the official hurriedly bowed his head to Titan to get away from him. Humph you incurable idiot. Who do you think I am you would have already been dead by now if you meet me in my younger years? Ha 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 Titansima is scary indeed by the way. Titansima, let me tell you that you've to pay attention to that armored dude who I told you about before I underestimated him before and ended up like this. You want to kill that armor guy too. Cradle let out a cramped smile when Titan said that with a devilish smile on his face. Two don't think I can win against him by myself, but can you leave him alive? This hatred of mine won't disappear unless I show that armored bastard a hell in this world. I refuse the one who is gonna kill that armored bastard is me. It's been a while since a bastard who seemingly can match my power appears. Oi, the rest of you lot, just focus on protecting the entrance so no one disturb me. Be but. It's that bastard. That bastard is looking down on me. Didn't I tell you that I'm gonna avenge you? What are you feeling dissatisfied for, Cradle? Though dissatisfied, Cradle only glared at Titan and didn't say anything more. Where's your reply, Cradle? Why, yes, please avenge me, Titansima. Gahahaha. Good, or don't tell me that you're going to attack me with your sword. Cradle shook his head repeatedly when Titan said that he was left with no choice but to obey him since he knew that his end might be worse than their current target if he didn't obey Titan. Agalba, Dalmer take that out. Two fat men, who up until now were standing quietly by Titan's side, took out two huge gloves that released a blue shine and equipped them to Titan seeing that sight. Cradle was dumbfounded he had never expected that Titan would go that far. Titansomodon tell me, that's. Yes, my specially made glove with plenty of organ, enchanted metal, you pipsqueak won't even be able to swing this. Dragon's enchanted claws? Properly if you try to equip it. Titan flashed an evil grin as he swung his glove-equipped hand at the wall meanwhile. The people who were around at that time felt as if the place was swaying when the clanking sound of a glove hitting the wall resounded. Why why you went as far as using your personal weapon? Cradle you know what will become of you if that guy turns out to be a small fry, right? You um. Titan laughed as he entered the labyrinth, leaving a pale-faced Cradle behind but he gritted his teeth when he saw the other members of Dragon's Enchanted Metal Guild had already followed after the Guild Master, hurriedly going into the labyrinth as well. Act 119 Lord of Underground Labyrinth? Chapter 19 Lord of Underground Labyrinth O Pyroxene, illuminate our path. As soon as the person finished chanting that aria, the dark passage was illuminated with gentle light. Seems like the adventurers who entered before us didn't take this passage. Pyroxenes were embedded throughout the wall of Ainsaz's underground labyrinth. It would shine with just a little bit of mana. That's why even someone who only had the bare minimum ability to use magic could still use it. However, since the pyroxenes didn't shine, it meant that no one had passed through the passage for a while in short. This showed that they wouldn't be troubled by the other adventurers ahead or... That's one of the theories the adventurers came up with when choosing a path. Do you have a similar experience of going into an underground labyrinth like this one, Lambert San? Long time ago, I often went down to places like this I knew of simple magic like pyroxene too but at the time, my goal wasn't to collect materials mine was to apprehend criminals who hid themselves deep inside the labyrinth, ah, I miss those good ol days when I competed with Glyph about who can hunt more ogre. Ha ha ha, that certainly is possible for someone like the brave Glyph. Despite him speaking the truth, Fiona took his remarks as his way of joking around to match his name with the Lambert of the Warring Era. Delusional, as if something like ogres could be treated like, hunting, a wild game. Lloyd secretly retorted in his mind he was dumbfounded on the ridiculousness of Lambert's story because, for people born in the current era, 
Overs were an opponent that could only be hunted by a party of four top rank adventurers to show how strong ogres were. Take Fiona, Lily, and Lloyd as its opponent even if the trio ganged up on one ogre. It wouldn't be the ogre that suffered but then they would certainly be annihilated without even being able to put one scratch on that lone ogre so Lloyd and the others definitely took what Lambert said as a joke. After that moment, they returned their focus on the dungeon however, the trio was unable to do anything at all since Lambert was able to push through the first floor of Ain Saz's underground labyrinth while mowing down every single demon that they met on the way soon, they passed through the second floor, their original destination, in the similar vein, and went down all the way to the third floor in the blink of an eye. Hiya! His great sword took down the incoming demons one after another, leaving mountains of hobgoblins along his trail. Lala Lambertson, the location of the grim cat we're looking for are in the second floor. Old man. The area beyond this is dangerous. Especially for us. Disregarding their words, Lambert shouldered his great sword, turning around to look at Fiona and the other. I might be dead if I dived into the innermost part of this labyrinth the three of you. Please return to the surface now. I innermost part. Old man, are you insane? There's an unbelievably powerful demon on the fourth floor. It has kept everyone from advancing further even up until now. Honestly, you should enter a bigger guild if your goal is to dive into the deepest part of the labyrinth. Not joining our small guild. The fourth floor and beyond is a dangerous place even if the four of us are together you know. I alone am enough to do this. Like hell it is. Fiona, try to persuade Lambert old man. Don't call me old man. I'm not even thirty years old or there's red light coming from the other side another batch of hobgoblins. Why you read just one step away from B. Once again, ignoring the words spoken to him, Lambert went ahead by himself without any warning. Two ogres suddenly came at him from the junction, poised to attack. Lambertson. Eh? Didn't I tell you before, old man? Ogres popped out every now and then in the third floor. Gah, we're done for. The three of them screamed even as they chased after Lambert hurriedly in their mind. Even someone as powerful as Lambert wouldn't be able to fight two ogres at the same time. TCH this kind of narrow place sure is troublesome. Lambert held his great sword horizontally as he ran with lowered posture meanwhile. The two ogres leaped toward Lambert almost at the same time however. At that moment, Lambert kicked the ground, spinning his body in the midair like a spinning top. Ha Using the ogre's own momentum, Lambert's great sword then tore their abdomen and not only caught the ogres, but also came into contact with the labyrinth's wall, creating countless sparks as it destroyed the wall. Gah! yo lo Ignoring the recoil from destroying the wall, Lambert continued his attack with another slash that decapitated one of the two ogres' heads then he continued on with crushing the other ogre's head with the flat blade of his great sword in one sweep motion after that, he delivered a roundhouse kick, as if he was throwing away trash. Eh? Fiona's eyes turned into dots seeing the unbelievable sight in front of her. Um Lloyd, get down! Sensing something, Lambert turned around to Fiona and the others after making eye contact with Lloyd, he then raised his great sword, ordering Lloyd at the same time. Ahwawaya! And he suddenly flung his great sword the tossed sword traced a beautiful straight line that was parallel with the ground and passed right at the place where Lloyd's head was moments ago before he squatted down then. It smashed onto the head of the hobgoblin that was sneaking behind them the body of the hobgoblin that had lost its head stumbled back for three steps before it crashed on the ground like a sack of potatoes. That's so close thanks old man, your battle is too awesome. With the crisis over, Lloyd fell on his but he then turned his head behind him to look for the sword, only to find that Lambert's sword had continued its straight flight until the turning point of the corridor and only stopped after its blade had stabbed into the wall seeing that sight. 
Lloyd once again realized the vast difference between his power and Lambert's own. Oh, shall we go back to the second floor with just the three of us? Yes, I'm with him. But I'm also curious about this place since this is the first time I have come here I see. The third floor structure is made like this, huh? Contrasting Lily and Lloyd, who were eager to go back to the second floor, Fiona who had never dived in until the third floor of Ainsaz's underground labyrinth was getting excited anyhow, to her. The reason for becoming an adventurer was to experience an adventure that's why. There's no way she's going to miss this rare chance. How rare of you to make this kind of slip, Fiona. That old man is a special case no amount of life is enough if you associate yourself with that old man understand we should go back while we can. Lily and Lloyd persuaded Fiona to go with them, and though Fiona didn't seem to be willing to leave Lambert alone by himself on the third floor, she couldn't do anything since she knew that the three of them would only become a burden if they kept sticking with him on this floor while they could persuade Lambert to follow them. But seeing him easily dispatching two ogres alone, she got the worst feeling that Lambert wouldn't change his mind. And that was proven by Lambert's look, who didn't seem like he would go back so, the only choice they got was to separate here with three of them going to the second floor and him going forward occupied with various thoughts and considerations for the plan. Fiona then sighed in the end. She decided that the only plan for the three of them was to go back to the second floor safely. Lambert San We'll be waiting for you near the staircase which leads to the third floor. Please don't push yourself too hard. I understand. After a short reply, Lambert then went ahead toward the junction, trampling over the corpses of the ogres as he walked forward. Meanwhile, Lloyd squinted his eyes as he looked at the ogres' corpses that got squashed beneath Lambert's feet. That armor of his must be really heavy he killed those two ogres in just a moment. No need to worry about his safety. We should go back to the second floor. The three of them agreed with Lloyd's assessment and ran as fast as they could to the second floor, passing by the mountain of corpses that was laid to waste by Lambert a while ago. Now that I looked at those mountains of corpses again, I really wonder whether Uncle Lambert is really a human. While Fiona was smiling wryly at hearing Lloyd's mutter, Lily suddenly paused her gait. Eh, uh, what's the matter, Lily? Lily had already pressed her ear against the wall, all the while frowning when Lloyd and Fiona turned around to see her. Suspicious someone is coming towards our direction, their numbers are for perhaps more this floor has many branches, so it's almost impossible for them to take the same route as us assuming that they came to hunt, but... Yeah. Well... I mean Uncle Lambert has basically left behind mountains of hobgoblins' corpses whose numbers are usually enough to annihilate an entire party in an instant this might get troublesome if we met this group, but they might come to make trouble with us, aiming for the moment when we got back from the third floor to rob us of our loots. Are you kidding me? In their current situation, human beings could be far more terrifying than demons. That's why their mind had already come up with questions about just what kind of evil humans who had pursued them this far after all. If they were unlucky, they might just run into two ogres on this third floor but, by being able to continue their pursuit means that the people who were chasing after them were quite powerful. W what shall we do gh? I think nothing good will come about if we met them. Lloyd's face turned red while Lily's face immediately paled at those words however. Fiona kept her wits with her, so after pondering for a moment, she turned around toward the passage that was used by Lambert a while ago. Let's go after Lambert San. There should be few demons left alive in the passage used by him he should be close by if he advanced while fighting the demons along the way we can't stay here since those people who are chasing after us might be too powerful for us to defeat. Act 120 Lord of Underground Labyrinth Chapter 20 Lord of Underground Labyrinth The group, who was chasing after Lambert and Co., was none other than the party from the Dragon's Enchanted Metal Guild they had searched the entire second floor to find and kill Lambert's group however, they failed to find them so, some of them went back to the first floor. Leaving someone to watch the stairs to the second floor while the others dove back further towards the third floor. 
The reason they were looking for their target on the second floor was because Grim Cat could only be found there so, the dragon's enchanted metal guild master, Titan, expected to find Lambert and Co. to hunt there. So, to find them faster, the original fifteen members of Dragon's Enchanted Metal, who came to this underground labyrinth, split into three five-man parties with Cradle and Titan in the same one. You there, have you seen a guy who wore a stupidly conspicuous full-plate armor we couldn't find them in the second floor, so they should be in this third floor? Cradle's party asked that question as soon as they met the other guild's party in a high-handed manner as if the other was dirt below them. And never sees someone like that. Rather, one of our members received a deep wound as someone. Anyone here can use white magic. Please help. The other party that Cradle's group encountered was a three-man party from Blue Wings Guild that was composed of the veteran swordsman, Cass Val, his apprentice, Hans, and a sorceress Lilith. The three of them happened to meet Cradle and his party when they were carrying Lilith, who was already unconscious from the demon's poison, out of the labyrinth. Ah, uh, well though it pained us, but according to the law, we're not allowed to lend a hand to other guilds when we're in the middle of a job, right, Titansima? Ah, um, my apologies for the inconvenience. Cradle and Titan replied to the pleading man with an evil grin on their face, and when he heard their words, the guy went pale. Even if someone life in danger... Stop it these guys were simply that kind of folks please don't block the passage if you guys aren't willing to help us. The leader of the party, Cass Val, stopped his pupil from flaring up at Cradle and his party. How crew I'll wait a bit, let me help you. At this time, a cane-wielding woman suddenly appeared from behind Cradle she's also a member of Dragon's Enchanted Metal Guild, and her name is Ange and she's also a user of both white and black magic. There is an easier way to cure someone from poison. P please save her. We won't make it in time if we've to bring her back to our guild. Oh, fire, burn it to ashes. While chanting, Eng pointed her cane towards the unconscious Lilith when the last syllable came out. Red light instantly gathered in front of Lilith's body, creating a fire that engulfed her body in the next moment Hans, who was lending his shoulder to Lilith at the time also ended up catching fire too. W what the? Q quickly extinguished that fire with water. FF dollar 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 CK. Ah ha ha ha. That should make things easier for you, right right. Eng was laughing maniacally as she questioned the panicking duo, looking satisfied with their reaction. WWH why the hell are you doing this? For amusement, of course, do you really think we're gonna let you leave this labyrinth naive? It was not only Ange, but Cradle, Titan, and all the others in their party who were also laughing hysterically at those two. Ha! Huh. Why, why are you bastard? Do you realize what you're speaking about just now? Do you really think that our blue wings will just let this matter be? Scory! Then, shall I leave your mouth intact so you can make your report to your guild? Hans looked at Cradle, astonished, when he heard his words. Ch. Unlike Hans, Cass Val didn't waste his words as he immediately drew his sword and slashed at Cradle however, Cradle stepped back, neatly dodging it while drawing his sword at the same time he made a circular motion with his sword in front of Cassville's eyes, restraining him from advancing even further and Cass Val was forced to retreat unfortunately for him. Cradle was aiming for that exact moment he retreated and stabbed his sword toward Cass Val, who was pulling his sword back it smoothly pierced through Cassville's chest, looking as if it was sucked into it. Gah! Cass Val was killed on the spot without even a chance to retaliate pulling his sword from Cassville's chest. Cradle licked its bloody blade. Uwea! WWWY are you guys doing this? Hans, the only one left alive of the three at the moment, crumbled to his knees he knew he had no way out of this situation. Both Lilith and Cass Val were dead Lilith, the girl I held unrequited love for and also his junior, 
fainted from the poison and was unable to defend herself when she was attacked and Cass Val, his senior in the guild, was dead almost with no resistance. Both of them were his good friends and the reason why they dove into the third floor today was to show the power of the senior to his junior rather than doing it during a commission they were even careful enough not to dive too deeply into the third floor and retreated as soon as they saw an ogre. So, he had never thought that they would meet this kind of end not even in his wildest dream. For adventurers, suddenly dying inside the labyrinth was something that they were aware of and accepted as their constant companion Hans was painfully aware of that fact but, he had never expected that today he'd experienced such sudden death. Why you ask? How such a foolish question are you trying to get us to pity you everything is your fault for pointing your sword toward us, okay? Ha. Ooh, Scory, don't make such a scary face, I'm just joking well, I shall be magnanimous today you ask for our reason to attack you guys, right well, dying inside a labyrinth is just an everyday occurrence for adventurers no one's gonna blame you for that that's why, don't you think it's a little boring if we just kill you guys when we met? Why why you basta rd? Hoopsie. Titan suddenly moved his hand and punched Han's jaw with his enchanted metal glove the sound of Han's skull being crushed resounded in the area, quickly followed with the popping sound of his eyeballs leaving its sockets Han's body crumbled down on spot, blood flowing out of the orifices of his face. Guildmaster Sama, that was my prey. Quit the useless chit-chat and get going. I mean, I was annoyed when I heard those weaklings didn't see our target either, ah. Uh, is it really okay to leave their corpse as it is? Leave it. Their corpses were going to be eaten by the goblins after all. After they ransacked their three poor victims' luggage, Cradle and his party continued onward without any regard to their corpses the moment they had walked some distance away from that place. A group of goblins suddenly appeared and started to feast on those poor adventurous corpses. Those guys might be awakened due to the riot moments ago and love us so much cause we gave them free corpses. Titan said, laughing he was joined by his guild members. Now I wonder which route those guys took I mean we still can't find them even after we've dived down to this floor. Maybe they dove even deeper Kukuku. It's been a long time since I've gotten this excited finally. My dragon's enchanted metal claw might meet its match. That's a relief for me. Act 121 Lord of Underground Labyrinth Chapter 21 Lord of Underground Labyrinth That Lambert old man is so fast. That full plate armor is supposed to be really heavy. Both Lily and Lloyd were voicing their dissatisfaction. Lily turned around, glared behind as she wiped the beads of sweat on her forehead with her long mantle. Fiona and Co. went chasing after Lambert who went even deeper into the third floor. The strongest demon on the third floor was an ogre but it didn't mean that they were going to pop out around every single corner. There was almost no demon strong enough to slow down Lambert. He went deeper and deeper into the third floor, leaving Fiona and Co. who were chasing after him far behind. Lily, what is the status of our pursuer? They seem to be preoccupied with demons, but they're steadily shortening their distance with us. Their number is beyond my perception. I don't think they're your usual robbers. They might be the people from the Dark Guild. So escaping by spreading out our force would be impossible. It also means that our only choice is to chase after Lambert San. Chasing after Lambert itself wasn't that difficult since he left the demon's corpses slain behind like unnecessary baggage. Though Fiona and Co. met other demons feasting on those corpses from time to time, they were too busy with their meal to spare them even a glance. Fiona and Co. kept diving even deeper until they're finally standing before a huge door that was left open color drain from their face when they tried to see beyond inside the room. Beyond the door was a giant stairway that went down below the current floor. Are, are you kidding me? Lloyd's face went stiff at that moment. According to the legend, UG fourth floor of Ain Saz's underground labyrinth was a place protected by the myriad form black mist like monster, which had never been defeated ever since the founding of this labyrinth. No one who challenged it returned alive. 
It was a place that second-rate adventurers like Lloyd and Co. would never dream to enter. If it weren't for them following Lambert. Even though his actions might be rather eccentric from time to time, it was just because he had yet to master the common sense of the current era it didn't mean that Lambert was insensitive. Even during today's case, he reassured Fiona and Co. that he wouldn't go down to the fourth floor. But Lambert had no other choice but to renege as soon as he saw Sage Domelai's crest. Because if this place was Sage Domelian's research facility, it was natural for this place to have some sort of bizarre magic formulae or weapon. He absolutely couldn't let any kind of dangerous weapon or magic formulae be known by the public. Thus, he needed to find whatever was there as fast as possible and dispose of it immediately to prevent any future trouble. Hence, he planned to secretly solo Dane Saz's underground labyrinth after Fiona and Co. returned to the surface. I am possible. This is too much you know. Adon tell me that Lambert old man truly went down to the fourth floor. But if it's Lambert San, I think he'll manage somehow. Like hell he can. Don't tell me you forgot how, which is candlestick, went down with its twenty strongest members and yet, not even one of them made it back to the third floor. This isn't even a playground for those big guilds, let alone small party like us. Which is Candlestick? Guild was the third biggest guild in Ainsas, till a while ago that is. It wasn't a simple adventurer guild because of the fact that only excellent sorcerers could enter their rank their name was widespread in the entire kingdom of Rijos as a sorcery research organization. But this was just past glory right now. Half a year ago, which is Candlestick? Set out a campaign to capture the fourth floor of Ainsas underground labyrinth, their arm to the teeth they took into account a retreat route in case they failed their campaign and yet, no one returned alive from that campaign. Which is Candlestick, who has lost the majority of their upper echelon fell from grace and dissolved on their own later. I won't go in. Absolutely not. Let's go back, Yoer, let's just hide ourselves somewhere somewhere on the floor above. We may be able to leave this labyrinth safely if we kept running. Lloyd was desperately finding another way to save their life other than going down to the fourth floor to chase after Lambert. At that time, Lily who had shut her eyes as she held her staff upright against the ground opened her eyes she let her staff fall on the ground and shook her head to show her disapproval. Those guys they are coming to us from several passages it's already too late to go back now. Ha ha! Fiona turned around to look at her two comrades after she adjusted her breath. After a short nod, she drew her sword and went down toward the fourth floor, completely ignoring her two comrades. There was no need to stay in this place any longer. Fiona concluded that the best course of action right now was for her to take the lead rather than waste their time convincing Lloyd. Lily, who saw through Fiona's determination, Followed her immediately. H. Lloyd stretched his hand to stop Lily but missed. Lloyd stood alone on top of the stairs. He dropped his shoulders and became crestfallen as he watched Lily and Fiona got down toward the fourth floor. Without a choice, he stepped violently on the floor. F4 CK. F4444 CK. Fine then, I'm going down too. Thus, the three of them went down to chase after Lambert on the fourth floor. What was waiting for them below the stairs was a gigantic room. The pyroxene in the room that had been lit up Lambert produced enough lighting for them to survey the room. Though the inside of the labyrinth up to the third floor was a NF historic ruin, the atmosphere in the fourth floor was clearly different compared to the previous floor. This one was more like an ancient palace. Though there were small carvings on the wall all around the room, upon closer look, the majority of those small carvings were eerie designs such as flowers with hand-like petals, a giant one-eyed demon, and the wings of some kind of creature emerging out of a broken egg. The floor was filled with water, it was up to their ankles. Although bewildered by the scene, a huge sense of relief washed upon Fiona and Co. as they found Lambert's figure immediately. 
That Lambert was standing still in the middle of the room, his sword was hanging loose from his hand. Lambert San When Fiona was about to approach Lambert, she saw a black shadow leap vigorously toward him. It was too fast it flashed toward Lambert's side. That's the rumored. No doubt about it. It was the ever-changing black shadow-like demon the fourth floor's reaper. Wa well, watch out, Lambert San. Lambert swung his great sword at a godlike speed the shadow was severed in half right away it fell on the ground, splashing something dark from its cross-section. The water around Lambert rose up due to the impact when his great sword collided against the floor. Kaya! D did he defeat that thing. But then, the black shadow's fragment suddenly leaped up again as soon as it touched the ground. I T S F R E for King Alavi. O L D man. Come over here. Lambert had already raised his great sword high in the air, then he swung it down diagonally. The sound of the black shadow being crushed echoed. Lambert's figure vanished along with a spray of water. When everything settled down, the figure of the black shadow couldn't be seen anymore. D did it die for sure now. Lambert squatted on that spot, his hand picking up something that looked like squashed internal organs. This core, a slime core high got a bit scared since its movement was rather fast what a let down. Ah that's what you're surprised about huh? Though Fiona couldn't see a thing, Lambert easily defeated that black shadow she somewhat calmed down after hearing his voice. I'm surprised there's a human as strong as him what a relief to know that he's the same human as us. Wrong, he was an undead. Old man, I asked that a mutated slime. Nope, I guess this slime underwent remodeling by human hands if it was a normal slime. It would have lost its bodily function and core after being cut in half and drastically reducing its movement speed. How can it be a coincidence for it to be able to move at the same speed even after it lost half of its body is too much for a mere mutation? Lily's eyes opened wide as she heard Lambert's words. And no way. As something like creating new type of demons is like the work of a god or a high demon. There was a fool who once stepped into that realm that's why. I can't just let that person know that this fool might have created something even more dangerous for the future of the kingdom of Regios. I can't let that person release these kinds of dangerous beings I have to kill that person as fast as possible. Lambert lowered his great sword to the ground, then turned around to face Fiona and Co. You guys, why did you follow me here? Didn't I tell you to go back? We couldn't. There were some nasty guys tracking us from behind that. Ah, so that's why. Due to his trade as an undead, Lambert could grasp the position of living beings. He has long been aware of those strange groups who scattered their force to advance through the labyrinth. But he didn't pay any special attention toward them. They were nothing more than small fry to him after all. Moreover, he was completely focused on Sage Demillion's issue. Let me take care of my business here first till then. Do not leave my side. The that's reassuring. Lloyd, who was extremely surprised by Lambert's power, quickly had a change of attitude. Despite the fact that he was standing inside a dungeon filled with numerous unknown demons, Lambert gave the impression that he was completely used to it. Sorry, we've ended up being a burden to you. Don't worry about it, I also got a little bit too excited that my vision narrow him. Lambert didn't finish his line as he suddenly sprung toward Lily his hand stretched out to strike the place beside her face while the other seized her shoulder. Kaya! Even the taciturn Lily screamed out in the face of such a sudden change of situation. The wind pressure from Lambert's fist disheveled her hair. His arm was smeared with black fluid his hand crushing the slime's core. So, that guy was hiding under the cover of water it seems they can hid their presence in their liquid form, then harden themselves when they're going for a kill. Lily nodded in silence. Lambert raised his vigilance as he led Fiona and Co. ahead. Lambertsan, how about we go back to make the preparation? 
Lily tried to call out to Lambert. Lambert turned around, looked at her for a moment, then faced forward again as he shook his head. My bad, that's impossible since I don't want to alert the owner of this labyrinth about my visit if I go back to make preparations. The owner might use everything in their disposal to prevent me from breaking through the labyrinth. I have no idea whether the current owner of this labyrinth is the successor or a mad researcher who understands that person's passion. Maybe it's simply a rampaging demon booty think it's best to kill that person today. After he said those words, he walked forward. Maybe we'll a higher rate of surviving if we choose to go back. Heaving a sigh, Lloyd muttered those words while looking at Lambert's back. Act 122 Lord of Underground Labyrinth Chapter 22 Lord of Underground Labyrinth To think that those guys went down to the fourth floor. Titan then guild master of Dragon's Enchanted Metal muttered as he stood inside the large room on the fourth floor. His subordinates were waiting behind him with a dumbfounded look on their faces taking Cradle along with him. He headed towards the center of the room he picked up something that resembled smashed entrails. It was the slime's core that was defeated by Lambert. Titansomized this the remnant of an unidentified demon. You may not believe it but that armored dude was definitely the one who killed this thing I doubted my eyes when I saw the corpse of the ogres who died with just a single slash booty see now. That man is definitely more than what I expected. Titan explained as an eerie smile formed on his face. We came all the way here after gathering information and making a perfect countermeasure against that dark monster, but it feels like we just got a freebie. Among the members of Dragon's Enchanted Metal? Present, Titan was the only one who seemed like he was already itching for a fight. It has been a really long time since he had a chance to go all out. Titan's fighting spirit reignited. He felt as if every inch of his body was filled with power. Even amongst first-rate adventurers, the number of people who could win against Titan in a contest of strength could be counted on one hand. Ever since he'd gained Dragon's Enchanted Metal Claw and joined Dragon's Enchanted Metal, he remained undefeated. However, he only had one dissatisfaction, namely, no one was strong enough to force him to use Dragon's Enchanted Metal Claw. Naturally, he preferred battles against humans to those against demons. He could experience the training both parties undertook to become stronger, their battle tactics, thrill, and then, the sweet victories it was a completely different feeling compared to a battle between humans and demons. Ten of you guys go back to the third floor and keep a tight watch on the stairs leading to this floor. Forty of you stay on this floor with me cradle. You come with me let me show you the moment when I defeat that armor dude we're going to split up to look for those people in all direction in a three-man party. There's only five of us. Shouldn't we take more people with you? Cradle tried to curry favor with Titan. How this great me alone can rival ten people got a problem with that. Cradle shook his head after Titan glared at him. Why yes sir no problem with me sir. Titan huffed after he heard Cradle's answer. After that he looked at Ange, the mage, and signaled him to move on with his chin. Yes. Ange nodded then she raised the staff in her hand. It was magic to trace someone's footprints that had just passed by a certain place. As I expected, they've really been here before, Ange. Have you found any trace of them forging their footprints? It's just like this. She replied back with a lewd gesture. Kukukuyuve exhausted yourself, huh? Armored dude, I'm gonna enjoying this. Titan went even deeper into the passage in front of them. He was followed by his four subordinates including Ange and Cradle. The remaining members of Dragon's Enchanted Metal split into three-man teams and entered the other passages. Oreira, move it. Move IT. Your newcomer's duty is to become our shield. Hi ha ha ha. Using the newbies as a vanguard, the man who spoke followed from behind while linking his arm with a woman beside him. His name was Emily a thirty-year-old swordsman and the third-strongest person in Dragon's Enchanted Metal? 
There was no doubt about his swordsmanship, but his drinking habits and his lustful nature made him an especially troublesome person even in the infamously troublesome Dragon's Enchanted Metal. Run faster, you sh asterisk giddy newbies. But a Melison, we have no idea what kind of trap is laid in front of us. Our only choice is advancing slowly while using senses magic. Ha, you dare to talk back to me. Emily yelled while drawing his sword from the scabbard. The sword's blade that came out of the scabbard shone red. It was a sword made with magic ore, the kind of ore that contained mana in it this particular or absorbed the mana in its surrounding, then stored inside of its scabbard and unleashed the stored mana as heat when unsheathed. He thrust his sword right toward his subordinate's face. Ah, ay! The newbie's scream was accompanied by the sizzling sound of charred meat. The skin that was charred by the heat of the sword was ripped off. The newbie then fell right where he stood, holding onto his face, screaming and vomiting. That was hard. Even though I intended to stop right before I hit you look, you wouldn't have ended up like this if you did as I told you do you want to embarrass me. Hi the I. The other newbies who witnessed the scene scrambled to run at the front. Emily let out a satisfied laugh. Buhahaha. Don't worry, I'll make sure to carve your name on the guild memorial if you die in the labyrinth. That's not a bad offer. Right, what are you going to refuse that kind of honor? It's because you have low consciousness like this that you can't become strong like me, right, Carmela? When he called the woman by his side, he realized that her head had been rolling around on the floor. The head that fell was bereft of its beauty. It was distorted with fear. From the cross section of her neck was the dripping black slime's liquid. Emily understood right away. The black slime who hid its real body under the shallow water had targeted his group from behind. He made a huge mistake by placing his subordinates at the front as the vanguard. You were. Something is coming. Something is coming at the three eyeing. Emily raised a war cry as he stabbed his drawn sword into the black slime, before retreating and discarding the headless body of the woman who had been in his embrace. According to the accumulated data in Dragon's Enchanted Metal Archives, the black slime on the fourth floor was moving in a linear path that's why one must take some distance when it was attacking it was possible to win against it as long as another person outside of its attack range aimed the counter-strike from its side. Emily recalled that information and put priority in opening some distance between them first. After opening some distance, Emily set his stance while glaring at the black slime who was creeping on top of the corpse. FF asterisk UCK. Newbies. You're still there, right? Do your scouting job properly, you dullards. When it was hiding, the black slime was almost impossible to detect. Emily might have felt that something wasn't right if he didn't force his team to move quickly and allowed them to use sensing magic. Don't just stand there like fools, come back here immediately. Emily confirmed the condition of his subordinates with a backward glance. His subordinates had escaped ahead of him while screaming hysterically. I'm gonna f asterisk ucking kill you damn it. You f asterisk ucking ba asterisk starts. Come back here. The black guardian of the fourth floor was the one that got smashed a while ago. Not this one, UF asterisk ucking BA asterisk stars. Emily approached the black slime, step by step, while pointing his sword towards it. Though it was busying itself with the woman's corpse just a moment ago, its body suddenly quivered when Emily closed in, then leapt at him. However, Emily had been aware of his enemy's position. No matter how fast its speed was, it could only move in a linear pattern. He also took plenty of distance. Thus, Emily jumped back while thrusting his sword forward. The sword pierced through the black slime. The black slime's liquid made a sizzling sound as it burned from the inside out by the sword's heat. Emily continued what he was doing, swinging down his sword to throw it down. 
And yet, in spite of the huge tear on its body, the black slime kept on fighting, completely unaffected by Emily's attack. Eh? The black slime leapt toward Emily's chest. Gie, aga awa. His clothes were dissolved by the black liquid and searing pain on his chest followed. No matter how much he was writhing in agony, there was no sound coming out of his mouth as he looked down on his chest. He noticed an out-of-place phenomenon. He could see through the black slime. He saw the dissolved skins on his chest and some parts had even reached his sternum. He was beyond saving. Aya. Emily fell face upright where he stood. In his fading field of vision, he saw another two slimes, gazing at him from inside of the water. This place is filled with them. Thus, Emily's consciousness vanished. After feasting on the corpse of two adventurers, the three slimes went after the others who were passing through this passage. Plus, plus, plus. On the other hand, Titan's group was advancing fairly easily. The way is filled with monster corpses, just like earlier, huh? They may not be as powerful as what we know from the rumors well, it doesn't mean anything at this point anyway. The passage used by Lambert was filled with the remnant of black slimes. It was to the point that even the surviving black slimes avoided this passage. Which is candlestick? Really was annihilated by those weaklings. How what a disgrace when the five of us are enough to fight them. Crado laughed aloud as he looked at the black slime's internal organs that were floating on the water surface. Naturally, he could say that since he had yet to know that Emily, the third strongest of, Dragon's Enchanted Metal, had been slaughtered by those very black slimes. Act 123 Lord of Underground Labyrinth Chapter 23 Lord of Underground Labyrinth Lambert brandished his sword as he ran through the passage, piercing the blade into the floor. Putting his full force into the attack, he discharged the undead's miasma, letting it dissipate into a smoky haze. Old man, what are yo h and gh? Lambert flashed a glare toward Lloyd, silently telling him to shut his mouth. After being exposed to Lambert's miasma, Lloyd dropped his sword he felt like he was being stared down by a giant monster, causing him to fall weakly on his butt. Fiona, who was nearby, also shuddered due to the aftereffects of Lambert's miasma. Three thunderous sounds resounded down the passage. At the same time, three black slimes appeared and circled around Lambert. Invigorated by his miasma, the monsters pounced at him. However, this was all according to plan. Naturally, Lambert intended to lure them out due to his status as an undead. He was able to sense their existence however faint. T3 of them. Be careful, Lambert San. One of them is aiming for your blind spot. Arg har. Lambert sent a series of lightning fast slashes, a speed far surpassing that of the black slimes, who couldn't hold their own against his might. The swings of his sword stirred up a storm, creating a wind barrier that stopped the black slimes in their tracks stunned. The black slimes were helpless against the series of high-speed slashes that eviscerated them. The fight itself lasted just two seconds. However, during the span of those two seconds, Lambert's sword was a flurry of movement. Barely visible, he must have slashed his foes over dozens of times. Kaiwea! The very scene was enough to make Fiona and Co., who were all staying away from between Lambert, scream. After the gale had finally receded, the scattered slime's cores splattered across the walls. Ami eyes have gotten used to this but I suppose I'm still overreacting a bit, since I almost ended up going all out well, since I'm getting a hang of the position of their cores I guess I can take care of them in five hits next time. 2C Sorry, Fiona your clothes must be wet after getting splashed with all that water. P please don't mind it. The water also splashed me and Lily too nay, please don't mind us either. After Lloyd said so, he waved his hands in panic. In short, Lloyd wanted to ask Lambert a certain question. Why did he only care about Fiona? 
This was the first time Lambert realized he treated Fiona differently from the others, however. It didn't take him long to arrive at the reason. It was simply because Fiona greatly resembled Aurelia. Um, my bad, Lloyd Lily. Ah, uh, no, I don't really mind about my clothes, but still, old man, just who in the world are you? I told you before, right, I'm Lambert, a man who was killed for betraying his lord. Lambert replied to Lloyd and then continued on along the passageway. Lloyd was stupefied, staring dumbly at Lambert's back. Lily bonked him lightly on his head with her cane and tugged him to follow after Lambert. Lambert's words caused Lloyd to sigh and recall what the Spirit's dusk? As Guildmaster Germain had said. Though Germain told Lambert that he might be ridiculed due to his name, Lloyd honestly couldn't imagine anyone laughing at Lambert after they saw his raw skill and swordplay. You might be even more powerful than the real one. Soon, they reached the end of the passage, which led into a huge room, similar to the previous one. Lambert sent his miasma into the pyroxene, lighting the dark room. It seemed that only the specific passage they were using was connected to this particular room. However, the fact that there was nothing but a spacious room was beyond Lambert's expectation. After advancing several steps, Lambert waved his hand, signaled Fiona and the rest to come to his side. I can feel something strange in this place this might be a little bit troublesome, so be prepared to escape at any moment. Be but if even someone like you, Lambert, old ma. Lambert shook his head in silence. It's because I might not be able to protect you guys, Retray. Before he finished his sentence, Lambert felt the presence of five people approaching from the passage they just came from. Those five people seem like measly thieves. But will you go back and fight them? Or will you follow me to fight against an unknown monster? Please understand that I've no intention to be distracted by that monster lurking here. Fiona, Lloyd, and Lily exchanged glances with each other and then nodded. We will go with you. The three of them declared without a shred of hesitation. There was no way the three of them could survive a frontal clash with the five people who were following them through the fourth floor. Thus, they rather stay with Lambert, who could at least guarantee their safety to some extent. I see then come with me for a bit more, and in case a monster appears make sure to stand back and give me room. Who's the monster you're talking about such a dangerous creature, old man? Well, that fella aside, maybe it's somewhat of a last guardian of the research facility that fella could never have used that kind of monster before. Booty see there's a high chance that person has a successor, huh? W what are you talking about? Lambert didn't even bother to answer Lloyd's question. He just went on ahead while unsheathing his great sword and dropping the scabbard. Despite standing at the ready like that for a few minutes, there was no sign of enemies leaping at him. I don't see any monster coming at you, old man. After he said this, the sound of footsteps coming from the passage they came from became louder and more distinguishable. So, you're that armored bastard, how I wanted to meet you so much. The one who appeared first was a muscular man equipped with claw-like gloves in both of his hands. His bright red, bristly hair combined with his prominent sideburns and beard made him appear like a lion. He chuckled as he looked at Lambert, like a predator eyeing his prey. He wore white clothes and a red mantle. It was a modified version of Dragon's Enchanted Metal, S formal uniform. He was followed closely by another four people. Everyone wore the standard uniform of Dragon's Enchanted Metal, and amongst the four was the figure of Cradle, who got his ass kicked by Lambert. And no way don't tell me you guys were following us the entire way up until this place. Responding to Fiona's words, the lion-like man Titan, the dilled master of Dragon's Enchanted Metal, opened his mouth. Indeed it's more it seems you guys have offended Earlsama thus. Earlsama sent me to hunt you guys down though I, myself, am interested in you. Armor weirdo. Lambert lowered his great sword and then turned around to see Titan. 
Oops, you better not be thinking about escaping from this place alive aside from us. There's another fifty people of dragons enchanted metal standing by in this labyrinth, waiting for the signal. Cradle went one step ahead of Titan, his bandaged face sneering at Lambert. Remember what I told you before I warned you, write the meaning of making an enemy of me. Cradle glared at Lambert as he spoke, an eerie smile on his bandaged face. Now, behold by making an enemy of me, you made an enemy of the entirety of Dragon's Enchanted Metal, the largest guild in this city even more so, you made an enemy of this city, the Ainsaz itself have you prepared yourself for that. Lambert, paying no heed to Cradle, was carefully surveying the room. Great, that monster has yet to make its move, I guess I'll take care of these people first. As Cradle was preparing to attack Lambert's companions, Lambert approached Titan and his followers. Leave them to me you guys make sure to escape through the passage during that time. Lambert was even more vigilant at this moment, ready to fight the monster that had yet to appear, but Cradle's nose flared, mistakenly believing that his speech finally cornered them. You're going to go easy on them as usual, right, Titansima? Still looking down on your opponent, how armor bastard that guy is my prey do not disturb our battle you guys may kill the other three. Ha! Titan's subordinates then surrounded the entrance of the passage, completely blocking it off. Titan sent a sidelong glance toward Fiona and the rest of Lambert's companions, but finding them uninteresting, he returned his gaze toward Lambert and smacked his lips. The battle between true men is naturally a unknown battle. Right stop thinking about burish things let's enjoy this, shall we? Act 124 Lord of Underground Labyrinth Chapter 24 Lord of Underground Labyrinth Titan pounced at Lambert, going straight for the kill. Titan's personal weapons, the glove, dragon's enchanted metal claws, tore through the air as it shredded by. A sonic boom resounded in its wake as Lambert skillfully dodged to the left. Titan followed through with a quick punch with his other hand, however. Lambert simply stabbed his great sword into the floor to block that attack. The impact of their exchange created a water pillar. Titan spun his body, using the spray of water to shroud his figure from Lambert using the centrifugal force of his spin, he attacked again, but Lambert just as easily dodged that too. Titan's glove struck the floor, and in that moment, he used the recoil to retreat, creating some distance between him and Lambert a wide smile formed on his face. Gahahaha. It seems your rustic armor isn't hindering your movement at all now I'm getting more and more excited let's enjoy this fight to the fullest. Titan leaped up immediately. Seeing that, the other? Dragon's enchanted metal? Adventurers, who blocked Fiona and Co. revealed vicious sneers. That man is done for despite what he said before, it seems Titansima wants to finish him off immediately. Fiona's gaze was fixated on the fight between Lambert and Titan, while her hand quietly rested on the hilt of her sword. Titan kicked the wall behind him in the midst of his jump, propelling himself straight toward Lambert from above. He was basically a human cannon right now. Titan pulled back his hands and punched towards Lambert at a terrifying speed. The impact of Titan colliding dispersed the water beneath his feet. Everything crashed off to the side, leaving an empty area around them. Titan spun his body in midair right in front of Lambert, flipping around to Lambert's side and punching with his right fist. Lambert didn't even try to defend against Titan's signature move thus. Titan's punch connected with Lambert's flank without meeting any kind of resistance. Titan landed right behind Lambert. Upon seeing the impact, Fiona worriedly looked at Lambert, forgetting the enemies who were in front of her. Lambert San. He reacted to her shout, and Fiona heaved a sigh of relief. Even the other adventurers, who were blocking Fiona and Ko's path, were fixated on Titan's fight in no hurry to kill them. Ha 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 ha, you're not bad at all. This, Dragon's Enchanted Metal Claws, is my personal weapon it specializes in armored destruction, 
and yet it failed to destroy your armor. You really are an interesting fella. They moved toward each other to clash again, and Titan aimed for Lambert's great sword. To counter him, Lambert adeptly swung his sword and neared Titan's glove, preventing his enemy's attack to gain more momentum. You insist those things in your hands are dragon's claws, and yet you do not even have any resemblance to a dragon. Eh? Titan's brow furrowed as soon as he heard those words. You think you can rile me up with such cheap provocation? What a boring bastard, even though it's been a really long time since I found someone who could clash Hedon with me or whatever, shall we continue then till death, of course. Titan readied himself as he pulled his right arm to fix his stance. But then, without any notice, his right arm dropped with a thud. A moment later, he felt a piercing pain from his right arm. E.H. In that moment, he discovered that his prized glove had been smashed to pieces. Its fragments scattered around, floating on the surface of the water. One could see a line of blood trickling down from the back of Titan's right hand, which hung limply due to his now dislocated elbow. I Titan fell to his knees as he wallowed in pain. His blood mixed with the water, slowly diluting and turning a translucent shade of red. I'm possible. It's made from an alloy with plenty of organ. This is, this is. You should choose a lighter weapon if you can't even use that glove properly. Lambert advised bluntly as he slowly lowered his great sword. The sword struck the floor, causing a loud boom as it collided. That sound made it clear that his great sword was far heavier than Titan's gloves. Leave those brats. Kill Hyam. Titan howled, a blue vein popping on his forehead. The other four? Dragon's enchanted metal? Members who blocked the entrance of the room sprung toward Lambert at once, completely disregarding Fiona and Ko's existence. Titan, whose expression had changed one of rage, stood up slowly as his gaze locked on Lambert. You're better than I thought you might be a monster, but there's nothing you can do against five of us. Cradle shouted those words while charging at Lambert, but Fiona blocked his path. Get the hell out of my way. You useless woman. Cradle thrust his sword, aiming for Fiona's throat, but he rolled away in a hurry when he heard the sound of splashing water from behind. Lloyd's sword aimed right for Cradle's back, and Cradle was barely able to dodge by springing up immediately, also dodging Fiona's sword that came at him from the front. Do you think the two of you can beat me? Lily, who was shielded by Cradle's blind spot, shot a fireball at the enraged Cradle. Cradle barely dodged the fireball with a jump, glaring at Lily in the middle of his jump. It's not just two, it's the three of us. We won't give you any chance to fight back. You ray away out. Lloyd raised his arm as he slashed at Cradle who was still midair from his jump. Cradle parried Lloyd's sword, jumping again by using Lloyd's face as a foothold. Haia. This time, it was an attack from Fiona. Legs stretched out after kicking Lloyd, Cradle missed his landing, fumbling to react to Fiona's attack. Though Cradle managed to dodge at the last minute, Fiona's sword grazed his cheek, leaving behind a long line of blood. Cradle touched his face. His face became even more vicious after confirming the wound on his cheek. He 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 you have done it ah, you still can run if you escape now, you know. Lloyd raised his sword readying his stance, yet his body trembled in fear as soon as Cradle released his killing intent. Lambert San. We'll try to hold back one of them. Fiona shouted at Lambert, while pointing her sword toward Cradle. Numbers could have an overwhelming advantage in battle. On top of being able to attack their opponent from their blind spot, going up against overwhelming numbers was really troublesome. No matter how powerful one was, it was not as if one could have eyes on every inch of them everyone had a blind spot, 
but the probability of revealing one's blind spot became exponentially larger as one faced against even larger odds. Fiona and Co. who expected that even the extremely powerful Lambert would have a hard time facing several first-rate adventurers, were trying to detain one of the five, thus decreasing Lambert's burden. I won't chase after you if you choose to escape you know but I don't mind if you guys really want to die. Cradle decided to aim at Fiona first. As long as he could get rid of one of them, it would be easier for him to kill the rest. Take this, and this, and this. G-U-U-H. Cradle's attacks were mainly focused on Fiona, yet he was still able to parry Lloyd once in a while at the same time. He used Fiona's body as a shield to protect himself from Lily's magic. Despite his rotten personality, he lived up to his claim as one of the strongest five in the guild. Fiona was simply no match for him. An opening. After a series of attacks, Cradle used his free hand to punch into Fiona's abdomen. Cradle's hand landed squarely on Fiona's gut. G-H-A. The pain caused Fiona to drop the sword in her one hand while her other clutched her abdomen. Fionea. Ha ha ha, where's your bravery from before? Cradle bent down to dodge Lloyd's attack, slashing with his sword to cut Fiona's arm. But then, an armored figure appeared between them. Eh? That armored figure crashed into Cradle, impacting right on his face. It might have been just a simple collision between two people, but the one who crashed against Cradle wore full-plated armor that covered his entire body. Cradle's lightweight sword broke as soon as it struck against the heaviest enchanted armor, or in the collision also dislocated his shoulder. Cradle's body was blown back like a twig, arching through the air in a perfect parabola and landing headfirst on the floor the water erupted in a loud splash. I told you to run as soon as I created a gap, right? L. Lambertson. Those foe. When Fiona looked at the place where Lambert should have been engaged in fierce combat against the members of Dragon's Enchanted Metal, she saw what was left of Guildmaster Titan, whose left arm had been lopped off by Lambert. She had no idea whether Titan still had his life or not since his body was frigid and he wore a dumbfounded look on his face standing still in the center of a pile of mangled corpses. Titan, in his arrogance, thought that it was by a mere coincidence that Lambert managed to pulverize his right glove, but Lambert stopped playing around and easily lopped off Titan's left arm along with his glove as soon as Fiona attacked Cradle. When she looked at the corpse of the other three, her mouth hung agape Lambert had gone for one shot, precision kills, finishing them off in the shortest amount of time. Thanks to you guys holding him back, I was able to kill the rest faster than I expected. Why you're welcome. Though Fiona was left dumbfounded seeing the tragic state of their supposed-to-be hunters, she pulled herself together when Lambert called out her name. She replied appropriately, though now she was convinced that their help was unnecessary. We really got no turn at all. Lloyd muttered. Act 125 Lord of Underground Labyrinth? Chapter 25 Lord of Underground Labyrinth? Why did the members of Dragon's Enchanted Metal try to kill us? Fiona wondered while glaring at Titan's body, who might have died with a dumbfounded look pasted on his face and both arms lopped off by Lambert. Naturally, Titan, who might have long since crossed over the Sanzu River, couldn't answer her question. Of course, it's not as simple as capturing us maybe they wanted revenge too, especially Cradle otherwise, they wouldn't have gone on such a suicide mission if they had known of old man Lambert's strength. Lloyd offered his conjecture. Though Lambert's conclusion was the same as Lloyd, there were some parts that he couldn't understand. It felt like they were going way overboard, just to exterminate a small and weak guild. Although, Titan himself said that part of it was because he was keen to test Lambert's strength. You guys, are you sure there's really nothing going on between your guild and this? Dragon's enchanted metal? Aside from your confrontation with Cradle yesterday. And nay, there should be no problems between us. 
Yes, there's been nothing for as long as I can remember. Thus, Lambert came to a conclusion that he needed to cross-examine their guild master, Germain, once they got back to the surface. Come to think of it strangely, Germain wants to leave this city as soon as possible though the matter of being pursued by Dragon's Enchanted Metal? Guild might be outside of his calculations. His instinct could realize that it's dangerous for his guild to stay in the city any longer. Now that he recalled it, there were many worrying points in Germain's speech from back then. Deeply involved in the matter by this point, Lambert felt the need to make Germain reveal everything he knew about Ainsaz's current situation. There was a man who looked at their conversation with indifference. It was Cradle though his whole body was throbbing, especially his shoulder because Lambert had rammed his heavy armor into him he'd suffered minor injuries compared to the tragic state of the other. Dragon's Enchanted Metal? S. Members. Titan's arms were completely gone. He was either dead or had suffered a mental breakdown to the point of incomprehensibility. The other three were clearly dead with their bodies cleaved in half by Lambert. Of all the members, only Cradle survived the whole ordeal with both limbs and sanity intact. Originally, Cradle was extremely persistent about being the strongest man in Dragon's Enchanted Metal? However, that resulted in him garnering more hate within the guild. I'll escape from this place as soon as I find an opening nay. Should I take that useless chap's sword and that woman as my hostage too? No, calm down. Don't get impatient escaping from this place is priority later. I'll gather everyone to kill all of them. I guess I'll use poison to kill that armor bastard. Cradle desperately suppressed his breathing and movement as he observed Lambert. The other three aside, Lambert had yet to lower his vigilance. He fought for Dragon's Enchanted Metal? Adventurers at once, swiftly killing them all with ease. His strength was clearly beyond human comprehension. I guess I need to kill that guy who's pretending to be asleep over there to guarantee Fiona, Lily, and Lloyd's safeties. Thanks to his keen perception due to being an undead himself, Lambert could easily see through Cradle's ruse. Since he had a clear grasp of Cradle's rotten nature from the previous meeting, he was convinced that the latter could do anything to exact his revenge. Lambert wasn't as naive to let a guy like him, who wanted to kill them so badly, go scot-free. What is this? Why does it smell like ripened fruit? Fiona's face grimaced as she asked. Lloyd's eyebrows wrinkled as he exchanged glances with Lily. It seemed the three of them were overtaken by the same odor. To be exact, it was a sickly sweet aroma wafting over them, like lumps of rotten fruit with flies drawn to it, rather than the mellow smell of ripe fruit. Unfortunately, the current Lambert lacked both the sense of smell and the sense of taste. Instead, the manna in his skull that served as the replacement for his eyes confirmed the presence of an amazing amount of manna starting to gather inside of this very room. In Lambert's eyes, it was as if the room was filled with pinkish-purple manna. And then it appeared from the wall. You guys, leave this place as fast as possible. Lambert San. Fiona and Co. were confused. Because they were still in danger of encountering other members of Dragon's Enchanted Metal, if they were to leave this place. Compared to that, staying at Lambert's side, despite the never-ending onslaught of terrifying demons, was a better choice for them. Lambert looked at Fiona and Co., who still hesitated to leave his side, and shouted at them while releasing some of his miasma. Leave this place, now. Fiona's body twitched when she heard Lambert's shout. Lily pulled her hand and they ran, Lloyd following close beside, toward the entrance of the area. Aha! An opening! Cradle leapt upright at that moment, his hand gripping the sword of one of his guildmates, whose body had split in half and crashed against the wall close to him. Then, when he took a detour toward the entrance while avoiding Lambert, a large hole suddenly formed in the wall behind him. Um. The thing that poked out from that hole was a three-hing-tall bear chimera with various stitched-up wounds covering its body. 
the patchwork really stood out thanks to its conspicuous pinkish-purple color. Its appearance was just like a tasteless and ugly stuffed doll, and yet, contrary to its stuffed doll image, it was strong enough to break through the wall. It widened the hole it came from till its entire body had entered the room. Wa wa what the? As soon as it entered the room, the stuffed doll radiated the might befitting a strong one along with a sickly sweet smell. Even Fiona and Co., who had entered the passage, couldn't help but stop in their tracks seeing the appearance of that stuffed doll. The stuffed doll then swung its giant wooden club toward Cradle. Though its movement was fast, Cradle was a first-rate adventurer even so, he barely dodged that surprise attack. The attack with that wooden club struck the wall, shook the entire room. Cradle fell on his rear. High three eye. Crumpled on the floor, Cradle instantly concluded that he needed to leave this room as soon as possible. The wooden club was going in for another swing. Dadam feet. Cradle stabbed his sword toward the stuffed doll as he tried to stand up. His sword, however, couldn't even pierce the skin of the stuffed doll although he saw unidentified liquid gushing out from the stuffed doll's legs. He couldn't comprehend how a liquid could be pouring from a stuffed doll. Then, it slowly raised its wooden club. Wa wait. I am. Splash. A loud splash cut him off. As if getting bored of Cradle's reactions, the stuffed doll swung its wooden club five times, each faster than the previous one. The room shook again, water sprayed into the air with each resounding swing of that stuffed doll. Cradle instantly turned into what could only be described as minced meat. Wawats with that monster? Lloyd barely managed to utter the words. It's just illusion magic its real form is completely different from what you see. The sorcerer, Lily, realized that the cutesy stuffed doll was its fake appearance. You're right removing that illusion is a simple matter, but if you do that you'll probably be scarred for life by what lies beneath I'll look into the room behind that crumbled wall be wary. I won't be able to protect you guys from this point on. I understand. Pulling herself together... Fiona nodded at Lambert, and then exchanged glances with Lily and Lloyd. Fiona turned around to see Lambert for one last time. Please don't die. Lambert stood squared off against the stuffed doll without even replying. He was experiencing nostalgia after hearing the retreating footsteps of Fiona and Co. Please don't die, how Her Majesty often said the same thing. You absolutely must come back alive, Lambert. Suddenly, Aurelia's worried face flashed in his mind. She'd said the same thing on the eve of the last war, too, but... Oh, 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 The stuffed doll raised a war cry and charged right towards Lambert. Its danger level about as strong as a troll. The danger levels of demons could be separated into five tiers small demon, goblin, level, medium demon, orc, level, great demon, Ogre, level, giant demon, troll, level, and dragon level. When it came to troll level or above, they were the kind of demons that were strong enough to match an army of a kingdom as for dragon level. It was a tier reserved for one legendary monster whose name was etched into history. Lambert himself had never tried to subjugate demons above troll level. I see now the ones who never return had to face off against this guy, huh? Lambert kicked the ground as he made a beeline toward the plushie. The plushie swung down its wooden club to strike the flat side of Lambert's great sword, but Lambert skillfully redirected the impact towards the ground beneath him. He then used the blast from that impact to jump above the plushie, landing right by its side, and then swung his great sword toward the plushie's abdomen. As expected, not just its wooden club, that is also an illusion. After opening some distance between himself and the stuffed doll, Lambert pointed his great sword toward the plushie as soon as his feet landed on the ground. The plushie calmly turned around, despite the gooey fluid that flowed from the slashing wound on its abdomen. Stop your farce and show me your true self already. Lambert went all out, 
finally releasing the miasma that was sealed in him all this time. The air around the plushy squirmed alongside its transformation. Act 126 Lord of Underground Labyrinth Chapter 26 Lord of Underground Labyrinth The plushy was squirming around its outer skin tore away, revealing something that resembled the sinewy muscle beneath human skin. Dark-colored mucus stripped down from the long slit that formed its mouth. Three rows of teeth lined the inside of that insidious-looking mouth. Its two big eyes were unfocused, moving erratically. Around its entire body were patchwork wounds ten long fingers gripped onto a giant metal club. Its appearance was simply disgusting beyond belief, as if everything grotesque in the world was embodied in a single being. As I thought, I'm glad those youngins didn't stay to see this repulsive thing. Lambert heaved a relieved sigh as he looked at the monster before him. It wouldn't have been strange for Fiona and Co. to go mad after seeing that thing had they chosen not to escape from this place. Even Titan, who apparently hadn't died yet, retreated while screaming like a scaredy cat no sooner that the monster revealed its true form. Sh save me. Someone please save me. That grotesque monster then grabbed Titan's feet with its other ten-fingered hand with a maniacal smile. It swung him around. Despite how loudly he screamed before, Titan fell silent after the grotesque monster slammed him twice on the floor. His upper body was torn apart when it was slammed for the third time, leaving only his lower body in the grotesque monster's hand. That monster then threw Titan's lower half toward Lambert. Lambert lightly slapped Titan's lower body with the blunt side of his great sword, changing its orbit and sending it far behind him. As expected, the thing that appeared before Lambert was a flesh golem, a being created by using human flesh as its raw material. The development of this project was banned even during the Eight Countries Unification War due to its extremely repulsive nature. Though inhumane research was used as the pretext, the real reason was because the sorcerer who performed this research would go as far as to commit crimes like wanton killing just to get a fresh supply of corpses. That was ultimately the reason behind the order for Lambert to hunt down Sage Demillion who massacred dozens of villages to continue the flesh golem's research. So that person created dungeon-like research facilities to bait adventurers and then took their corpses as the material for the flesh golem this stylites truly like that of Demillion. Lambert pointed his sword toward the flesh golem while recalling the anger he experienced two hundred years ago. The flesh golem approached Lambert while randomly swinging its iron club. Each of its swings held an unimaginable power, enough to decide the victor of the battle. Lambert parried each swing with the flat part of his blade letting it glide off to his sides rather than trying to stop it. This bastard's movement is fast and accurate. Just how many lives were sacrificed to complete this single flesh golem? The flesh golem leapt toward Lambert as soon as he entered its range, roared loudly while doing so. It didn't waste a moment to regain its balance. Though Lambert sidestepped as quickly as he could, circling behind the flesh golem, its large eyeball didn't miss a single detail of Lambert's movement. The flesh golem leaped back, readied its stance, and then swung its metal club toward Lambert again. Its eyes are surprisingly sharp, huh? How about this? Lambert retreated, barely dodging the iron club. The club that missed its target struck the floor, making the water splash up in a large pillar. The next moment, the flesh golem swung its club upward as if to scoop up Lambert who it believed was shrouded in the water. The club then hit something that felt like a lump of metal, sending it flying until it crashed against the ceiling. The flesh golem then readied its stance with the metal club again while chasing after the lump of metal that fell from the ceiling. It seems to be equipped with excellent reflexes and speed, but its intelligence is clearly lacking. Only a moment later, the flesh golem realized that Lambert had leaped on top of its head by using the giant water pillar from before. The flesh golem's eyes opened wide. The thing that crashed against the ceiling wasn't Lambert. It was his great sword. 
This confirmed Lambert's suspicion the flesh golem perhaps had superior dynamic vision, but its eyesight was falling behind. Even without a weapon, this was the best situation for Lambert. He could freely aim for its head, the weak point of every single living being. Lambert's armor-covered fingers mercilessly jabbed into the flesh golem's big eyeball. Lambert's gauntlet that pierced through the eyeball was covered with the monster's bluish-green body liquid. After his hand was submerged into the eye socket up to his wrist, Lambert pulled back slightly and then clenched his fist. Bun! The flesh golem raised a pained cry as it shook its head, trying to crush Lambert against the floor. Lambert was clinging onto the flesh golem's skin. His hands gripped tightly just before his body struck against the floor. He circled around toward the back of its head while maintaining his vice grip on its skin. He then used the weight of his armor and kicked the monster's head twice in the back, added even more damage to its head when it was crashing against the floor. Lambert leapt using the recoil from his kicks and the impact when it crashed against the floor. His hand then grabbed onto the hilt of his sword that was stabbed into the ceiling pulling it down with all his might. His somersaulted as he fell and then landed again with a flawless fighting stance. Come what may, pitiful golem, I'll put an end to your suffering. The flesh golem glared at Lambert while pressing its hand on its forehead. And then, it retreated slightly, its heels scraping against the floor. The flesh golem who had been filled with destructive impulse up to now, was terrified. The flesh golem was terrified of Lambert, whose strength was clearly superior. The flesh golem's one remaining eye became bloodshot, turning a bright red. The blood vessels in its arms were twitching vigorously as it strengthened the grip on its club. Bun! The flesh golem charged toward Lambert while raising a war cry. This powered-up attack was its heaviest and fastest attack. And yet, this was the last-ditch effort of a cornered creature. But that also made its current attack far more simple than its previous attacks. Lambert widened his stance and raised his sword vertically. The flesh golem swung its club toward him. Lambert slanted his sword to catch the flesh golem's blow with the flat side of his blade making sure that the club and the sword were locked together. He let it slip till his waist, and used his body as the axis to reverse the blow. Thus, the flesh golem's attack with its club was sent back to its owner's chest at full power. The club that struck its owner's chest then fell, crashing on the floor. This move, called Heaven Earth Reversal, was a gift from one Quixote, a demon general and Lambert's swordsmanship teacher. It was an ultimate counter, designed to redirect the vector of an opponent's skill back to its owner at full power. This was the first time Lambert executed this technique, making full use of every single joint in the human body, without allowing even an inch of error. Originally, it was a specialized antipersonnel skill that required the use of the opponent's body but Lambert's battle sense supplemented the lacking parts and executed Heaven Earth Reversal perfectly against the golem. Lambert circled around toward the stunned flesh golem's blind spot and sent a powerful blow toward its thick leg. The flesh golem quickly swung down its club, but Lambert, who had predicted such an attack, leapt first he ran along the top of the club, which was buried in the floor, and approached the monster's head. The flesh golem tried to meet Lambert's attack with a headbutt. Lambert adjusted the position of his sword as it pierced through the flesh golem's head and then jumped back to neutralize the impact toward his body as much as possible. The flesh golem's movement ceased after Lambert's great sword pierced through its head he once again swung his sword and then leaped up. Lambert raised his sword in the air as soon as he landed right in front of the flesh golem's head. Un. Halawaya. His great sword struck toward the flesh golem's head. The sole remaining eyeball of the flesh golem flew from its socket due to the impact. Its head got smashed, revealing clumps of pink flesh inside. The flesh golem fell forward right there. May you rest in peace. 
Lambert offered his prayer while looking down at the flesh golem that was left in such a pitiful state. Clap, 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 clap. Suddenly, the sound of clapping hands resounded in that room. At the same time, a sickening sweet yet rotten smell, even more powerful than the smell that came from the flesh golem, filled the entire room. When Lambert looked at the source of that sound, he saw a young lady standing on top of the hole that was created by the flesh golem. She had big, round eyes and raven black hair. Despite her beauty, the bizarre air around her made anyone who saw her feel uncomfortable. If it isn't Lambert Kun. How unexpected for me to meet you in this way, nay, this might be the blessing of my longevity. The young lady was smiling cheerfully as she offered her hand as if she would accept Lambert's everything. But the look on her face made it look like a blatant lie. Don't make such a scary face let our past be water under the bridge it's not like I, Boku, hate you either you might even say that I love you. I knew that you are a monster, but I never expected that you didn't die even after you lost your lower half. As if, it was just a ritual that automatically invoked after I died I died once before. When you cut my upper half along with my heart geez, you were such a brute your last attack was really painful, you see. The young lady licked her lips with her pink tongue as she retold her story with an entranced look on her face. She then continued on with the same smile as before. But unfortunately, you couldn't confirm my death for sure due to the collapsed building, right? Sage Demillion. She appeared just like Lambert remembered her. At that time, Demillion had modified her own body, turning her body into an ageless one. That's why, even back then, no one knew her real age or origin. Despite her blatant research on forbidden sorcery arts, the reason why the previous kings of that era couldn't punish Demillion was mainly due to her overwhelming achievements in research about magic no one could rival her innovation or sheer power. Though she was finally killed by Lambert after a fierce battle to the death, Demillion ended up surviving and continued her research, kidnapping the adventurers who dove into the underground labyrinth. Act 127 Lord of Underground Labyrinth Chapter 27 Lord of Underground Labyrinth Oh come on, don't glare at me like that it's scary, you know look, we ended up in the same situation despite what we did for Rejo's. They eventually betrayed and killed us after we had served our purpose. As the million spoke, she cowered in an unnatural way. Same situation. Yeah, exactly. If we're speaking of who lost the most during the Eight Countries Unification War, the answer would be the Kingdom of Rejos. But then, the reason is because that stupid, ungrateful princess decided to get rid of you after you served your purpose. I'll never work alongside a bastard like you. Lambert indifferently replied to Demillion's fervent speech about her achievements. Though his voice was laced with underlying killing intent, Demillion just smiled at him, not seeming to mind his answer. Come on, we ended up with similar fates look. Once she thought I wasn't useful anymore, she sent you to kill me, right in your case. That stupid princess was waiting until right before the Makiura's kingdom surrendered, and then sent Glyph to kill you see we're basically the same. Her Highness felt anxious that a remnant of foreign royalty could use my name to incite another war if that were to happen, thousands more would die that's why my death was necessary to prevent more tragedies and I'll never forgive you for scorning Her Highness. During the Eight Countries Unification War, the kingdom of Rejos absorbed many other countries, and afterward, it continued on toward the unification of the entire western half of the continent. But then, the nobles and royalties of the countries who surrendered to the Rejos kingdom then started to move behind the scenes. One wrong move, and Aurelia's secret and Lambert's overwhelming popularity amongst the masses could be used by them to cause another bloody war. As the king, Aurelia had to prioritize the safety of her citizens and the throne over her personal feelings in her position, that decision was probably the correct one. After becoming an undead, Lambert came upon an understanding in regard to her decision. I've accepted my death, 
but you're just a wicked woman, Demillion. However, she was unperturbed by Lambert's remark and eerie smile was plastered on her face. You're wrong if you've accepted your death, then you would have never become an undead Lambertcon. You're not a loyal retainer at all the current you is the reincarnation of your filthy desire, regret, and envy you dream of something out of your reach, betrayed right before you could attain it, and yet. You're still blinded by that stupid princess that's why you can't move on. You're real. The one who's wrong is you I've been researching the undead for a long time. That's why I could tell as soon as I saw you. Demillion cut off his retort. Moreover, if you were serious about killing me, you would have attacked me as soon as you saw me, instead of wasting your time talking just like in the past. That's a nice idea you got there. Demillion then pointed upward with her index finger, and the moment she did so, Lambert threw his great sword toward her. Demillion heaved a sigh as if to say good grief. Contrary to its bulky appearance, the great sword traveled at breakneck speed, creating a thunderous sound as it struck Demillion's abdomen. Demillion's petite body, which was too small to win against such a force, flew back and right into the wall. Skewered by the great sword, Demillion's body dangled lifelessly. Her abdomen was crushed, black liquid flowing out from her nose and mouth. Ah ha ha ha, you're pissed off, huh? Did I hit the bull's eyes? Demillion suddenly lifted her chin, laughing while clenching her teeth as if to prevent the black liquid from spilling even further. Her jaw turned black, covered by the mysterious black liquid. Lambert closed in and then punched Demillion's face with his gauntlet-covered hands. Her head sunk into the wall, causing a thunderous sound. After the dust settled, her head hung lifelessly. However, Lambert didn't let his guard down since he knew that Demillion wouldn't fall that easily. He spun around midair, sending a roundhouse kick toward Demillion's head again. Demillion's body twisted as it slipped down the sword that nailed her body to the wall. Lambert's roundhouse kick missed its target and struck the wall, creating a huge crater. Demillion crept on the ground, even with a snap neck and then stood again as if nothing had happened. Her hands fixed her head back in place with a crack, and she turned back to face Lambert, smiling eerily as she did so. Ah, that hurt I think I died three times with each attack. As if a foo asterisk king monster like you can feel pain. My bad, I've left some of my pain receptors I don't hate pain after all. Demillion stabbed her fingers into her own chest making a hole in her abdomen. She dug inside and then gouged out some of her own meat. Though she looked enraptured as she mutilated her own body, her expression went back to normal as soon as she removed her hand. Well then, have you calmed down if so, then let's start again the reason you became an undead is because you were betrayed by that Aurelia, right you're simply afraid to know the truth. That's why you've come to kill me again I need to make you understand T. Lambert pulled out his great sword that was stabbed into the wall and made a beeline toward Demillion. Demillion didn't seem to care about Lambert's incoming attack. She just spread her arms to the side in silence. Don't you think that we, who were betrayed, should get along we should lick each other's wounds in this place, forever I can grant your wish too as long as it's within my ability in exchange, become my knight and protect me from danger how's that, a lovely offer, right I'm also happy with it. I took a liking to you too after all are you wondering whether I'm jesting or not, or could it be that you're ignoring me should I entice you slowly then I'm a poor talker, after all now, will you take off your helmet I really like your current figure. Lambert simply ignored Demillion's words swinging his great sword and aiming for her head. Demillion couldn't dodge in time. Lambert's great sword struck her temple. Though her body was knocked back again and slammed against the wall for a second time, she instantly recovered in a moment. Especially her skull, despite being struck directly with Lambert's great sword, there was a single scratch on it. Even with a huge wound in her abdomen and twisted limbs, Liquid only poured from her mouth. Overall, 
it was as if Demillion wasn't injured at all. I put even more power in that last attack. Ah, uh, that really hurt I'm happy that you're finally reacting, but what will you do since killing me is futile I've obtained immortality? You can't kill me I'm even protected by layers of magic that have accumulated for two hundred years. Cut the crap, I already know your weak point your head is protected to an abnormal degree for an immortal, huh? Fufufu, as sharp as ever, aren't cha. Lambert also had a core as an undead, but for some reason, he knew that the location of his was right inside his cranium. He judged that Demillion's existence was closer to that of an undead, thus concluded that the location of her core was right inside of her head as well. This conclusion was not mere conjecture he observed that the body parts below her neck were extremely brittle compared to the parts above her neck. But still, this state of mind is closer to an immortal, you know you might need to beat my head hundreds of times with that great sword of yours to crack it open, and it's not like I'm going to be a good child and just wait for you to crack my skull open without fighting back. After speaking, Demillion leaped back and then vanished inside the hole in the wall that was opened by the flesh golem. Lambert readied his stance with his great sword and jumped into the hole to chase after Demillion. But Demillion's figure had already vanished. Well, I don't mind, with you being like that I've known since long ago that you're quite a stubborn man. After all now that you're giving your all, let me show you mine. Demillion's voice resounded in the passage. Lambert raised his vigilance against any possible trap as he went after the owner of that voice. I'll crush your body, trap your soul, and toy with it forever now come, let me show you the results of my two hundred years of research. Act 128 Lord of Underground Labyrinth Chapter 28 Lord of Underground Labyrinth The place where Demillion's voice came from was at the other end of a long and echoing passage. While the dungeon had seemed almost palace-like before, this new area was filled with cutesy decor, pink covering almost every inch. The image of this place completely overpowered the old and strict image from the previous area. Though the shallow water was still there, the color had changed from a muddy brown to a transparent, crystal-like shade. The surface of the water reflected the design of the passage with amazing clarity. On both sides of the beautiful yet prison-like passage, there were cat-like plushy creatures inside cages. The size of the plushy cats was more than double that of a normal cat. They were almost as big as a human. They were moving around inside of their cages as if waiting for something. Perhaps because it didn't feel its cage was too small, one of the cats plopped down while scratching its head. Moreover, there were bookshelves placed along the wall with multicolored wine glasses stored inside of them. Although the words written on the signboards that appeared once in a while had welcoming words like, Welcome, dear guest, or Feel free to enjoy the dishes, the crest was undoubtedly that of Domelin, drawn wings peeking out from the crevice of an egg. The passage was overpowered with a sickening, rotten sweet smell. Although the change of the interior seemed like nothing, Lambert's honed instincts told him that there was something fishy about it. And then, he saw a plushy cat outside of its cage, blocking the passage ahead. The plushy, who approached Lambert with an unsteady gait, glared at him as if to ask, What's the matter? With its black eyes. Lambert just stood still as he released his miasma that was roused due to the previous battle with the plushy. The pretty and colorful wall suddenly transformed into an ordinary wall drenched in the color of blood. The hanging signboard that welcomed visitors was gone. In its place was a grotesque picture instead. The contents of the shelves were replaced with heads of various animals and suspicious-looking medicines the crystal-clear water below his feet transformed into a muddy green bog. The bright and happy interior from before, all of it was created by Demillion's illusion magic. Using the very same illusion magic, she had hidden the previous flesh golem's appearance. Naturally, the plushie in front of him was also affected by her illusion. Elokil. The plushie who stood in Lambert's way had vanished, 
In its place was a strange aberration composed of haphazard patchwork that stitched together the upper bodies of three people. Its six eyes bore into Lambert, as if begging for him to end their suffering. Lambert raised his great sword in silence. His great sword killed the monster in one hit. Lambert set his stance again as he passed by the side of the crushed monster, but then he stopped and turned around to see the monster that he killed just a moment ago. And then, he ran ahead, destroying the cages and shelves while raising a war cry. In the deepest place of Ain Saz's underground labyrinth, Demillion sat on a huge chair of the reception hall, waiting for Lambert. Not only had her wounds from before vanished, but there was also almost no trace left of her previous battle against Lambert. In addition, her shoes that should have been wet from the water were dry for some reason. Although the chair de Million sat on looked seemed to be made of a conglomeration of numerous white-colored materials, upon closer inspection, it was evidently composed of human skeletons. The water around the chair had a different, bluish tint too. Welcome. Lambert can even though I went out of my way to change the theme of the passage, you didn't seem to like it. Demillion whistled a little as she drank a mysterious liquid from the cup in her hand, and then dropped the cup on the floor. Lambert remained silent as he readied his stance with his sword. He had no intention to speak with Demillion. Lambert observed the room, trying to grasp any suspicious movements of mana. This place was De Million's home ground after all. Although Lambert had expected various traps to greet him along the way to this place, in the end, he didn't meet anything that served to hinder him. But it only raised his vigilance even further. That bluish water is different from the reese it's literally a lump of mana. As a result of inspecting the surroundings, Lambert drew a conclusion that the blue-colored water below De Million's chair was rather special. But since that's all he knew, he couldn't just recklessly charge toward Demillion. The off-color water spread into a large area that's why it would be a checkmate against Lambert if that water turned out to be a hidden weapon. Lambert set his stance with his great sword, bracing his legs, and then leaped out at once. You're aware that my common sense is greatly distorted from the norm, right? That's why I created those illusions after so many years of research to narrow the gap doing that kind of thing itself isn't that important for me. But even though I showed those large-scale illusions after inviting you to this place, your reaction truly surprised me, I mean. I prepared all of this just for you. Then, how about you undo the illusion that you cast upon yourself? Fufufu, busted. How even someone like me wants to look like a lovely girl. So don't you think that it's rude for you to ask me to undo the illusion that's exactly the reason why Aurelia didn't choose you back the whelp? Demillion theatrically covered her lips with her hand while sending a sidelong glance at Lambert, trying to provoke him. However, her cheap provocation did little to incite Lambert, and she tilted her head to the side with a bored expression. In that moment, Demillion's figure suddenly became limp the color of her body and clothes became darker as the contour of her body became even hazier. Her body dissolved, mixing with the blue water underneath her, leaving only her head. Not stopping at that, even the skin of her head peeled off as if it was melting, leaving only a black skull. That water and her sticky body a slime variation, huh? Demillion's true form was that of a grotesque figure composed of slime and a black skull. A pair of huge gauntlets suddenly broke through the ceiling, landed right at Demillion's side. Your reason for researching slime is to create armor to protect your real body, huh? That's right, my head is my weakness. After all, no need to test it because you'll experience it's my first hand I'm kind, right? I mean, I'm even telling you about my weak point. Demillion spread her metal arms and then pointed at the black skull floating in the slime's body. In addition, I won't attack your head, the important place that keeps most of your vital mana I'll start with your feet, and then your arms your abdomen your chest I'll slowly pulverize it till nothing but your head remains. Demillion closed in on Lambert with a speed that seemed unfitting for her large body and then stretched out her metal arms toward him. 
Lambert kicked her arm and then used the recall from his kick to circle around toward Demillion's side. He swung his greatsword to crush the black skull inside of the slime body. But then, his greatsword suddenly slowed down when it was about to reach the black skull. Such viscosity. Nevertheless, Lambert added more power into his swing and struck the black skull. But the skull just doved down into the center of the slime body, as if to disperse the power behind Lambert's strike. That strike was packed with considerable power, but it seemed that Demillion's slime body could neutralize even that force. TCH Though he tried to extract his great sword, it ended up covered in sticky mucus that wouldn't come off. Meanwhile, Demillion's metal arm punched him and sent him flying back along with his great sword. As expected, a pure organ is tough, indeed your body would have turned into a bloody mess by now if you had living flesh. Lambert had confirmed in their first fight that Demillion's black skull was a tough one. There was no doubt that Lambert's previous attack was strong enough to crush Demillion's black skull, if not for the slime's protection. In addition to the slime's protection, she was also equipped with a pair of super heavy metal fists. See that I've honed this for two hundred years, now I'm invincible. You told me before, right in an unknown fight between a swordsman and wizard, the swordsman will definitely come out on top and that's true since you managed to kill me. But how about now, I wonder? Demillion approached Lambert, while gloating in a shrill voice both of her heavy metal fists clenched. After that, she launched a series of consecutive blows at an unimaginable speed. Take that, and that, and that. Ha 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 ha. Till how long do you think you can escape from my attack? Tl or er 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 her consecutive attacks created a giant pillar of water, destroying the floor. The power behind the consecutive attacks just now was extremely terrifying to the point that even a troll would be reduced to mere mincemeat in a moment. Lambert kept dodging the giant metal fists, using his great sword to redirect the blow from her right fist to the floor. He calmly dodged the more simple attack from the left fist launched an attack toward the back of the metal hand to test its durability, and then used the recoil to leap out of the range of the onslaught of attacks. So, you spent two hundred years killing so many adventurers in this labyrinth just to make this junk. Lambert sent a glare at Demillion's skull while firing his miasma at full throttle. Although Demillion turned silent as if she was surprised by Lambert's remark, the shape of her mouth crooked upward as if sneering at Lambert. Even if we scoured the entire Warimia continent, you're the only one who'd dare to say those words to me it's truly regrettable that the current you is completely dancing in the palm of my hand yet still tries to provoke me. The two heavy, metal hands entwined together and swung downward at Lambert. Though Lambert managed to dodge the attack, the hands rose again and went after Lambert. Act 129 Lord of Underground Labyrinth Chapter 29 Lord of Underground Labyrinth The two heavy, metal hands entangled and swung downward onto Lambert. Lambert dodged that attack with a back step. The hands smashed the floor where Lambert stood just a moment ago. Though Lambert leaped back as if flicked, he still managed to do a 360-degree somersault, landing with beautiful posture on the ground. I guess I've got to think of them as a pair of golem subspecies but then, their power is the real deal. The heavy lump of metal hands floated again, and then went straight toward Lambert. Where's your cockiness from before one of four demon generals, or should I call you, Lambert the Betrayer? You of all people can do nothing but focus on defending since a while ago. Demillion's unique voice taunted as she chased Lambert. I can't even attack properly. Lambert opened some distance between them as he kept his grip on the sword. Seeing that, Demillion launched an all-out attack with her two metal hands. She untangled her hands, using them alternately for an all-out attack straightening its fingers. She fired a piercing beam and tested various other techniques. Although Lambert dodged every attack, it wouldn't be strange if any one of those heavy metal hands caught him. 
Sure enough, your agility is quite abnormal added to that element is your courage any run off the mill swordsman would have long since trembled in fear before me and lost their will to fight yes, although this is enjoyable, you also know that both of us can't do this forever, right let's see how you handle this. The hands then split into an upper part and bottom part. The lower one dug into the floor while the upper one came toward Lambert, destroying the ceiling in the process. Now, he couldn't just focus on the two hands, he had to split his attention between the hands coming from different directions, the debris from the ceiling, and the unstable scaffolding. Hi, Awea! Lambert raised his great sword, swinging it toward the hand that came from above. The hand then stretched its fingers and pinched Lambert's great sword. Lambert stepped back, using his momentum to pull the great sword that got pinched by the metal hand's fingers. He did his best to get away from the metal hand, despite the risk of crumbling his own stance. But even the slight wavering of his stance could be fatal in this kind of battle. This is the end, Lambert can now you can't even swing your sword properly due to my special skill, both hand, well, I mean, look at this slime armor your slashing attack is useless against this armor and even if you try shockwave to attack me, it will barely hurt me frankly speaking, you're too reckless. Charging into my nest without making any preparation. The two hands charging relentlessly toward Lambert whose stance had crumbled. The right hand moved in a complex pattern, shifting its fingers bit by bit. The left hand waited for Lambert to make an opening while clenched in a fist. Demillion was controlling the right hand to bait Lambert to leave himself open meanwhile preparing the left hand to strike as soon as he let his guard down it was ready to unleash its most powerful force. Demillion's aim was to destroy Lambert's lower half. Lambert, who ran away from the right hand's relentless assault up until now, was actually being guided toward the most suitable location for the left hand to launch its most powerful attack. The left hand then mercilessly fired toward Lambert. This is the... I've been waiting for you to do this. Lambert adjusted his footwork in that instant, dropped his waist, and then fixed his stance on top of the unstable rubble. Lambert switched directions and guided the orbit of the incoming heavy metal left fist with the flat side of his great sword, making it crash against the right hand that was about to catch him. It was the counter skill that he used before on the first flesh golem, heaven and earth great shift. The two metal hands crashed against the wall, a collision so great that it shook the entire room. Lambert didn't let go of that chance, and struck the two hands thrice with his great sword. His three strikes destroyed the surface of the hands, scattering numerous metal splinters. Lambert was, in fact, the one who was baiting Demillion by deliberately crumbling his own stance to bait her to make a big move. Amazing, truly amazing. That skill has evolved even further compared to when its own creator, Quixote, used it, right? but that degree of damage is far from Eno. No, this is the end you're too focused on chasing me. Eh? The reason why Lambert went through the trouble of running away to only instantly fix his crumbled stance was not because he was looking for an opportunity to use heaven and earth great shift. He baited Demillion to keep chasing after him, thus separating Demillion from her metal hands. To be exact, even Lambert's defensive stance with his great sword was a bait to lure Demillion to go all out in her attacks. The action of baiting Demillion to attack him with her heavy metal hands, her greatest protection, was not a simple matter. However, Lambert pretending to be gradually cornered gave an illusion to Demillion that the next attack was enough to end him, and thus she was baited to chase after him. Too late at this distance, my sword can crush your head even faster than the time you need to recall your hands. Is this your aim from the very beginning but unfortunately, your sword can't even pierce through my slime armor. Shall we try it then? The next moment, Lambert had arrived right in front of Demillion. he swung his great sword at her slime body with a series of slashes that couldn't be seen with the naked eye. He sent the series of eight superhuman slashes to Demillion in a mere second. 
the blade of his sword gouged into the slime body. However, Demillion's real body, her black skull, was moving inside the slime's body along the directions of Lambert's slashes, greatly reducing their effectiveness. Splendid sword skill, but it's futile now. It's my turn. The metal hands that finished its self-repair then punched toward Lambert's back. After confirming the incoming metal hands with a backward glance, Lambert stabbed his great sword into the floor. Then, he plunged his hands into the slime's body, catching Demillion's skull. Eh? His eight slashes from before greatly reduced the slime's viscosity, thus allowing Lambert to reach his hands in. Lambert then pulled out Demillion's black skull and held it in his hands. I'm possible. The power of mere undead like you shouldn't be able to penetrate this slime body. Yo, lo. Lambert's arm then slammed Demillion's black skull on the wall. The slime body, having lost its master, crumbled down and mixed with the water below. I'm possible. Lambert continued on by pulling out his sword from the floor and using it to quickly slash at Demillion's defenseless skull. Every single one of his slashes struck Demillion's skull, hitting their mark perfectly. With the wall behind her, Demillion couldn't escape from Lambert's relentless attacks. Lambert's downward slash buried Demillion's skull in the floor. Naturally, Lambert increased his attack speed even further. GHS stop it, Lambert can write. I've some useful information for you how about that will you put down your sword for the time being and have a nice chat with me. The weight of his heavy organ armor compounded with Lambert's attack created a fine crack in Demillion's black skull. What's the matter a hundred strikes can't even crush your skull, huh still ways to go, huh? Lambiert. Demillion's black skull suddenly changed its shape. Numerous thorns grew from its surface and then whipped toward Lambert. That change happened in just a moment and had the potential to change the tide of battle as soon as it got deployed. If her metal hands golem were her first shield, and the slime armor that could absorb shock-type attack from close range was her second shield, her real body's extreme toughness was her third shield. Lastly, in case the previous three shields failed to protect her, she had the final shield in the form of countless black tentacles, which were almost impossible to dodge. Those tentacles would continuously chase after its target they were both extremely fast and nearly impossible to avoid. This was even more so the case in a narrow place like this labyrinth. When Demillion said that she had gained immortality, she didn't mean that she gained an immortal body she was referring to those four nearly invincible defensive mechanisms. Even if she lost the first three defense mechanisms, her last line of defense would guarantee her safety. But this was only the case if she were fighting against the average warrior. This is the end. Lambert swung down his great sword again. Demillion's tentacles stopped moving and fell as Lambert's last attack crushed her skull. Act 130 Lord of Underground Labyrinth? Chapter 30 Lord of Underground Labyrinth? Demillion's black skull was thrown against the wall, and then it fell on the floor. Demillion's skull looked up at Lambert as it went into spasm. Two should have been able to live for eternity gaining the truth of the world only a few hundred years is far from enough why just why did this happen to me I gained a body that should have been able to live till the end of time and yet no m why was to me wisdom. Lambert silently set a stance gripping his great sword and pointing its tip toward the fine crack on Demillion's skull. L. Lambert. Kaling me would be the greatest loss for the kingdom of Regios. Why you can still save me please in the bin number 23,568 inches that passage. My bad I smashed it when I chased after you. Lambert had destroyed quite a few medicine containers and flesh golems when he chased Demillion but he couldn't remember the number written on the medicines. He was already too lazy to listen to Demillion's rambling. My, even if it's only my thesis, to out. Lambert swung his great sword to the side. The skull was once again struck against the wall, 
and this time split into two halves. That mysterious fella finally died for sure this time, huh? When Lambert said those words, the eyes in the upper half of the skull let out a bright red light. My bad, Lambert Conwell, I guess you should understand the situation by now, right? Demillion continued on as Lambert relieved his stance. Don't worry currently, my mana, which also contained my will, has been dissolved I'm currently diverting the leakage for energy maintenance the current me has lost everything nevertheless. My deepest apologies that the result of our battle will turn out the same as last time. After Demillion finished her sentence, the underground labyrinth began to vibrate. So please die alongside me, Lambert can you see? I'm the kind of woman who easily gets lonely granting this last wish of mine should be a piece of cake for you, right? Demillion's final laugh resounded inside the room. Lambert inserted his great sword into the skull's eye socket. They might leave this floor earlier than you, but you've got to catch up to them before it's too late, you know. Lambert silently destroyed what was left of Demillion's skull, completely pulverizing it. Maybe because it had used up almost all of its mana for the last tentacle's attack, Demillion's skull lost its toughness from before. Her skull turned into ash and scattered on the surface of the water. A fragment of the ceiling fell right beside Lambert. Lambert lowered his sword as he glared upward. The underground labyrinth was on the verge of collapse. I need to catch up with them as soon as possible, Hermagino. Fiona should be able to save herself. Lambert turned around and ran through the tunnel he came from. On the way back, an undead that should have been inside of its cage was blocking his path. Out of my way! Lambert fired his miasma full of killing intent toward the undead. The undead shoulder trembled it then stepped back while raising its guard against Lambert. Hiya! Without even stopping, Lambert swung his sword and cut the undead as he passed right beside it. Keeping his guard up for pieces of falling ceiling, Lambert destroyed the undead however. He couldn't help but look back when he heard a loud sound from behind. There he saw that the pair of metal hands was still chasing after him, even though its master, Demillion, had been killed. However, the accuracy of its movements had fallen considerably compared to when Demillion personally controlled it. Maybe because it had lost its auto-repair function, the surface of the left hand was riddled with cracks, and its pinky finger was missing too. Even so, it didn't seem to affect its speed or destructive power making it even more troublesome for Lambert since he wanted to avoid fighting inside the collapsing labyrinth. Worst of all, in the previous battle, the top priority of those hands was to protect Demillion. Now that they'd lost their purpose, the hands might resort to anything it wasn't hard to imagine what kind of destructive power they would unleash to kill Lambert. What a stubborn fella. Lambert leaped toward the approaching right hand. However, the left hand arrived faster than he thought, so Lambert struck the wall with his great sword to dodge the sudden attack. The left hand struck the place where Lambert would have been a moment ago. That strike gouged deeply into the floor. Lambert used the left hand to jump high in the air, raised his great sword overhead, and then pierced its blade into the fissure in the ceiling. He kicked the ceiling and, making full use of his heavy armor, pinned down the left hand upon landing on top of it. Lambert got away from the left hand as soon as he did so, the ceiling he kicked a moment ago collapsed, crashing right on top of the left hand and skewering it in a rain of shrapnel. The left hand was buried under the rubble. The remaining right hand came after Lambert, but it was no big deal for Lambert who could face two at the same time. After all, the most annoying thing about the two hands was its seamless combination attack. Using both hands, Lambert grasped the blade of his sword tightly and swung it like a bat, aiming for the right hand. Lambert's great sword was custom made with special alloy for the four demon generals. Just like their armor, it was far heavier than it looked. This was especially so for the slightly heavier hilt part, since it was mixed with a lot of organ. In fact, 
The hilt was intentionally made that way to prevent its user from getting overwhelmed by the extremely heavy sword. That's why attacking with the sword guard, which was also part of the hilt, would cause terrifying damage due to the centrifugal force behind the blow. But, it was only possible in theory. Not just anyone could perform that superhuman feat since one wrong move would make the user lose balance due to the overwhelming centrifugal force of the great sword. Only if that someone had talent and raw strength rivaling Lambert could they have the chance to master this extremely powerful method of attack. He swung down the sword's guard toward the right hand. This one attack was enough to destroy the metal coating of the right hand, scattering it around the passage, and one of its fingers was ripped off, flying off in an entirely different direction. But that alone was far from ending their battle. His eight slashes in a single second relentlessly pulverized the metal right hand. Ha-ha-ha-wee-ya. Lambert continued on, even after he pulverized the right hand until it lost all of its fingers. It no longer had the mana source to protect its physical form. The right hand that received one of Lambert's most powerful strikes was thrown back, nailed on the wall behind it, and buried under the rubble. Act 131 Lord of Underground Labyrinth Chapter 31 Lord of Underground Labyrinth While Lambert fought to the death against the Metal Hands Golem, Fiona and Co. clashed with the people wearing Dragon's Enchanted Metal Uniforms on the second floor of the labyrinth. A man with bandages covering his face glared at them with his narrow, squinted left eye. His visage basically screamed, I'm a bad guy! The mummy man blocked Fiona and Co., who were heading toward the first floor they were just about to reach the base of the stairs to reach their destination. Out of our way! You know what's happening in this place right now, right? Lloyd shouted at the mummy man. It was just as Lloyd had said Ain Saz's underground labyrinth was on the verge of collapse. Although they couldn't hear the fight ensuing between Lambert and Demillion way back on the fourth floor, they could guess what was happening due to the abnormal condition of the labyrinth. Huge tremors shook the foundation, massive cracks spread across the walls like snaking wounds, and large chunks of the ceiling broke away and crashed to the ground. These facts were enough to convince them about the danger of staying inside of the labyrinth. Of course I know. But you shall not pass. Use your strength to convince me otherwise. The mummy man set his stance while goading them. His weapon was an irregularly shaped sword. Still following your duty, huh? Let me tell you this, then your leader, Titan, is dead I've no idea what your plan is, but this is the end for you guys. Fiona shouted at the mummy man. But the mummy man didn't budge, even after hearing that. Master's death aside, the situation is undoubtedly strange but that's even more reason for me to not let you guys pass this point otherwise. The Earl's gonna kill me. After finishing his sentence, the mummy man smirked at Fiona and Co. with his slitted eyes. Moreover, seeing three frantic youngsters unable to escape the collapse makes me excited and I'll still have enough time to leave this place after I'm done playing with you guys. Fiona and Co. were rendered speechless. The mummy man smacked his lips, laughing in glee at the situation. Hoopsie, how rude of me, of all people, to forget to introduce myself. My name is Juglius Z. Derek. What's with that face? Don't you guys want to know the name of your killer? Assuming there was no avoiding this battle, Lloyd promptly readied himself. This guy tasked with intercepting anyone going from the second floor to the first floor doesn't seem like a big deal. Let's kick his ass. Lloyd then lunged toward Juglius. Fiona and Lily were following behind, slightly confused about the situation. Juglius lowered his stance until he was about to hit the floor. The tip of his uniquely shaped sword was positioned parallel to his head, pointing at Lloyd and Co. T.L. Gatatsu. That stance was a ruse, Lloyd couldn't help but think so. In regards to the Juglius house, it was an infamous underground family of assassins every member was an assassin, hitman, or at the very least, a first-rank adventurer. 
The family was also notorious for their brutality. Even from their women and children anyone who knew even a bit about the darkness of society would tremble upon the mention of their name. In order to not stand out, Juglius had a proper job as an adventurer. Not even his fellow guild members knew about his family. However, his skill and competence were second only to Titan, Dragon's Enchanted Metal, as guild master. The reason why he volunteered himself to guard the stairs was for his own entertainment, so that he could torture and kill anyone who tried to leave. Ever since he was a child, he loved to observe humans as they fell into despair. Take Thio Idoai Thai. Lloyd's sword pierced Juglius' head that was lowered so close to the ground. Or so Lloyd thought. But the blade of his sword broke before it hit its target and fell on the floor. Wah! Smashing giant? As first swing. Juglius smirked as he said those words. The strangely shaped sword in Juglius' hands was called Smashing Giant? It was a strange sword with uneven ridges spanning its blade. It was a sword that, true to its name, specialized in smashing the other party's weapon by utilizing its unique shape and the power of the opponent, TL Sword Breaker. It was a weapon that required extreme power to control, but every single user of Smashing Giant was an undisputedly top-class warrior. And facing that sword master was an amateur who didn't even realize how his beloved sword was destroyed. A total beginner. The Smashing Giant? S ability to break both the heart and the weapon of its wielder's opponent was fitting for his sadistic nature. Lloyd. Fiona tackled Lloyd to the side, opening some distance from Juglius. Fiona immediately charged toward Juglius, throwing her sword sheath at him. Juglius' sword knocked it easily aside. However, as soon as he was distracted, Fiona entered Juglius' range. Juglius received Fiona's attack with ease and sent her flying back. Fiona didn't dare to close in again and chose to keep her distance from Juglius. My sword is made from durable materials, merlup, enchanted copper, that kind of flimsy sword will. Fiona then realized that her sword's blade was covered with numerous cracks. And no way. There's nothing that this, smashing giant, can't break no matter how durable your sword and courage. They're nothing more than toothpicks in front of me now then. Let's see what you can do with that broken weapon of yours show me your face in despair. Smashing any kind of sword I see, truly an intriguing weapon. The voice that interrupted Juglius' speech was followed by heavy, resounding footsteps, TL's shadow moon. Lambert had arrived. The undead general had already set his stance, ready to enter combat at the slightest provocation. Lambert San. None of them are dead or Sama will be really angry if he hears good grief. Just what in the world are the guild master and the others doing down there to miss them all? Juglius heaved a sigh and then focused his attention on Lambert. He had never met Lambert before. He could tell that Lambert was a sword master who wore full plate armor. Organ. Thanks to his vast weaponry knowledge, Juglius could instinctively feel the weight of Lambert's armor. But he half doubted his own intuition since it was literally impossible for a human to wear full plate armor composed of pure organ. The first reason was its rarity. Even an alloy with a tiny percentage of organ in it could fetch a hefty price. The second reason was its weight. It was a type of super heavy metal, so that's why pure organ made armament was deemed impractical. For this reason, a man who came closer with such ease while wearing a lump of organ made armor was nothing but the devil incarnate. Juglius could only look at Lambert with a dumbfounded face. He finally got a grip on himself after he saw Lambert's figure with a loud war cry. Juglius swung, smashing giant, to his side, holding it horizontally, fully prepared to attack Lambert's great sword. This was a counter designed to destroy his opponent's sword by trapping it in the uneven part of his sword's blade, using his opponent's own strength to destroy their own weapon. 
Juglius could tell the difference in skill between him and Lambert, so he quickly switched to a counter stance. The Z de Rake's blood in him, which always came out victorious, guided Juglius toward his biggest chance of victory. The dull, metallic sound of their swords clashing against each other resounded as soon as the battle began. The smashed blade fell on the floor. But the smile on Juglius' face was no more. Impossible. The smashed sword was, smashing giant? Itself. Lambert swung his sword dozens times, crushed Juglius' sword as a result. Smashing all swords sounds like a big fat lie to me. Yo, lo. Juglius kept swinging the broken, smashing giant at Lambert while letting out a maddening cry. Lambert's first swing destroyed the hilt of Juglius' sword and then continued on to split Juglius' body right in half. Lambert returned his sword to its sheath and turned around to see the trio. What's the matter? Let's get out of here. This building is about to collapse. Act 132 Earl Aubuck Chapter 32 Earl Aubuck When Lambert and co entered Ainsa's underground labyrinth, Germain, the guild master of Spirit's Dusk, went alone to the company that sponsored his guild. They were the ones who gave the harvesting commission. He wanted to talk with the other party about moving Spirit's Dusk, a space to another city, and whether they would keep the contract or not. Germain had been using his position as one of the guild masters in Ainsa's city to investigate Earl Albach, the region's feudal lord. But he stopped his investigation immediately, judging that it was too dangerous to continue due to the dark rumors surrounding the Earl that he discovered with a mere cursory investigation. He was originally unwilling to halt, but upon hearing Fiona and Co's story about Cradle, an adventurer of the Dragon's Enchanted Metal, Guild, he was forced to reconsider as to not involve unrelated people in his problems. Germain turned around when he came close to Ainsa's back street. He noticed that someone was following him it appeared that they were planning to kidnap him when he entered the back alley. Since how long have you guys been following mites about time you come out from your hiding place? A man appeared from the corner as if to answer Germain's question. It was a man with a stubbly beard and bluish-purple hair. That man had a rather slovenly appearance compared to his well-ordered clothing. In spite of his handsome face, he clearly lacked any semblance of ambition. He carried two swords on his back and another one strapped to his waist. Who are you someone related to Earl Albach? The man just shrugged his shoulders with a bored look on his face upon hearing Germain's question. My bad, I've no intention to introduce myself to a small fry like you. Suddenly sending an assassin like this to kill me, it seems the Earl is far more of a scaredy cat than I thought. Germain drew his long sword and readied himself to fight. To think that I've been marked since quite a while ago well, I just need to defeat you and lay low after that. Too late if I'm not wrong, your subordinates were exploring the underground labyrinth, right? How did you know that? After asking that question, Germain realized that Earl Aubach might have made his move faster than he expected. He thought that it was only his life at risk, but he never expected that the Earl would stoop so low as to aim for his subordinates' lives too. And most of all, the company that was partnered with the Spirit's Dusk Guild also acted as the Earl's spy. In short, the whole Ainsa's city was like a nest, mired in Earl Aubach's spiderweb to catch any who dare oppose him. Doing something like entering the nest was asking for death. None of them should be alive by now well, I've no interest in dead men anyway. W.Y. They've nothing to do with this. They might have nothing to do with this matter with the Earl, but we've got no idea how much they know about your investigation into the Earl. That's why Crush M. All is the best choice for him not involved in this matter, ha? Huh? You're too naive, aren't you? It didn't mean Germain was too naive to not consider this outcome. If one had to guess, this failure was caused because he underestimated Earl Aubach's cruelty. The Lord was quite thorough, nipping his problems in the bud. 
I've to say that Earl Albach has investigated your background you might have forgotten about your house name. But surely, that weak house's lazy son won't forget about his enmity toward Earl Albach, right even though you'd be alright if you forgot about your past. And yet, you chose to poke the hornet's nest. Germain's background was exactly as that man had said he was the second son of a barren house that, because of their hostility toward Earl Albach, was wiped out on false charges. He, the second son who ran away from the house to become an adventurer before the age of ten, never returned. For this reason, he wasn't dragged into the conflict that resulted in his entire family's execution. But Germain, who vowed to himself that he'd clear his family's name to repay their kindness in raising him until he was nine years old, set up an adventurer's guild in Ainsaz City and began his investigation. Germain drew his sword and then stabbed toward his foe. Give it up you probably think that you can do something about the situation since you're fairly powerful. Right don't get cocky fighting small fry like you will only dull my blade. The man spoke with an emotionless voice. Surprisingly, the man didn't act cocky. He was simply stating the truth to Germain. That man had absolute confidence in his own power. Even so, that didn't mean that Germain would just obediently let the man capture him. He maintained his stance as he kept glaring at the man. Hi, H. Guess I've no choice, ha. Huh? The man shouted. He dashed toward Germain while swiftly drawing his sword. A metallic clank resounded as their swords crossed. So heavy and swift too though I barely managed to counter his attack, this man he is clearly holding back. Despite crossing swords with Germain, the other man did not flinch in the slightest. His face remained expressionless. He seemed effortless with every movement as if he couldn't care less about what happened, and yet there was no hesitation each attack was as swift and ferocious as the last. Despite having such a twig-like body. Hey, I'm not done yet. The man raised his hand and then swiftly slashed down at Germain. G-U-H. Germain barely managed to raise his sword to block the attack from above. Before Germain could regain his stance, another attack quickly followed, aiming for his head. Germain barely managed to dodge that third slash. He tried to counterattack, but he realized that man had been ready to launch his fourth strike on Germain. All Germain could do was parry that fourth strike. I thought he was all talk but it turned out he was a master I need to end this fight before this man goes all out. Germain changed his tactics, focusing entirely on dodging the mysterious man's attacks, while looking for an opening to take advantage of. Germain analyzed the mysterious man's eyes to anticipate the trajectory of his next strike. Then, he noticed something. That mysterious man still had that bored look plastered on his face there was almost no ripple in his eyes. And instead of looking at Germain, the mysterious man's eyes were fixed on a location far behind Germain. Such sharp and terrifying swordplay even without looking at me just like a puppet. The sound of clashing metal resounded as their sword met. Germain slashed his sword to the side to parry the mysterious man's strike, and then, he noticed the truth behind his opponent's bizarre swordplay. And no way, that sword is. Took you long enough to notice, how huh, this is a special move created by the sword master Belgane, which was then inherited by his eldest son Alrex and passed down to his descendants it's known as the 49 Sword Reign, and you're already under the downpour. The most important thing in a sword fight was how much someone could take advantage of their opponent's moves. As long as someone could cram all of the sword skills into their head, it was a simple matter to gain an upper hand against any kind of swordsman. You're right let's split for the time being since I want to meet Germain as soon as possible to confirm something. Uh, why yes. Old man, the way you treat Fiona is clearly better than me, right? Lloyd was clearly vexed about the difference between Fiona's treatment and his own. Lambert turned around as if he hadn't heard Lloyd's complaints. W.Y. are you guys the only ones who come back in one piece? 
The officers who managed the adventurers entering Ainsaz's underground labyrinth gasped while glaring daggers at Lambert. However, that officer faltered and shut his mouth as soon as Lambert's gaze locked on him. Although I felt that something was fishy even before entering the labyrinth it turned out that this was truly a trap laid out by Earl Albach. Lambert drew such a conclusion after he saw the officer's reaction upon seeing him. Earl Albach was clearly targeting Lambert ever since the incident in the village. However, Lambert was delighted by this development since the big shot finally took the bait and made the first move. The officers fell to their rear when Lambert sent his weakened miasma toward them they were already too scared to get up. High 3 I Scared sh asterisk atlas, they had long since lost their will to fight Lambert, the man who overpowered them with his aura alone. I have decided that it's time for me to meet face to face with the Earl, so get up and tell me the direction to his home. W.W. What the? Lambert sent a sidelong glance toward the officers as he ran ahead of Fiona and Co. toward the Spirit's Dusk? Headquarters. Act 134 Earl Albach? Chapter 34 Earl Albach? Lambert returned to the Spirit's Dusk? Headquarters ahead of Fiona and Co. However, despite its location in a deserted back alley, he expected there to be people inside, but he couldn't sense anyone inside. And yet, the ground was flattened by so many footprints. Upon arriving in Spirit's Dusk? S. Headquarters which was the rented upper floor of Ferry's stove, he found out that the wall and the windows of the building had been destroyed. He had no doubt that this incident was instigated by the Earl. So, he took control of the base, meanwhile ambushing the members of the guild it seems he's quite thorough. Despite his nonchalant tone, Lambert was burning with rage inside. He was infuriated at anyone who dared to harm, spirits dusk, and its members they were the only ones who accepted someone as suspicious as him. Fiona, Lloyd, and Lily would surely be saddened when they saw the tragic state of their base. In addition, he felt disgusted with Earl Albuck's vicious yet meticulous acts toward Spirit's Dusk. Even though he had never met the Earl in person, he had no doubt that that person was a scoundrel, through and through. I guess further investigation is unnecessary raid his base immediately. He had no idea what happened between Spirit's Dusk and Earl Aubach in the past, but he deduced a few reasons that could have led to this event. After all, this sort of scenario had happened time and time again throughout history. Lambert was no stranger to it if a man of power wanted to eliminate someone, he would take aim at the person who posed the most threat. Spirit's Dusk? S. Guildmaster, Germain, was secretly investigating Nero Aubach's evil deeds. Germain himself had hinted to Lambert that he wanted to leave the city. TL Chapter 16 Maybe the reason, Dragon's Enchanted Metal, targeted the much weaker, Spirit's Dusk, was because Earl Aubach wanted to seal Germain's mouth forever. Lambert entered, Spirit's Dusk, Guild's Room. He didn't expect to meet any other members of Spirit's Dusk other than the ones he knew since it was such a small guild. The room was just the right size to fit an office for the guild master, an information desk, and two other adventurers. Is the guild master, Germain, the reason behind this? No, the area around this place might be rather deserted, but for a city this size it would be much better if they ambushed Germain when he was alone. He didn't find any corpses inside the guild's room. Although he had no idea whether Germain was kidnapped or had managed to escape, either way was fine for Lambert because that meant, at the very least, Germain was alive for the time being. He opened the door to Germain's office. The shelves had been ransacked, stray documents littered the floor, and drawers were left haphazardly hanging open. In this sort of situation, Robbery can be ruled out since it seems the culprits were searching for something. Upon muttering so, Lambert heard a voice from outside. It seems there are still some remaining. 
The door of the room was suddenly kicked open as a slender man in a black coat made his grand entrance. Oh, it seems they left someone here as a lookout, huh? Without skipping a beat, Lambert drew his great sword and swung it. His great sword repelled a silver needle that was fired from a gap in the window at the same time. He took a sweeping strike at the man in the doorway hit with the full force of that attack. The man was thrown back and crashed against the wall a large spurt of blood spilled out from the resulting wound in his chest. Lambert picked up the silver needle and then sent a piercing glare at the hidden assailant. One person distracted him, while another person attacked with a hidden weapon from his blind spot. A cheap trick like that wouldn't work against Lambert. You people are probably on standby to kill or kidnap anyone who returns I know you're hiding over there come out and accept your fate like a good child. Lambert threw the needle through the window, back where it came from. Another man's hand grabbed the needle in midair, leaping through the window to enter the room. That man wore similar black clothing from head to toe he was quite tall, though not as tall as Lambert. Breaking the windows as if following the previous person, for more people appeared from their body shapes, Lambert could deduce that two were men of similar build, one was taller than the other two, while the remaining one was a woman. That number of people was the number he sensed from earlier in short, there was no one else waiting to ambush him. What a surprise to think that, Spirit's Dusk, has such a powerful member though I received news that you destroyed our main force while conquering the labyrinth. I never expected that you could detect our presences since when did you sense us. They seem to be proud of their ability to erase their presences. The tall man who fired the needle seemed to be their leader. He was enraged at how easily Lambert not only located them but also defended himself against their prided silver needle and killed one of his subordinates. I felt five malicious intents before I entered this building. The tall man's forehead wrinkled at Lambert's explanation. Lambert's reply only worked to further enrage him. However, Lambert was just stating the truth. They might have skillfully disguised their presences, but there was no way they could escape Lambert's undead perception. Now tell me, who are you people? Fine, consider this as a present before you die we're the Dark Guild, Dark Knight's Short Sword, or should I say, we are the infamous Shadow of Ainsaz, the Hidden Dark Guild, the Earl's Private Force, Dark Knight's Short Sword. I am their leader, Halzer don't think that we're cowards for ganging up on you. We have our own pride. The one named Halzard crossed his arms. There were four silver needles in each of his hands, inserted in between the fingers. Upon seeing that, the other three also drew their weapons. Private Army, you're quite a chatterbox, huh? Assassination isn't our only speciality. We fight as a team when we face people hidden in addition. We also have our pride, seeing as you so easily threw back our dark weapon. Lambert didn't understand what that man meant there was a pregnant silence. Running away after we blatantly challenge you will only make us lose face be surprised. Now that you're trapped in our battle formation, this silver needle will be the end of you. Halesard sprung into action while spewing such confident words. The other three also followed in a similar fashion. Clinging onto the ceiling, Halesard fired all eight of his silver needles. At the same time, the other three leaped at Lambert, each from a different direction. You bastard, what the hell have you been blabbering about up till now? Lambert swung his great sword thrice. His sword easily bisected the ceiling and desk like they were made of tofu. Two of the three assailants were also struck by the great sword the last one couldn't withstand Lambert's overwhelming killing intent and barely got away from the deadly slashes. The eight silver needles were also scattered around the room, with Lambert pinching the tip of one of the needles. From Hilzard's perspective, he only caught a glimpse of the moment when Lambert's sword hit two of his subordinates. He didn't see how Lambert managed to catch the tip of the silver needle. As such agility. How can you spew such nonsense right now? What? The killing intent I released just now wasn't even a tenth of what I can do when I'm going all out. 
At that moment, Hilzard finally realized that the man he picked a fight with was an abnormal monster. That's Impos. But the scene of Lambert dispatching his subordinates in just a moment convinced Hailzard that Lambert was simply stating the truth. Nevertheless, Hailzard chose to not believe him. Lambert brushed the tip of the silver needle with his armor-clad finger, inspecting it closer. Colorless poison this thing isn't my area of expertise. Lambert held up his arm, preparing to throw the needle. When he threw it, not even Hailzard could anticipate its trajectory. Hailzard's eyes opened wide in terror. The needle pierced through Hailzard's chest and struck the wall behind him. The poison might spread faster if it's stabbed near your heart, rather than waiting for it to circulate. Lambert, who could throw a thin needle until it pierced both the human and wall, was most likely the only one qualified to say those words. Hailzard placed his hand on his chest. A cramped smile contorted on his face as he looked at the blood dripping down his chest he couldn't help but flash a glare at Lambert. Cold beads of sweat dripped down his face. As splendid. Hailzard used the last of his strength to say that word. He then fell forward, the blood from his chest pooling on the floor. Contrary to his job as an assassin, he was a prideful man though I couldn't bring myself to hate him. I'm starting to feel that he wasn't the right fit for this role. Lambert sheathed his sword again after making sure that Hailzard was really dead. He 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 no matter how powerful you are, you're no match for Hector Sam your power might surpass him, but his technique has reached the divine territory remember that you can't escape from Rosima. The one who said those words was the one who dodged one of Lambert's three slashes, the sole woman of Dark Knight's short sword. Oh, so you say that after seeing the difference in our abilities just now. I'll go to the other side first and it's not like Earl Sima would spare me if I return I'll be waiting for you there, after you have suffered a horrifying fate in the land of the living. She was trying to act tough, but it was clear that she was bluffing. Lambert could see just how much she feared Earl Aubach and the man named Hector. Seeing that woman putting more power into her jaw, Lambert quickly struck the side of her head with the sheath of his sword. Buh! A molar and blood flew out from that woman's mouth. There was something like a black stone on top of that molar. Poison for suicide, huh? Lambert crushed that molar as he muttered lightly. The woman trembled in fear, each shiver racking her whole body. Although she did her best to glare at Lambert, her front could barely conceal the overwhelming terror she felt. It was unfathomable the idea that this single man could beat her, and her comrades working together had never even crossed her mind. However, Lambert was a veteran of the eight countries' unification war once long ago. His army was cornered by an army twenty times their size. Moreover, the one who trapped him was from the strongest kingdom at that time. It was the great commander of Madaraku, Aldemia, and their elite subordinates. Lambert was an unstoppable force that day, cutting a path through the enemies and carving a path for his army's victory although he managed to escape that encirclement. Not once did Lambert think that he would have been able to be victorious without the help of his organ. As a result, Although Lambert survived without any injury, none of his subordinates made it out alive. The enemy he faced at that time was both greater in number and more skilled, so it was no wonder that the enemy he faced today was nothing in comparison. Being surrounded by just five members, who were raised in a peaceful era, of a corrupt noble's private army was nothing compared to the hell that Lambert survived in the past. There's nothing you can do against the Earl. Even with all the information I know about him I'm just a disposable pawn who failed my duty even if I wanted, it's not like I could escape from the Earl's eyes. It was just as the woman had said, Earl Albach prioritized safety and profit the most the fate of anyone who dared to oppose the Earl was simply too miserable. There was nothing left for the woman, not her pride as a member of Dark Knight's short sword, or her loyalty to Earl Albach. 
even though Earl Albach took her from that orphanage and raised her as a member of his private army, the hatred she felt toward that man far surpassed her gratitude. In addition, dying under Lambert's blade was far better than returning alive to Earl Albach that was just how much she and her comrades feared that man. She knew better than anyone else that the fate of anyone who dared to betray Earl Albach was simply too pitiful, so much so that death was preferable the reason she knew about this was that she and her comrades were the ones who dirted their hands and handled traitors. And to make matters worse, because she was a woman, who knew what kind of humiliation and hell would be waiting for her. That was why she had to commit suicide before the Earl's other private army came to catch her. But then, Lambert had knocked her only escape clean out of her mouth, the poison being crushed along with her molar. She knew very well how skilled Lambert was with the sword. And if she helped Lambert escape alive, perhaps she could also escape. She was aware how naive that thought seemed, and yet, she could only hope it would come true. As for what I wanted to ask well, I guess there's no point in you detailing all his evil deeds right now just lead me to Earl Aubach's mansion for now. I'll ask more about that guy along the way. Eh? For a moment, the woman couldn't believe what she just heard. Even though she was desperately thinking of a way to escape from the Earl, she never expected that Lambert would choose to march into the Earl's lair on his own. On top of that, she presumed from his words that Lambert, in fact, had no idea where Earl Aubach's mansion was located. She thought that Lambert's plan was way too reckless. Most of Ainsa's citizens knew the location of the Earl's mansion. She wanted to be spared from the fate of being executed as a lesson for what would happen to a traitor. Woman, well I guess it's rude to call you, woman. And we've no time here tell me your name or alias, that's fine too. To am not telling you anything, even if you try to flatter me, I should have told you from the start don't underestimate me. To am trained to endure torture. The woman replied to Lambert, trying her best to glare at him. I see. Lambert discharged his undead's miasma. The inside of the office was instantly overpowered by an atmosphere of pure death. The woman's body was drenched in a cold sweat it was as if her body wanted to suck every last drop of moisture from her being, the terror of absolute death dominating her mind. When she raised her face in fear, the man whose full-plated armor shrouded both his body and expression raised his sword the blade remained sheathed in its scabbard, high in the air. Ah! The woman's eyes locked onto the scabbard while her mouth quivered silently she opened it one moment then closed it the next no matter what she wanted to say, the words would not come out. The next moment, the scabbard swung down before the woman could utter a thing. The heavy, metal scabbard struck its target, and a gust of wind followed in its wake, crushing the woman's head and reaping her life in a single moment. But that was just an optical illusion seen by the woman in fact, she was only hit by the wind pressure while the metal scabbard passed by the side of her face, stopping right before it struck her shoulder. The woman who saw such a scene gasped. Yes, she had barely escaped death. The throbbing of her heart was followed by a sense of oppression, fear, and nausea her mind in tumult. There were no words to describe what she was feeling. I'm in a hurry I won't miss next time. Ayamalamalarmais. Half-conscious the woman unintentionally spewed her real name. Because that was all she could do at that moment. Relief washed over her as Lambert pulled back his sword. Act 136 Earl Albach? Chapter 36 Earl Albach? Earl Albach's mansion was located at the center of Ain Sa's city. Even though the warring era had long passed, the city continued to maintain the ramparts due to this. The center of the city was the safest place to be in case a war broke out. Although it was nothing more than a relic of the past, Lambert considered it a symbol of Earl Albach's shrewd and wary nature. The other side of the rampart was painted a luminescent white, showing off its elegance and style. The building was only two stories high, around 10-12 meters, 
but it was built like a noble castle on top of a vast land. Lambert paused to gaze up at the castle. Now, which path I shall take although almost spit out the location of every secret passage he knew, it'll take too much time meanwhile. I have no idea what kind of suffering Germain has endured while I was interrogating Amel. Amel, the only surviving member of Vero Albox's private army, Dark Knight's short sword, walked in front of Lambert, leading the way when he stopped to look up, she also halted, determining whether she could use this chance to escape. Under duress she had led him this far, but she knew that it was only a matter of time before the guards caught wind of their movements. Earl Albach was currently in the basement of his mansion. In contrast to the gorgeous exterior and public grounds, the basement was dark and gloomy. Most of its rooms were used for storage, but in a musty and often deserted corner, a section had been cordoned off and turned into a torture chamber. Officially, it was for the use of punishing traitors or criminals as determined by the law, however. Its true purpose was as a way for Earl Aubach to sate his sadistic pleasures. The only thing Alma wanted was to be spared from the fate of entering that godforsaken room. But it was already too late for her since she had led Lambert, the fool charging in without a plan, to Earl Aubach's lair, she would be tortured to the brink of death. And yet, on the other hand, Lambert would kill her if she dared to run. Amo, who specialized in agility, knew more than anyone else that she couldn't escape after she witnessed his godlike abilities. Earl Albach's bedroom was directly connected to the torture chamber. I guess I really have no choice. Earl Albach would spare her as long as she killed Lambert. Rather, it would be a feat deserving of praise. Lambert didn't seem to be paying any attention to Amo. Amo slipped her hand into her pocket, grasping a sharp silver needle. I only have one chance. Amo held her breath, pondering where she should stab Lambert with her needle. However, the more she observed, the more she realized that there was no gap in his defenses that she could exploit. The most she could do was stab the joint of his knee, ensuring that he couldn't escape. But even more so, Alma wondered if her silver needle could even kill this man. After all, before her very own eyes, Lambert had proven that he could repel even the silver needles that were thrown by Dark Knight's short sword, S. Leader himself, Halesard. The one who trained Alma in how to use the needles was none other than Halesard she had learned everything she knew from him. If her master, whose skills surpassed her own, couldn't do it, did she even stand a chance where he had failed? Amo's hand was coated in sweat. As she gulped down her nervousness, Lambert turned around to look at her. Amo shuddered and averted her gaze. I tease nothing. Lambert interjected. Hmm, who knows I thought I sensed some killing intent. The moment Amo heard those words, the color drained from her face her body became limp and refused to move. It seemed that deep inside she had already given up on her plan to kill Lambert, even before she grasped the needle. You said that there's a torture chamber in the basement, tell me, where is Earl Albach right now? He's either in his office or the torture chamber. Amal didn't bother lying. There's a high possibility that Germain, along with the other members of Spirit's Dusk, is being held in the torture room. Booty guess I should prioritize the capture of Earl Albach. I just need to kill him to end this mess. Once and for all on the contrary, if I prioritize saving Germain and Co. first, it'll take too much time it'll give Earl Albach a chance to escape. Assassinating Earl Albach is impossible few of those reason were his escape route and secret path for emergencies. But it's also because he's being followed by his guard 24 to 7 you're basically surrounded by those guards as soon as you enter the mansion. As I expected well, since it'll be the same no matter which route we choose, let's just storm the front. Yes, that's re what? With that, Lambert turned around, leaving Alma behind as he walked toward the mansion's front gate. What are you doing come here your job is to guide me through the mansion it'll be troublesome if I get lost. 
And no I mean, I told you that we'll be surrounded as soon as we enter the mansion right. Indeed that's why breaking through the front before the Earl gets the chance to escape is much better than sneaking into the mansion in secret he has the home advantage, after all. Lambert rushed toward the front gate, towing Amal along despite her reluctance. The gatekeeper in front noticed Lambert right away. He grabbed his spear and stabbed its blade toward Lambert. Who are you people? Do you realize that you're barging into Earl Sima's mansion? Lambert's arm moved, grabbing his unsheathed sword and tossing the scabbard toward the gatekeeper. The tip of the scabbard pierced through the gatekeeper's chest, sending him flying back and nailing his body to the wall. G.U.H. Blood gushed from the large wound in the gatekeeper's chest. Even though it seemed like Lambert tossed it lightly, the result was a massive wound for the guard. The gatekeeper never expected that that measly lump of metal would easily break through his sternum, sink into his chest, and still have enough power to send him flying backward, nailing his body to the wall. Of course I know the reason we came here is that Earl, after all. Lambert declared to the gatekeeper, who was on the verge of dying. Soon enough, Almo's prediction came true. The private army of Earl Albach surrounded Lambert. Lambert and Amo were besieged by thirty foes. See, I've told you again and again that you're too reckless. Amo ended up spewing a mouthful of protests at Lambert, completely forgetting about her fear of him. The man in the armor as reported I see a secret forces member Amo is with you did those, dragons enchanted metal, failed to do their job or, you're colluding with those guys well, it doesn't matter either way. The one who welcomed Lambert and Co. was a tall man, whose black hair was swept to the back he stood at the very back of the encirclement. His handsome face did little to hide the cruelty in his darkened eyes. And Malkito. Of all Pio. Amo's eyes opened wide as she glared at Malkito. Maybe because he wasn't interested in Amo anymore. The man named Malkito rubbed his chin while making a gesture, as if taking note of Lambert, and Amal he heaved a sigh with a bored look on his face. Hm just the two of you it seems this will end in a flash, tl yes, for you that is. After observing Lambert for a while, as if to evaluate him, Malkito clapped his hands, drawing everyone's gazes to him. Everyone, how about playing a little game the contents of the game meremphits it? The goal is to tear off the limbs of that idiot intruder and that traitorous woman housed that sound legs or arms. Doesn't matter anyone who presents their limbs will receive a reward from me. The man named Malkito spoke with a sadistic smile on his face. The soldiers surrounding the two laughed raucously upon hearing his words. Malkito Maverin. He was the current leader of Earl Aubach's private army. He was a sadist who loved toying around with his opponent in the middle of a battle, as if it were just a game. Earl Albach gave Malkito preferential treatment, since they were family thus, the latter had no problem with money. This is my chance. You bastard, get back and wait your turn. As soon as they heard Malkito's words, five soldiers sprung at once toward Amal and Lambert, each one aiming for the first kill. This is the end. Amo muttered as she took out her silver needle and prepared to commit a suicide. Lambert pulled out his great sword and swung it lightly. It was just a simple movement, and yet none of the people present could draw their weapons faster than Lambert. The first five who were scrambling at them suddenly stopped moving. Everyone who saw such a scene from nearby felt that something was off they went pale. It was as if the great sword had appeared from nowhere. The next instant, the heads of those five rolled on the ground. Fresh blood spurted from their headless corpses as they fell to the ground, dyeing them in crimson. Um. Witnessing such a scene from the backlands, Malkito gaped, not fully understanding the situation. Just thirty, huh? Lambert stood in front of the frightened soldiers, as he calmly counted how many of them he faced. Once again, he set his stance with his great sword. This will end in a flash, 
indeed for you guys, that is. At a loss for words, Malkito could only stare in silence. Lambert swung his sword for the second time, and then once again as he advanced forward. Each swing reaped the lives of the soldiers who surrounded the two, scattering their flesh and blood on the ground. What are you waiting for? Kill that guy now. I'll reward anyone who can kill him. Kill him now. Malkito's order was in vain. Anyone who dared to get close to Lambert was turned into a decapitated corpse in the next moment. Kill him quickly. We outnumber him. Just surround him and kick him from his blind spot with that stupidly heavy armor, like hell he can get up out of. Malkito shut his mouth before he finished his sentence. Lambert, who wore that stupidly heavy armor, was moving quickly, killing one soldier after another. While Malkito stood dumbfounded before that seemingly impossible scene, the subordinates at his side were killed by Lambert. Color drained from Malkito's face. You will. Uh. Malkito raised a war cry as he slashed at Lambert. Lambert dodged to the side with ease. When he tried to put more strength in his grip and chase after Lambert, Malkito realized that his fingers had already rolled on the ground. Following that realization was a searing pain coursing through his entire body. Aiawa. Mymy fingers. Yeet. Malkito groveled on the ground, picking up his right hand's scattered fingers with his left hand. It was you who encouraged your subordinates to mutilate their opponent for reward, right? Lambert asked the half-crazed Malkito. Tool give you as much money as you want, so fix these quick. Lambert's greatsword bisected Malkito's body from his head to his toes before he could even finish his sentence. As Malkito's blood splattered on his armor, bathing him in a crimson red, Lambert coldly resheathed his sword. Well then, it's only a matter of time before Earl Aubach learns of this Amo. Show me the way. Seeing such a one-sided massacre, Amo felt the power drain from her body she shuddered as her legs gave out, and she collapsed on the ground. The silver needle intended to take her own life had long since fallen from the grasp of her shuddering hands. Act 137 Earl Aubach? Chapter 37 Earl Aubach? Earl Albach and a certain man were meeting in the former's office on the second floor of the mansion. Standing in front of Earl Albach was a tall and slender swordsman. His face was lifeless, and his beard was unshaven. The bluish-purple hair on his head was quite slovenly, and he walked with a slightly hunched back. The two knights escorting Earl Albach glared at the man. The man spared just one glance back with a sidelong gaze and if to say that the two knights were nothing he then turned back to look at Earl Aubach. Earl Aubach laughed while caressing his double chin with his fingers. That's quite an achievement, Hector who'd expect you to easily capture the survivor of the deuce house who's been sticking his nose places it shouldn't be that guy seemed to be a renowned adventurer, and yet you treated him like a baby. The man named Hector listened quietly while scuffing his feet on the ground with a bored look on his face after letting out a huge yum, he replied. Enough with this trivial gratitude, Earl Sama I'll just go back to my room if you just called me here to blather on. The two knight's eyebrows twitched upon hearing Hector's words. Hector! How dare you show such a boorish attitude in front of Albuxama? Earl Albuck waved his hand in dismissal to stop them, still smiling ear to ear at Hector. I don't mind. Albuxama, please allow me to say that making this burish man one of your close aides while forgiving his selfishness will only lower the morale of others. Earl Albuck was known for playing favorites for those willing to lick his boots or for his relatives. In regards to Hector, since he was directly scouted by Earl Albuck, he was not part of the two aforementioned groups who received the preferential treatment. Not even one year had passed since he became Earl Albach's subordinate, and yet, he was the only one who dared to treat the Earl lightly. Compared to those who leached off the toad like Earl Albach, the newcomer who received such favorable treatment was their target of envy and irritation. 
I've said that I don't mind his attitude, though. The escort knights shut their mouths as soon as Earl Aubach's eyes locked on them. MME apologies. For f for Hector, your attitude hasn't changed. Even after a year, are you not scared of me? I'm grateful to you, Earl Sima. I've made a lot of enemies. It wouldn't be strange for me to be assassinated if not for Earl Sima's aid. Someone as skilled as you is scared of assassins, you'd be able to dispatch them with your bare hands, right? I'm just a normal human who can die from poison. You know it's not like I want to die in that kind of battle either. Earl Sima once, just once, I'll gladly die against an opponent who can force make me go all out. Ever since he was a child, Hector knew danger like the back of his hand all these years. He faced foe after foe, and yet none ever posed a challenge after putting his life on the line so many times. He had become immune to the thrill of battle. Each enemy struck down with the same bored look. Fortunately, Hector was extremely talented with the sword. He, who became stronger after overcoming numerous deadly crises, longed for a fight to the death against someone who could force him to go all out again. However, thanks to that habit, Hector became apathetic toward life. It had been so many years since he began looking for a worthy swordsman an opponent who could make him feel alive again. As long as I can feel the same kind of excitement of those days, even just a little bit I don't mind even if I'm treated as someone with few screw loose in his head. Hector tapped his finger on his head as he said those words, heaving a sigh. I thought that opportunity would come if I remained at Earl Sima's side. Booty expected too much. Earl Albach was at a loss for words upon hearing Hector's remark. However, the two escort knights became even more irritated by such a remark. If you really want to die, then I'll kill you right here. One of them drew his sword and slashed at Hector from behind. Hector's figure suddenly vanished, and the sword tip buried into the desk. Earl Albach gared at the tip of the sword with an irritated look on his face. And many apologies, Albachsama. That knight turned every which way looking around the room with a ghastly pale face. He thought that Hector might kill him in retaliation. But Hector had already left the office. Hector suddenly stopped right in front of the door and jumped to the side. The door was flung open in the next moment, and Rieckhoff, another member of Earl Albach's private army, entered the room in a hurry. Amemi apologies. There's an emergency. There's an intruder in the mansion. You're in such a hurry, you forgot to knock. Rieckhoff, it's probably the guys who've returned after catching the target. Leaning slightly to one side, Earl Albach tapped the desk with his pinky finger. T that is that's. With his mind reeling, Rieckhoff desperately searched for an appropriate response. But all that came out were garbled stutters there were no words to describe the intruder. It's like Earl Sima is employing a brat, don't you think it's time to downsize your personnel? Hector said as he brushed past Rieckhoff in the entrance turning around once more, he gave a faint nod at Earl Albach. T that intruder killed M. Malkidosama. Oh my, silk pants finally met his end, huh? Hector stopped and sneered. The look in Earl Albach's eyes had changed. He glared at Rieckhoff. Thieves how many of them there's no way Malkito was by himself. Where's the intruder right now? Earl Albach knew that Malkito was always surrounded by his subordinates. He wasn't the type of person to be reckless in the face of danger. That's why the Earl concluded that the majority of Malkito's subordinates had been slain. Even so, there shouldn't be anyone powerful enough to break into Earl Albach's mansion in all of Ainsass. The nobility in the region also feared Earl Aubach since he was backed by someone who held an important post in the capital. That was why small fry nobles wouldn't dare to oppose him. Those from the upper echelon of nobility wouldn't be so reckless as to wantonly attack him. Even if the royalty were to attack Earl Aubach, that would only be possible if they had received reports of his evil deeds beforehand. Earl Aubach's status itself guaranteed his safety. Following this logic, 
who could be behind the intruder. T the intruder is just one per no, it's two people. They killed Malkito and his thirty subordinates in a few seconds. A shock ran down Earl Albach's spine. It was as if time was frozen for a moment, and then he shuddered. I am possible. You must be lying. Gather every soldier in this mansion now capture those intruders. The two escort knights couldn't believe Rikhoff's report, standing stock still with dumbfounded looks on their faces. What are you waiting for? Do it now. And Rikhoff. You go back to your post and tell them my orders. Hi. I refuse. I refuse to go back. 